time in the city My hair plugs ain't pretty Hot times in the city I'm feeling kinda bad It's time right now For the David Feldman Show He's talking politics and comedy too He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to He's just a lefty from way back He's a union man with an Emmy for writing Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting It's time right now for the David Feldman Show To get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, the buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Welcome to the broadcast. I'm David Feldman, and thank you so much, Professor Mike Steinel. He will be joining us a little, a little, a little later on in the show, if I can put a sentence together. Welcome to the mop up for November first, 2021. There are only two months left in 2021. I'm David Feldman, coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 57 degrees and sun and sunny. I was going to say and Sunday. I'm stuck on Sunday. Uh, I want to talk about Huma Abedin. We have a virtual studio audience and sometimes I open up the floor to take questions from the people who are in our virtual studio audience. Huma Abedin was married to Anthony Weiner. He was a congressman from Brooklyn who ended up doing time for soliciting photographs, naked photographs of an underage girl. You remember Anthony Weiner, Congress, ex-congressperson. Huma Abedin was Hillary Clinton's daughter, essentially. Hillary Clinton referred to Huma when she was running for president in 2016 as her second daughter. Huma has a new book out, and she's saying, and I'm asking this, I'm asking this question of my listeners. Maybe we can have a conversation about this later on on the show. Let me throw this out there. In the book, Huma Abedin says that she was sexually assaulted by a United States senator, and she explains what happens, but she doesn't name the name. And I'm curious what she owes the Me Too movement. I don't know. I'm, you know, obviously I'm not a woman. I don't know, I, I, I can't imagine what it's like to be sexually assaulted, especially by a United States Senator. I'm just curious, and I'd like to hear only from the men on the, no, I'm kidding. I'd like to hear from women and only women on this. I'm not interested, I'm not gonna take any, if, if there are men in the audience who wanna opine on this, I'm not interested. I'm genuinely curious to hear from my female listeners. What does Huma Abedin owe the Me Too movement? And and should she be naming the name of the senator who assaulted her? 
Now, I don't know the whole story. Maybe. Well, I doubt she went to the police because that senator would no longer be a we would know who it was. So is the world better that she's not naming his name? Is he now free to assault other women? Shouldn't we know if he, you know, I'm asking and this is these are questions that I raised this morning with someone who's very close to me and told me not to bring this up. I have no right to discuss this because I'm not a woman. And so I'm asking the woman, what do you owe if, if you're Hillary Clinton's putative daughter? What do you owe to other women when you're sexually assaulted by a United States senator? Do you owe it to other women and yourself to report that senator? I'm going to guess he was a Democratic senator? I don't know. I'm touching a third rail here. I'm asking only the women in our virtual studio audience what they think. I'm not interested in what the men have to say about this. Well, if you would like to join our virtual studio audience, go to davidfeldmanshow.com, hit attend a live taping. I will send you an invitation and then you can join us in the Zoom room. Office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. And because this is the first Friday of the month, office hours will go 24 hours. We will have 24 hours of office hours. I started at 8 p.m. I'll go till about nine. Then I'll come back on Saturday at 8 p.m. and wrap it up. We have some of the most brilliant teachers and activists around the world, people from Belgium, Great Britain, Norway, Canada, Mexico, even here in the United States, teaching and mobilizing. You can go to David Feldman Show's website and hit office hours. It will take you right to the sign up page and you're in. It doesn't cost you anything. You'll meet some of the greatest people in the world. And if you're not in the mood to be heard or seen, turn your video and your audio off and come in under an assumed name. We don't care just as long as you're left of center and you know how to behave. Tuesday is election day here in America. And today I want to talk about who speaks for us. In a republic such as ours, such as it is, we rely on people to speak for us. We're busy, so we need people to speak for us. And we must trust that people who speak for us or presume to speak for us are on our side. Now, we know the GOP is not on our side. And if you work in the entertainment industry, you know the producers and the studios and the networks are not on your side. So the malevolent ones in America are those who present themselves as allies of the working people but are furtively working against us. Alec Baldwin, for example. People over the weekend asked me, why pick on a man when he's down? And he is obviously down, and I think he's a brilliant person. I do. And I wish him and his family well. I really do. I think Alec Baldwin's good outweighs his bad just barely, just barely. And he's decided, he's presumed to speak for us. He must be held accountable for his words and his actions because that cinematographer he shot to death accidentally would be alive today if Alec Baldwin didn't screw the unions that day on the set of Rust where he was a hands-on producer. Now, the way it's being played and spun is that somehow he's now the victim in all this. People are actually worrying about Alex's PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD. And I'm reading about this because it's a really important story not just because somebody died, primarily because somebody died, but why somebody died. Reportedly, the press is saying that as the sound of Alec Baldwin's gun echoed throughout the set that day, he repeatedly asked 
What the F just happened? What the F just happened? What happened, Alec, is you and your other producers decided to save money by hiring that day union scabs. That's precisely what happened, Alec Baldwin. And Alec Baldwin is emblematic of everything that is wrong with Hollywood and the Democratic Party leadership, which happens to be one in the same. Hollywood and the Democratic Party leadership are one in the same. It's no coincidence that Nancy Pelosi is from San Francisco, which has a direct line to Hollywood money. These people in Hollywood and the Democratic leadership are not just hypocrites, they are getting us killed. They are getting us killed. Baldwin, Alec Baldwin, issued a statement a few days before he accidentally shot his cinematographer. He issued a statement on Instagram. Nobody asked him to. He presumed that we were interested and that he decided to opine on IATSE, that is the union of theatrical stagehands who still are threatening to strike for more pay and safer working conditions. More pay and safer working conditions, which were exactly not on the receiving end of that rust set. Alec Baldwin was a producer and IATSE was not getting paid and there were not safe working conditions. But nobody asked Alan Baldwin, Alec Baldwin, to go up on Instagram. But he went up on Instagram about a day before he accidentally shot the cinematographer. And he said, he opined, he gave permission to IATSE to go on strike. He said, I will support IATSE if they go on strike. Well, that sounds very benevolent on his part. But you really have no choice in the matter, Alec. It's not for you to support IATSE to go on strike or not support IATSE to go on strike. Because trust me, if IATSE ever goes on strike, Hollywood is shutting down. So it wasn't that hard the day before Alec Baldwin accidentally killed his cinematographer the day before he threw, his producers threw IATSE off the set. They brought in the police to throw IATSE off the set. It wasn't that hard for Alec Baldwin to say he supports IATSE. It cost him nothing. It was a branding exercise for him to issue that statement, to look like a good guy, to look like he's a member of the rank and file. But that same day when it came to supporting IATSE, he completely screwed them over. Rust, he was a producer on Rust, was a non-union set and people get killed and injured on non-union sets. They also don't get their health benefits paid. They don't get health insurance on non-union sets. The day Alec Baldwin accidentally shot his cinematographer, the IATSE crew, was escorted off the set by police. I believe the producer's name was Pickle. I think it's a Pickle or Pickles. And she had done that before. She had had IATSE problems before and immediately called the police to escort them off, even though they weren't breaking the law. The producers were breaking the law. Uh, they weren't paying on time and guns were going off on the set and IATSE was complaining about that and they, IATSE complained and nothing changed so they walked off. They were complaining about gun safety on the set of Rust. And Alec Baldwin was so busy on Instagram the day before giving his permission to IATSE saying that he would support them if they voted to strike. But on his own set, him off the set, he had a new crew after lunch, and that's when he was handed a loaded weapon, and that's when he accidentally killed somebody. So Baldwin, my heart goes out to him, I wish him well, but he is a lying hypocrite. His assistant director, Halls, wasn't a member of the DGA. The assistant director was FICOR, which means 
as a political statement. He pays just enough to the Directors Guild so he can work, but not enough so that he can support the union financially. That's a political statement when a union member goes FICOR. So the, the assistant director was not a, uh, a member of the DGA in good standing. That is political. You're, when you're uh, AD, is openly against unions when you're FICOR. Uh, that's a political statement. That's an anti-union statement to hire somebody. This guy who handed, who shouldn't have been handing Alec Baldwin that gun, it should have been the armorer, but they were saving money and they had a, an anti-union scab as an assistant director. And that's the guy who the LA Times says handed Alec Baldwin a hot gun. This assistant director, according to, to Deadline and the Associated Press and the Los Angeles Times, was notorious as an assistant director for treating his crew like crap. And it makes sense. He was not a supporter of the Directors Guild, even though he had to be FICOR to work on something that claimed to be a union set, but that uh, that wasn't. Now, Alec Baldwin knows this. He's been, he's 63. He's been working in movies and television since he was at least 20. And he's a, a member of SAG AFTRA. He can't wait to tell us that he's a, a member of SAG AFTRA. And in the bylaws of SAG AFTRA, SAG AFTRA, his union considers any FICOR members of the Directors Guild to be scabs. That's written into the bylaws of SAG AFTRA. The guy who handed the hot gun to Alec Baldwin, the assistant director, from what we are being told by the Los Angeles Times and Deadline, we're being told that he was a scab. Baldwin told the press this weekend, this weekend, while he was running away from the paparazzi, he stopped and uh, said, okay, I'll answer your questions as, as best I can. And this past weekend, he said that the cinematographer he killed was a friend and they had dinner the night before. And then he made the mistake, the legal mistake. He was told to shut his mouth, but he can't. And I understand, Alec, because I can't keep my mouth shut either. Here's where he made the mistake. He said, we were a well-oiled set. He said, the cinematographer was my friend and we were a quote unquote, well-oiled set. That means they were working closely with one another and they knew everybody's business. That means he knew what was going on. It was a tiny set. So when Alec Baldwin goes on Instagram the day before to say he supports IATSE, that is literally lip service. You say, I support IATSE, and then the next day, you know, it's a well-oiled set, Alec. You knew Pickles, I think her name was Pickles, the producer, once again sent the police in to escort IATSE off the set. He knew before he fired that weapon that he was working with scabs. And scabs get people killed scabs the reason the cinematographer is dead is because that was a non-union set IATSE would never allow an assistant director to touch the armorer's gun and don't don't tell me that the armorer was 20 uh, is to blame she's 24 they took advantage of a young 24 year old who wanted to be an armorer she had a history of problems with Nicolas Cage on previous sets. It's a small town, a small business. Everybody knows each other. They knew about her problems. She was 24. She should have been protected. She should not have been hired. And if she was hired, it was the producers who should have stayed on top of her. She didn't hand the gun to Alec Baldwin. An anti-union scab did, and Alec Baldwin knew that. Now, people have said it's a tragedy for Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin and the neoliberals who he surrounds himself with are so self-involved that they convince themselves they are doing good in the world. When you screw over the unions, you're not doing good in the world. 
you're getting people killed. Now, in that very same Instagram message, I, I was going to play it. I don't have time to play it. It takes up too much time. I recommend you go listen to his Instagram message where Baldwin goes on Instagram and opines. He was opining on who was better, the Stones or the Beatles. Then he talked about IATSE, and then he praised the life of Colin Powell because Alec Baldwin purports to be on our side, but he is at best a neoliberal hack. He is a multimillionaire who sides with management. And if you side with management, you're always going to praise the life of Colin Powell. Alec Baldwin, in the same Instagram message where he said it was OK for IATSE to go on strike. Thank you so much for, for the noblesse oblige of allowing IATSE to go on strike, Alec Baldwin. In that same message, he said Colin Powell shouldn't be judged by the, he didn't call them this. He said, shouldn't be judged by Iraq. What he's saying is you shouldn't judge Powell for the lies he spewed before the UN about Iraq and weapons of mass destruction. And he got it wrong. He talked about yellow cake. It wasn't, anyway, he, he was praising Colin Powell and calling him a victim of the, the Bush and Cheney families. Nobody asked Alec Baldwin to say anything about Colin Powell. He went out of his way to go on Instagram to his hundred, I guess he has a million people listening to him. He went out of his way to praise Colin Powell, who covered up the My Lai massacre and led us into another phony war, Iraq, where, what, a million people are dead because of his lie? because of Colin Powell's lie. Nobody asked Alec Baldwin what he thought of Colin Powell. You know, he went out of his way to go on record and literally call Colin Powell a great man. And then added he supported IATSE while recording his Instagram message from a luxurious hotel right near the set of Rust, the movie, which was busy busting IATSE. Baldwin is the quintessential never Trumper. That's who he is. In his estimation and the people he surrounds himself with, in his estimation, as long as he rails against Donald Trump, you know, he was on SNL for four years paying the price of going after Donald Trump. It was very courageous for him to make fun of Donald Trump. As long as he makes fun of Donald Trump, nobody needs to know that he shares pretty much the same values as Donald Trump. Pretty much. Although I'm pretty sure Donald Trump never punched anybody. Interesting. Basically, Alec Baldwin is Bill Crystal? He's a never Trumper who you forgive Colin Powell for Iraq. You're a never Trumper. You're the Lincoln Project, Alec. You're part of the problem. It's OK for you to think that way and talk that way, but get the F out of the Democratic Party. Do not presume to speak for IATSE which you did in your Instagram message. Do not presume to speak for the union rank and file and get the F out of the Democratic Party, you multi-millionaire neoliberal hack. Do not presume to speak for the Democratic Party. You can say everything you want and believe everything you want, but do not presume to speak for the unions or the Democratic Party. Get the F out of our way. You are not our ally. You are not our ally. How dare you presume to speak for unions when you are a producer, when you're management and you're running a union busting set? How dare you presume to speak for the rank and file of IATSE? And how dare you presume to speak for the Democratic Party when you're praising Colin Powell. Alec Baldwin doesn't speak for me. He speaks for himself and the ruling class. 
Tuesday is election day. Who speaks for you? It's not Alec Baldwin. Who in the Democratic Party speaks for you? It's an off-year election, but important nonetheless. There are two governor's races, New Jersey and Virginia. New Jersey Democratic Governor Phil Murphy, a former pig who worked for Goldman Sachs. He's married to a pig from Goldman Sachs. He's worth about $50 million. He's running for re-election. And believe it or not, I'm sad to report he's not half bad compared to the other pigs who speak for the Democratic Party. Murphy has actually paid lip service. Uh, he's paid lip service to talking about public banks and making sure public pensions aren't invested by hedge funds and private equity. Uh, in his second term as governor, if he's reelected, he promises to, uh, to do anything about that. I doubt it, but he's still, unfortunately, better than the alternative. Uh, he's still a pig and he can be the Democratic governor of New Jersey, but he doesn't speak for the for the people of New Jersey yet, yet. And in Virginia, former Democratic governor of Virginia and bag man for the Clintons, Terry McAuliffe, is also running. He wants to be governor again. And you can trace everything that's wrong with the Democratic Party back to three people, Bill Clinton, Rahm Emanuel, Terry McAuliffe, former head of the Democratic Party. I guess we're supposed to root for this pig, and he is a pig, uh, because he's running against a Republican bag man, a, a former hedge fund manager, who's also a pig. And there are also two special elections for Congress on Election Day, uh, Tuesday, in two, sa uh, two safe seats, doesn't matter. And Virginia's House of Delegates is also up for grabs. You should pay attention. We should pay attention to what happens in Virginia's House of Delegates. We want it to go bluer than it already is. Thank you for the coffee, Leslie. Locally, we have mayoral races in New York City, Atlanta, Boston, Cincinnati, Miami, Seattle, Minneapolis, and most importantly for my listeners, Buffalo. I will talk about Buffalo in a second. Very important mayoral race that should have been settled by now. But people like uh, Terry McAuliffe and you know, the Alec Baldwin types, uh, not that Alec Baldwin is busying himself with Buffalo, but his kind of neoliberal multimillionaire class is screwing over the Democrats in Buffalo. I'll talk about that in a second, but first Seattle. Seattle, the home, of, the home of Microsoft and Amazon, they are holding a very important election on December 7th. It's a special recall to remove city council member, Professor, and I'm, she's been on the show, and I'm Kishama Sawant, I think that's how we pronounce her name. Uh, city council member, Professor Kishama Sawant, she is the first socialist elected to Seattle City Council in almost a century. She was on the show earlier this year. Professor Sawant was elected to the Seattle City Council on a pro-renter, pro-worker agenda. And since she was sworn into office back in January of 2014, she's been there almost more than seven years, since she became a member of the City Council, she succeeded in raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. She has been reelected twice, fighting for police reform successfully. She fights for the homeless, rent control, and attacks on wealthy corporations who make their home in Seattle, corporations like Amazon and Microsoft. And of course, Amazon and Microsoft are trying to get rid of her. Well, Microsoft founder Bill Gates, he's from Seattle, celebrated his 66th birthday this week or last week off the coast of Turkey with Jeff Bezos. What a party that must have been. What a great party that must have been. Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates celebrating 
Bill Gates' 66th birthday party on Bill Gates' private yacht, which cost Gates $2 million a week to rent. Bill Gates rented a yacht for $2 million a week. It's a gigantic yacht. The yacht that he rented for $2 million a week, uh, I'd have to think, I mean, how much does a yacht, well, maybe a, yeah, a yacht would cost, that yacht probably cost $100 million. The yacht is registered, and here's the important thing, the, the yacht that Bill Gates is quote unquote renting is registered in the Cayman Islands. Uh, Pandora Papers, anyone? He's renting a yacht for $2 million a week that's registered in the Cayman Islands, which means he's renting the yacht from himself. And if he isn't renting that yacht from himself, he should fire his financial advisors. Here's how it works. Bill Gates sets up an LLC in the Cayman Islands and hides money there. He has enough money in the Cayman Islands to purchase a yacht under an assumed name, right? Now he throws a birthday party. He's turning 66 and he rents the yacht to himself. And the United States government has no idea that he owns the yacht because it's registered in the Cayman Islands. The limited liability corporation he set up in the Cayman Islands to buy that yacht charges Gates $2 million, which means that Bill Gates takes $2 million from his American bank account and pays $2 million to his LLC in the Cayman Islands for the use of his yacht, right? The $2 million shows up on his tax return as a business expense. It's a deduction because he invited the homunculus, Jeff Bezos, to celebrate his birthday with him. So that's a business expense. So it's a write-off in the United States. Meanwhile, he's transferring the $2 million to the Cayman Islands because he's paying himself rent for the boat. It goes into the LLC tax free. And if he's not doing that, he should fire his advisors because it's all, well, I'm not going to say it's perfectly legal. Uh, our IRS is understaffed to enforce the laws that he's breaking. But that's not the worst part of all this. Forget that Bill Gates is really shielding using his birthday, giving himself a $2 million tax-free gift. Uh, that's not the worst part. Bill Gates, as you know, is a philanthropist who's very concerned about climate change, as is Jeff Bezos. And to get to his yacht off the coast of Greece in the Mediterranean, all the guests had to be helicoptered in. And after the birthday celebration, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, along with all of those other climate conscious billionaires, they all flew an estimated 400 private jets to Glasgow to participate in this year's climate summit, which started on Monday. Those 500 private jets just to get to Glasgow for the climate summit will burn an estimated 13,000 tons of carbon dioxide, which is the equivalent of what 1,600 Americans burn in a year. 400 private jets flying to Glasgow burn the equivalent of what 1,600 Americans burn in a year. That's just to fly into the climate summit on a private jet to sit around for a week and do absolutely nothing about climate change other than contribute to it. Why is Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos even allowed anywhere near a climate summit? Who cares what they think about climate change? In fact, find out what Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos think and then do the complete opposite. By the way, 400 private jets arriving for the climate summit in Glasgow 
that's not an issue of optics. It's not that it looks bad. It is bad. It's destroying the planet. 400 private jets aren't a drop in the bucket. There's no such thing right now as renewable aviation fuel. They're not using renewable a aviation fuel. And as I mentioned before on this show, I think it was uh, Professor Ian Faluna who said this, if aviation were a country, if the aviation industry were a country, it would be something like the fifth largest producer of greenhouse gases in the world. So when 400 private jets fly into Glasgow, that's not just hypocrisy, it's destructive. Our president is there right now, Joe Biden. Does Joe Biden really need to spew out 2.2 million pounds of carbon to get to this climate summit using four planes and the Marine One helicopter, along with his enormous motorcade, including the beast? He had to bring the beast with him, that, that big uh, limo. I think Alec Baldwin's wife is driving uh, the same model up in Vermont with the nannies and the kids. The Beast and, the, and, the, and like five SUVs, he really needs to go to Glasgow and contribute to climate change. For what? America is the largest contributor to greenhouse gases. I know China, they say, is surpassing us, but per capita, America, we, are the largest consumer of oil. We're the largest spewer of greenhouse gases per capita. And the, 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 the greenhouse gases that are getting spewed in China, it's for the crap we buy. We don't need a summit on the world stage to fix the climate. America just needs to change and the world will follow. We don't need to be meeting with uh, Boris Johnson and the EU and, and uh, Putin. America just needs to stop what it's doing. Why is Joe Biden in Glasgow, especially now, especially this late in the game? What could, po what, what could Joe Biden possibly learn or agree to in Glasgow this week that he couldn't learn and or accomplish by staying home staying in Washington, D.C., and twisting arms to pass the Green New Deal. This is an obfuscation, Glasgow. We already have the answer. It's called the Green New Deal. There's going to be no better piece of legislation than the Green New Deal. What are you doing wasting time in Glasgow? Pass the Green New Deal. You're going to come home from Glasgow after a week with the same conclusion, the Green New Deal. Pass the Green New Deal. It's ready. It's ready. It was in Bernie's Build Back Better at six trillion. It was sort of in Bernie's Build Back Better at three trillion. But Joe Biden, who's off to Glasgow to figure out how to save the planet, he stripped Bernie's three trillion dollar build back better of the, all the major climate change provisions. He needs to stay home. Everything we need to do to save the planet could be squeezed right now into build back better. This is our last chance, build back better. The midterms are coming around. You should be squeezing the Green New Deal into build back better. And if the parliamentarian uh, the parliamentarian says it can't be squeezed into a reconciliation bill, you fire the parliamentarian or you ignore the parliamentarian. There are no laws that say the, the Senate parliamentarian gets to decide what can be in a reconciliation bill and what can't be. Get rid of the parliamentarian, ignore her, and get the Green New Deal into Build Back Better the way Bernie had proposed at six trillion, or at the very least three trillion. What you're doing in Glasgow, Joe Biden, wringing your hands over climate change, you're wasting time that this planet no longer has. You're getting us 
killed Joe Biden. You're paying lip service to climate change when you have an opportunity to do something about it right now. And you're not just like Alec Baldwin paying lip service to IATSE, but when he has an opportunity to do something about it, he fires the union, replaces his union crew with scabs, and he ends up shooting somebody to death. When you pay lip service to the most important issues of our time, you end up getting people killed. It's not ExxonMobil's fault. They are going to do what they do. It's Joe Biden's fault. When you get elected president lying to the American people saying you're going to do something about climate change because you're on our side and you don't, that's way more malevolent than the people who work for Shell, BP, and Exxon. At least they're not lying to us the way, the way Joe Biden is and Blinken and everybody in the Biden administration. Doesn't belong. The Biden administration does not belong in Glasgow. They belong on Capitol Hill right now, putting $6 trillion into that reconciliation bill into Build Back Better and putting the Green New Deal into it. There's, that, that's it. If you don't do that, you've not only lost the midterms, you've lost the planet right now. Right now, there's a, a bill. It's called Build Back Better. Stop stripping it, bump it up to 3.5 to 6 trillion and make it about climate change right now. You will not get another chance. Why are you wasting our time in Glasgow at this summit? The framework you introduced, you and Pelosi introduced last week, it's gonna get us killed because it's really the last chance we have to, to, to marshal the Democrats to vote on something. It's not enough. It's going to get us killed. There's nothing you're going to bring back from Glasgow that you're going to be able to get passed in the Senate or the House. Last week, you, you, you stripped Build Back Better. You're, you're providing tax provisions, protecting natural gas, the largest p producer of methane. That's in Build Back Better. Natural gas has to stay in the ground. Spending money on carbon capture? You can't capture carbon, period. You don't transition away from fossil fuels with tax incentives when the, the planet is hotter, has been hotter for the past seven years than it's ever been in the history of this planet. You, you pour billions into renewables right now and you make sure that not a single tax dollar goes towards coal, natural gas, oil, or drilling. It's right now. If you don't feel the urgency, Joe Biden, you're getting us killed. What are you doing in Glasgow? You're flying around the world as though when it comes to climate change, the world has something to do with it. It's America that's heating up the planet. It's Congress. It's the Republican Party. It's Joe Manchin, Joe Biden. They're destroying the planet. We do all the damage to this earth. Washington, D.C., you don't need to go to Glasgow. You solve climate change by beating Manchin and the Republicans. The climate has about four. We're going to be talking about this later on the show. The climate has four years left. You're not going to be introducing anything after Build Back Better that's remotely close to altering man's contribution to climate change. And when I say man's contribution to climate change, I mean America's. So stop wasting time. Joe Biden, fly back to the D.C. and fight for Build Back Better and stuff back into it all the climate change provisions you stripped out of it last week. Jesus Christ, it's all for show. It's all this whole climate summit is for show. Joe Biden is Alec Baldwin. He wants it both ways. He thinks he can have it both ways. He wants to be our ally, our friend. He insists that he's the one who should speak for us because he's on our side, but he's getting us killed. He's getting us killed. 
At least Joe Manchin is up front. Joe Manchin says he wants to kill us. So we know who the enemy is. But Biden, like Baldwin, nice guy, but evil. Evil because they try to trick us into trusting them. And they're bad people. They're damaged people. The summit is complete horseshit. That movie Rust was complete horseshit. And it gets people killed. You waste people's time. You waste people's money. You screw the working people and you get us killed. How important could this summit in Glasgow possibly be if Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates are in attendance? We don't save the planet until we stop listening to Bill Gates and force him to pay his fair share of taxes and shut down his philanthropic endeavor, which is nothing more than a tax dodge. He, he set aside $60 billion and that endowment keeps growing. He's supposed to be giving it away. He, why, why, why is Bill Gates' endowment for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation larger today than it was when it first started? Isn't he supposed to be giving that money away? We don't save the planet until we put Amazon out of business. Think of that roll of toilet paper you ordered from Amazon yesterday and all the greenhouse gases produced because you're too lazy to walk to the store. And of course, Amazon and Bill Gates are helping to recall council member Kashama Sawant on December 7th, 2021. On what grounds? Why is Kishama Sawant the first socialist in nearly a century to be elected to the Seattle City Council. Why is she, of all people, getting recalled? What did she do? Well, this has been going on for more than a year. Count one. This is, I, I read the statement on why she must be recalled. She's been reelected twice. She's accused of delegating city employment decisions to a political organization outside city government. So I'm guessing that political organization would be the Socialist Party. Perhaps she threw, what, uh, a party and hired a caterer that was a member of the, of the Democratic Socialists, as opposed to Amazon, which is also a political organization funding candidates getting jobs from the government and sponsoring her recall? How is it legal to give money to Amazon to build uh, network webs for the Pentagon and then they turn around and are allowed to make political contributions to our candidates? How is that legal? But we have to recall Kashama Sawant because she maybe hired somebody who was a socialist. Uh, the recall point two, they say point two, she should be recalled because of her violating state orders regarding COVID-19 when she allowed hundreds of protesters inside Seattle City Hall in June of 2020 to protest. And, and I saw the pictures and, you know, there were so many COVID protocols being violated. For a second there, I thought it was an Amazon fulfillment warehouse. All of a sudden, Seattle's worried about COVID protocols. If, you, if you're worried about following COVID protocols, tax Jeff Bezos and Amazon into oblivion. The third count for recalling her is she encouraged voters to protest the police. Those are the grounds for the recall. That's December 7th, 2021 in Seattle. And we're, we're gonna be following the efforts to recall council member Kishama Sawant. That's December 7th, 2021. Follow her on Twitter, S-A-W-A-N-T. And uh, if you're an American citizen, uh, give her money. And if you know anybody in Seattle, make sure they uh, vote not to recall her. Meanwhile, in Buffalo, Buffalo, New York, India Walton, she's a former nurse and a socialist. She already won the race for mayor. 
in Buffalo earlier this year. She won the Democratic primary, which means she won the race. She beat the four-term incumbent mayor, Byron Brown, in the Democratic primary. And because Buffalo is a Democratic city, that means Tuesday's election should just be a formality, like it is in New York City. Eric Adams is going to get elected mayor because he won the primary uh, earlier, in the, uh, earlier in the year. But it's not a formality in Buffalo. Democratic Mayor Myron Brown, who lost, is running as a write-in candidate to defeat the socialists, India, Wal India Walton, who won the Democratic primary. People ask me, why do you have faith in the Democratic Party? Because people like India Walton are, are socialists who worm their way into it and win, like Bernie, sort of, kind of like Bernie. She's getting uh, no support from the Democratic establishment in New York State. New York Governor Kathy Hochul, she's the New York governor. She replaced uh, Andrew Cuomo. Uh, and uh, so she's not supporting India Walton. And this piece of human excrement, Jay Jacobs, he's the chairman of the New York State Democratic Committee. He has not endorsed India Walton. To his credit, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has endorsed India Walton and Gillibrand, the other senator from New York, has endorsed India Walton. As I said, the chairman of New York's Democratic Committee, Jay Jacobs, said he wouldn't endorse India Walton. He said he wouldn't endorse her for the same reason he wouldn't expect Republicans to endorse former KKK leader David Duke when he ran on the Republican ticket in Louisiana. That's who's running the Democratic Party here in New York State. Somebody who equates India Walton to David Duke. So hopefully on Tuesday, India Walton will be the, the new mayor of Buffalo. Former nurse, she is a nurse, you're always a nurse, and a, uh, and a socialist. Very inspiring. We'll see if uh, she can beat the establishment. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Please friend me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. Office hours every Friday night, starting at 8 p.m. I will hold uh, court for uh, an hour from 8 to usually 9.30. And because it's the first Friday of the month, it goes 24 hours and you'll meet uh, great people. Ah, I'm drinking uh, some expensive seltzer with fake, what is it? Fake uh, pineapple in it. All right, uh, coming up in about a half hour, John Ross and Ethan Hershenfeld, and we're gonna talk about movies and television. Most of what you see on television and in the movies is garbage. Most of the music you listen to is garbage. I know John Ross is gonna challenge me on this, uh, but most of what you see on television and in the movies is garbage because it's not about class struggle. It's not about the plight of the poor. When you think about the fact that nearly a half of this country, more than half of this country, doesn't have the cash to come up with a $400 medical bill, if you're not talking about the plight of the poor, you're really not talking about anything important. And uh, when I do see documentaries or shows that discuss the plight of the poor, there's always some kind of moral ambiguity because what gets passed off as political and caring just doesn't seem to offer up the real solidarity that comes with unions. I don't think you can solve poverty unless 
you have a group of people who give a full-throated endorsement of unions. We're seeing, well, we just celebrated Striketober. We're seeing more and more strikes around the country, but it's down to 6%. 6% of the private sector is a, uh, our union. It used to be nearly a quarter of uh, the workers were union. Uh, if you're not talking about unions, then you're not talking about jobs. And again, it brings me back to what's going on with Alec Baldwin. It's, it, the coverage is not about the fact that it was a non-union set. Uh, so I have, a, I have a serious problem with people who presume to speak for the rank and file, for, for, the, for the left, when they're anything but. You know, these multimillionaires like Alec Baldwin, uh, they present themselves as spokesmen for you know, the left of center. And uh, Baldwin, when he put out that Instagram message, he, you know, he attacked the Bush family and he attacked the war in Iraq. But at the same time, he makes allowances for Colin Powell. He makes room for moral ambiguity. That's what art does when it is avoiding the question of unions. If you think the war in Iraq was a crime against humanity, there's no moral ambiguity. Then Colin Powell committed a crime against humanity. If you think me live was a crime against humanity, there's no moral ambiguity. Colin Powell committed a crime against humanity by covering up me lie. There's no gray area. You can't present yourself as a friend of IATSE while you're recording an Instagram message from a hotel room that was also promised to your fellow IATSE workers, but then when they showed up on the set of Rust, they were told, no, we lied. You're staying at a hotel 50 miles away. It's crappier, and you're gonna have to drive 50 miles after working a 14-hour day. Alec Baldwin screwed the unions. At the very least, he could have stayed if he found out that the rank and file was getting screwed and being forced to stay at a hotel in Albuquerque. You're a friend of the working folk. You, you go with the working folk and stay at the crappy hotel in Albuquerque and show solidarity with the union. But there's moral ambiguity. No, no, I need to be up early. I'm the, the star of the show. I need to meet with the other writer and the director. I can't be 50 miles away. He'll, he'll tell you why he can't show solidarity with IATSE. And he'll very, be very convincing as to why his heart is with his fellow rank and file as they're driving after a 14-hour day at 3 in the morning. 50 miles to a shitty hotel in Albuquerque. Alec Baldwin screwed the unions. That's what he did on the set of Rust, and he got caught because he ended up killing somebody. The only reason that cinematographer is dead is because he screwed the unions. That's what Hollywood does. It screws unions. That's its business model. Destroy the union and make everyone complicit. Everyone is complicit in destroying the union including the union. That's how Hollywood works. How many television shows, how many movies tell the story of a poor person who rises above adversity by sheer virtue of persistence, but never about getting help from a union, right? It's this hyper individualistic story always of a poor person who against all odds pulls himself up by his bootstraps and makes it on his own. And every time they make a movie like that, they're screwing the unions. I'd like to see one movie that came out this year that shows somebody who came out of adversity and now can feed himself and has a family and can send his kids to college because of a union. Look. I relate to Alec Baldwin. I don't mean to beat up on him, but he presumed to speak for me when he went on Instagram and said he was for IATSE. So 
I get it. He's got a big mouth and, and, and he's got rage issues. I understand him. He burns bridges in Hollywood. Uh, I flood tunnels in Hollywood. I don't like to burn bridges. I'm not as talented or rich by any imagination as Alec Baldwin. Uh, but I do understand him. I know what it's like not to be able to keep your mouth shut. I also know what it's like to be incredibly stupid. And I share his stupidity. And uh, but he's got to pay a price for misleading himself and the American worker for presuming to speak for us when he's not on our side. And uh, he thinks he can do damage control right now. And, you know, the paparazzi was chasing him in Vermont over the weekend, and he and his wife hopped out of the car, and he's stupid. He can't keep his mouth shut, and he thinks he's smart enough to do dam damage control. And by, by speaking, every time he opens his mouth, he's revealing what a charlatan he and everybody who's on the management side of show business are. So he shines a light on a, on a corrupt economic system populated by people who can only succeed by being deceivers. And Alec Baldwin is a deceiver. He deceived us. He, he tries to present himself as a pro-union leftist and he's screwing the unions. He wants us to believe he's on our side. He's not. He's management. He's a multi-millionaire. And here's where it's going to get a little complicated, but trust me, you need to pay attention to this. He's a multimillionaire, and it's not just dishonest to claim he's a union guy, to claim he's a member of SAG-AFTRA. When Alec Baldwin identifies publicly with the rank and file, what he leaves out is he is destroying the unions. He is destroying unions, and I'm about to back this up. He makes it worse because he's convinced himself, everyone around him, that he's an ally of the unions. He is not an ally of the unions. He is a destroyer of unions, especially his SAG-AFTRA. He is a destroyer of SAG-AFTRA. Forget IATSE now. Now it's going to get really difficult for Alec Baldwin. This is about to get really ugly for Alec Baldwin, because I'm going to explain to you why Alec Baldwin destroys his own union. Let's discuss Rust. This might be a little complicated, so I'm going to try to go slowly on this. Uh, so try to pay attention. Alec Baldwin took a producer credit on Russ. This was the small little independent movie that was being made for $8 million. That's not a small independent movie, by the way. The Eight million that we know of. And as I said before, he was probably, there was no question that he was getting a piece of the back end. I suspect he was getting a piece of the front end. In other words, you get a finder's fee for helping to raise $8 million, okay? So he was taking the story he tells himself and everyone around him is that he was working for, for scale, union scale. Union scale is the least amount of money that the union has to pay you. That's what scale is. Union scale is the union has what is called an MBA, a minimum basic agreement. And at the very least, they have to pay you scale and pay into your health care fund, not your own individual health care, but the pool, the health care pool, so you can insure other actors and your pension, not your own individual pension, a pension pool. It's kind of like Social Security and Medicare, where the really successful people earn more and they pay more into health care and the pension, right? Somebody like Alec Baldwin, who's a successful multimillionaire actor, he gets more as an actor. So SAG-AFTRA takes a bigger cut off his paycheck 
so that that money is placed in a pool for less successful actors so they can have health insurance, so they can have a pension when they retire. It's identical to how Medicare and Social Security is set up. Got it? Okay. He's destroying his union and he's... I'm going to hold my tongue here. You decide what he's doing to his fellow rank and file. Okay. He was the star of the movie and a writer on the movie, which means his fees should be going into the Writers Guild and SAG-AFTRA. He should be paid through those two unions, but he's also listed as a producer, okay? He's also listed as a producer. If you go back and listen to last Tuesday's show, I explained how he was most likely collecting most of his fee as a producer. He got, you know, he got a cut of the back end, a cut of the initial investment. I'm not going to go into this again, but trust me, he's not spending a month. Alec Baldwin is not spending a month in New Mexico for AFTRA, SAG-AFTRA and Writers Guild scale, right? He's not going there to make the bare minimum. He's got boats, homes, children, nannies, that costs a lot of money. Last minute trips to posh ski resorts in Vermont because he accidentally killed someone and needs to hide from the paparazzi, that costs money. The day after the shooting, his wife took the beast, this big Cadillac, up to Vermont uh, where he joined her. He's got lots and lots of kids that's mobilizing an army. I wish him well. I wish his family. I wish them all well. He requires a lot of money. Plus, he wants to leave his kids lots of money. He wasn't in New Mexico for a month working after scale. I'm not attacking him personally. I'm just telling you that he's a fraud. And because he's a fraud, somebody ended up getting killed. He and his wife use social media to present themselves as, uh, as, you know, as a branding exercise. They offer up this distorted view of their reality, one that suggests to the 99% that Alec and his family's lives are just like ours, that they are one of us, but they are not. They are not, and they do a disservice to the 99% with these branding exercises on Instagram. They create a psychological dysmorphia where, where we blame ourselves for not eating well, for not exercising. We, blame, we look at his wife and the yoga instruction and, and we watch them living, living their life to the fullest, being their best selves, and it's our fault because, like Goop and Gwyneth Paltrow, all we lack is their discipline to look and feel the way they do. No, quite frankly, it takes a union job, Alec Baldwin, to live our best lives. And you, Alec Baldwin, are denying us a union job to live our best lives, to eat well to sleep well, to find time to exercise requires an eight hour day, not a 14 hour day, which Rust was forcing the crew to work. Why does Rust have to be shot 14 hours a day? Well, the producers and Alec Baldwin will say, we're just so excited about this project. We just have to keep working. Come on. Work, IATSE, until we fire you. Work scabs, work 14 hour days, because we're so, we're so passionate about our art. Bullshit. 14 hour work days are exploitation. That's how you squeeze more work out of people. And I'm sorry, but I am sick and tired of incredibly rich pricks like Alec Baldwin using social media to tell us that they have the same struggles as, as the rest of us. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to worry that Alec Baldwin has PTSD. I'm sick and tired of Dax Shepard and Kristen Bell and their publicists who keep flooding 
my news feed with stories about their, their, how cute they are, uh, about their, their relationship and, and the problems they have raising their children and bath time and depression. I have to hear about Kristen Bell's depression. I love it when multimillionaire celebrities open up to us about their depression. But they couldn't care less that 99% of Americans can't treat their depression or their addiction without going through their entire life savings. You know what would help people with their addiction and their depression? Unions, union health care, the kind of union health care that Alec Baldwin gets from SAG-AFTRA, that his entire family gets from SAG-AFTRA, but most actors don't because Alec Baldwin doesn't pay enough into SAG-AFTRA. He works for scale, so the union doesn't get the skim. He gets a producer credit where the bulk of his money goes to, which deprives the union of that skim off the top to help fellow actors, the fellow rank and file get health care and pension. Alec Baldwin is completely full of shit. talking about his depression, his anger issues. The only, it, 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 his money is with hedge funds. The hedge fund, the same hedge funds and private equity people who invested in Rust also invest in those for-profit mental health and addiction treatment centers. They have no intention of providing free psychiatric, psychological treatment to the American people. There's money to be made in investing in addiction centers. I'm not picking on Meghan and Harry, I wish them well, or Oprah or Kirsten Bell or Dak Shepard, maybe Dak Shepard, I could do without him, or Alec Baldwin, I'm not picking on Alec Baldwin, but they are liars, they are deceiving you. They do not identify with the people who's, who, who they're selling tickets to. They want your money. They want you to buy their shit, but they don't identify with you. They have publicists to make it look like they identify with you. They are not you. They don't speak, but they presume to speak for you. They've infiltrated the, the Democratic Party like a cancer, and they view us as their servants. I guarantee you right now, Alec Baldwin is spending more on his hideaway vacation right now in Vermont than he would ever have spent hiring a union crew on Rust. He is spending more this week at that posh ski resort to get centered after killing somebody than he would have ever spent on a union crew on Rust. And had he spent that money on a union crew on Rust, that cinematographer would still be alive today and he wouldn't need to be hiding from the paparazzi. But the media won't make that leap. They won't make that connection because the media is anti-union. Money is no object when it comes to, for Alec to service that, that, that beast, that, that Cadillac I saw his wife driving with the kids and the nanny and the ski resort and the new clothes that Alec had to buy at the Ralph Lauren outlet up in Vermont because he flew to Vermont at the last minute and he didn't pack anything. He didn't think twice about spending all that kind of money. But when IATSE, when union people whose lives depend upon it are asked to be paid, not just paid union wages, but to get paid, they weren't getting paid. When they demanded to get paid, they couldn't get paid. When they demanded safer working conditions and walked off, the police called the police. The producer, Pickles, Miss Pickle, called the police and escorted them off the set. They don't have the money, so the crew can survive. But when you're at that posh ski resort trying to get centered after you killed somebody, money is no object. Money is no object. You knew you had a non-union DGA scab handing you that hot pistol. You're 63 years old, you didn't check it? What's the cost of that, ho that Vermont, Vermont hotel costing you, Alec? What is it, 
2,000 a night? You got how many, how big is your family? What does it cost for that army to mobilize and move to Vermont to hide from the paparazzi? 2,000 a night just for the room? The rooms and the nanny? And the gas on that Cadillac, Mr. Environmentalist? You don't think twice about that. But the people who make sure you're safe, who make sure you don't end up shooting someone, you don't care about paying them what, what they deserve, what they're owed. So my heart goes out to Alec and his family, but he is the enemy. And we're never going to get anywhere in this country until we start looking at people like Alec Baldwin as the enemy. He's a multimillionaire who took the producer credit. He took the producer's credit and he hired scabs and ended up killing somebody. When are we going to look at them the same way they look at us? He's the enemy. He can't make his movies without us. And he didn't want to pay IATSE wages. He didn't care if they got health insurance or a pension fund. How can he not be the enemy? Especially when he presumes to speak for the rank and file. Especially when he goes on Instagram and deigns to opine on whether or not IATSE should go on strike. He gave them permission to go on strike while he's screwing the union. He's, he's a pretender, like all of them. He likes to hang out in the ghetto, but not sleep there. He doesn't sleep in the shitty motel in Albuquerque. He goes back to the nice hotel and records an Instagram message saying, I'm with you. I'm with the people of IATSE, even though they're in a hotel 50 miles away. They dress like us, but they are not us. They do not have the same worries as we do. Their depression, their mental illness isn't the same as ours. Our rage issues are not the same as Alec Baldwin's. Our depression comes from worrying about money, our anxiety, our anger, our sadness, our psychological issues come from worrying about housing and food and being taken advantage of by hypocrites like Alec Baldwin, who claim to be on our side and are screwing us. Alec Baldwin's depression is, I have all this money and I'm still angry and sad. Those are different problems. And like I said earlier, he can afford to get those problems treated because he has health insurance. He has sag after health insurance that he screws his fellow actors out of. He screws his fellow actors out of health insurance by taking a producer credit, by running all his fees through that producer credit and not through sag after not through the Writers Guild. If those fees were run through the union, then the union would be skimming a percentage off and that money would go into a fund for actors who, who haven't made enough to qualify for health insurance in SAG-AFTRA. So what happens? They have to raise the threshold to qualify for health insurance in SAG-AFTRA. He is destroying lives by taking a producer credit and not running the money through the actors union. He is screwing his fellow actor. And, and what's so satanic about it, he presents himself as one of us. Oh, I'm just working for after scale. You know, I, I'm working for after scale because I want to make sure that there's enough money in the budget to hire other actors. F you, Alec Baldwin. Your children will go off and pretend to be poor. They'll go off to private schools, those elite private colleges, and then they'll dress and act like they're from the street to make it look like they made it completely on their own, even though everything they own isn't theirs. They didn't earn a penny. They didn't earn their college degree. They didn't earn anything. Alec Baldwin and his ilk, the Gwyneth Paltrow's, the, the, uh, the Dak Shepherds, 
they they their spawn is corrupted by f these horrible values that turn them away from humanity. Alec Baldwin only cares about himself and if they're lucky, his family. And you know, they you watch them on Instagram pretending to be middle class people who dress up for Halloween and they like burgers and fries and, and the same kind of candy we like. They act like they're poor because in America, we've given up on the idea that anyone can be rich. Now it's anyone can be poor especially the rich. They love acting and dressing ghetto. I love that Bruce Springsteen and Barack Obama have this podcast talking about their emotional struggles as though their struggles are identical to ours. Here is the bottom line. The rich are not going to save you. Stop thinking that Bruce Springsteen, Barack Obama, Alec Baldwin is going to save you. Stop thinking that anybody who is rich or famous is going to help you because they're not going to help you. They're going to destroy you. They're going to get you killed. They are going to replace a union crew with a non-union crew and get handed a, 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 a prop gun by a DGA scab who insists it's cold when it's hot and the cinematographer will die. That cinematographer died because rich and famous people get us killed because they do not care about us. We are their servants. They are the enemy. Trust me, the rich and famous want to keep you poor and anonymous. And that includes Bruce Springsteen and Barack Obama. And that's why Alec Baldwin had no problem that day with the police escorting those IATSE workers off the set that day and replacing them with scabs. He knew they were scabs. He knew it was a scab handing him that loaded pistol. He knows that you need an armorer on the set who's union. That cinematographer would be alive today if Alec Baldwin weren't greedy and completely full of shit. And he's a deceiver and he will insist money and fame isn't who he is. It's exactly who Alec Baldwin is. It's exactly who he is. You don't become rich by accident. And you certainly don't become famous by accident. You get rich by saying Iraq was a human rights disaster, because that sounds good, but Colin Powell was a hero. And it's complicated. You get rich by insisting there's moral ambiguity on the most important issues of our time, like unions. There is right and there is wrong. There are allies and there are enemies. And I am telling you, Alec Baldwin and every producer on that set is your enemy. There's no moral ambiguity. Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden is your enemy. If you're a member of the Democratic Party, this is your enemy. If Joe Biden is off in Glasgow right now, pretending he's trying to solve climate change, when there's a bill on his desk right now Build Back Better that is that has the Green New Deal squeezed into it. It will cost three to six trillion dollars. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. And he's getting us killed. He's getting us killed every day that they delay significant legislation on climate change. People get killed. They are the enemy. Joe Biden is the enemy. When you gin up a war that kills a million people by lying to the United Nations, there's no moral ambiguity if you're Colin Powell. Alec Baldwin seems to think there is. Colin Powell is the enemy. When you cover up me lie like Colin Powell did, you're the enemy. There's no moral ambiguity when it comes to firing union workers and replacing them with scabs. Which side are you on, boy? You're either with labor or we are with management. It used to be simple. It used to be, we used to know whose side people were on. Baldwin killed somebody because he was willing to live with the moral ambiguity of replacing IATSE crew members who he insisted were his friends 
until they weren't. Then they were then they had to be replaced with new friends who were scabs. Folks, it's not just Alec Baldwin. It's every actor who claims to be a member of SAG-AFTRA and then turns around and screws SAG-AFTRA by taking a producer credit. There is no moral ambiguity when it comes to answering the question, which side are you on? I have no problems with the studios. They're ExxonMobil. They're not our friends. I have a serious problem with actors or writers who take all the benefits that come with being a union member, the pension, the health insurance, and of course the virtue of associating with the rank and file, and then, while presenting themselves as champions of my union, they turn their back on that union and take a producer credit and become part of management, and the bulk of their money goes directly to them and not through the union, and they screw their fellow rank and file. Producer credits for actors, directors, and writers, they're not honorariums. There are ways to hide money from the union. The way it works is you work for scale. You make sure the studio pays you the bare minimum, either as a director, an actor, or a writer, you get the bare minimum. What's the least amount of money you have to pay me as an actor? Then I'll take the rest of the cash as a producer. I know this personally because I've been forced to become a producer, even though all I wanted to do was write. But in order to give me a raise, they would only pay my Writers Guild minimum, and anything above that went to me as a producer, me, a producer. That way, less money goes into the Writers Guild, which means the studio or the network or the real producers, the people who put up the money, they have to pay less into my health fund, less into my union pension, which means my fellow writers who might not be working that year, they have a, a shallower pool to pull from for their health insurance, for their pension. Got it? Do you understand how this works? Do you understand how people like Alec Baldwin destroy the union by working for scale and taking a producer credit? You get, you, you, Okay. It, it's just so infuriating how people just twist the truth for their own benefit. Alec Baldwin, oh, only working union scale, as though that's an act of humility. It means he gets paid big money, paid to him as a producer, and he's screwing the union. We need big stars getting paid top dollar through the union when they only take scale and the rest as a producer they are screwing those they're destroying the unions all right sorry it's just uh so infuriating and it's just how people buy into uh into these lies and I'm watching actors who I know who can't meet the threshold for health insurance because the pool isn't big enough they've raised you have to earn something like twenty six thousand dollars a year twenty five thousand nine hundred fifty dollars in one year or you don't qualify for health insurance well most actors don't earn $25,950 in one year. The reason they had to raise that is the pool is shallow because somebody like John Hamm takes a producer credit on Mad Men instead of having all his money go to him as an actor. All right. Uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, get some water calm down. Hopefully, we will have uh, a conversation with... Jesus, did I go that long? Okay. Uh, we will have a conversation with my friends, Ethan Hershenfeld and John Ross. Are they here? Oh, they are. Okay, so let me do this. Let me pour some water. Hey, Dan, you want to do community billboard? Let's do community billboard for five minutes. Okay, okay. And uh, 
How are you? Sorry, I got carried away there. I'm doing great. You want to get a drink? drink? No, I'm drinking my uh, my zero calorie, zero sweetener pineapples. There's a pretentious douchebag. How are you? I'm doing wonderfully. How are you? I don't know. Just like I, I was watching Mad Men last night. I see that John Hamm gets a producer credit, and I'm thinking, oh, good. So he's screwing SAG after. So the money's going to him as a producer and not through SAG after. And that's why they raised the threshold for health insurance for working actors, because they want to save money on uh, paying John Hamm. Oh, it's complicated. It's complicated. Anyway, what's yeah. happening in our community, sir? You are, you are fired up. Or fired. <laughs> um, I sent you uh, pictures for today's community billboard. Oh, good. Uh, okay. It's at uh, 532. I sent them so you could find them uh, quickly. Tell us what we have planned for this weekend. Um, we have a message from Roricky from at Weekly Marks and at Daily Marks. And he says, hi, Dan and David. We hope you're both well and that David is continuing to purge himself of his centrism. We had a great bit on uh, Ricardo this week at Weekly Marks um, with Carl Na Marksman giving the dirt on illusions of fixed and circulating capital. I think thanks, that was my daughter. Thanks, Madam Comedian, Feminist Marxist, and a Feldwoman. My daughter uh, imitated Karl Marx. Who who does she pretend to be? Uh, the name Rorika gave me was Karl Na Marksman. I think it's oh, a I play on. <laughs> I told her to be Karl Marx's pain in the ass daughter, Skid Marx. But she went in another direction. Okay. So she went a little more highbrow than Skid Marx. Yeah. Okay. Um, he, and, he, Go he also says uh, this Saturday at two um, on Office Hours and Hours, our Minnesota man, Andy Brown, presents the Feldman University Speaking book on union reading. Ah. Uh, Virtue Hoarders by Professor Catherine Liu. And the professor and fellow Minnesotan will join Andy Brown to discuss professional managerial class and its destructive role in promulgating capitalism. See you and all what there. time is that? That's at 2 p.m. Eastern on Office Hours and Hours, which starts Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. But uh, this is, this is going to be Saturday since it's Office Hours and Hours. It runs 24 hours. So uh, Maybe we had Ethan to take a half hour. Maybe John Ross will do a half hour. We, maybe I can get Professor Harvey. I had lunch with Harvey J.K. on Saturday in New York City. Oh, wow. Yeah. Great. I'm going to try to get him to do a half hour for office hours. All right. So what do we have here, my friend? Uh, the Is first picture was uh, dried beans from Glenn Costick. He says, hi, Dan. I will be drying these for later use. The vines were 30 feet tall and growing on an angle like a hyperbola. And he stir fried some with onions and garlic. That is, wow, that's great. Well, growing your own beans, wow. Every time he throws in onions and garlic, I kind of think he might be throwing a jab at you because he knows you hate yeah. that. I, I, <laughs> this, is from, that? this is from Tom Weber, and this is a Frankenfeldo's monster. Mm. <laughs> Where, it looks uh, like uh, they try to get looks like me after the hair plugs, they try to transplant my eyebrows to the top of my head. They tried to take the hair plugs out by smashing the top of your head with a sledgehammer. <laughs> <laughs> they flattened them out. <laughs> okay, I like that. Halloween is over, isn't it? Yeah, we're a little late, but uh, it was a good one. This is uh, Joseph Britton Jewelry. Longtime listener Joe Britton has been listening to the podcast since the very beginning, and his website is josephbrittonjewelry.com. He uh, makes all this jewelry himself, and he's a fan of the show. So go check him out at josephbrintonjewelry.com. The holidays are coming. And as David always says, if you want to get some loving from your significant you other, gifts, you got to pay for it. Throw some jewelry on it. Also, we, we have, got? yeah, this is from uh, Kristen Calabrese. Ah. And this uh, piece is called Democratic Coalition. And uh, 
Kristen, her her name otherwise known as uh, Chartreuse in the David Feldman universe. Oh, I love that. So, yep, and this is a painting which it looks like a chalkboard. She's I can't so believe. Great. I She's can't so believe great. it. <laughs> She's so great. The gallery that's going on is called AF Projects, and her painting show is called How Things Feel. And the hours are Tuesday through Saturday, eleven to five in California, and the show runs through the twenty first. And the address of the gallery is 7503 West Sunset Boulevard, uh, Los Angeles. And the URL for the website is www.afprojects.com. Right. We should, uh, and people should buy her stuff. She yeah. is so great. Uh, and finally, uh, this must be a big, this is great. This is uh, Ralph Nader with, uh, with me. That must be a big... I bet he has that on his desk, that picture. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably framed. He's got seven pictures of his family and uh -huh. that one's in front, the, the closest to him. Um, this week, Ralph welcomes Miranda Massey, the director of the Climate Museum, uh, an institution focused on the intersection of art, climate science, justice, and activism that aims to make people feel that collective action is both possible and necessary and the only hope we have for saving the planet. Uh, plus, mm -hmm. Ralph answers listener questions. Yes. Well, we've been mentioning uh, uh, the last several weeks, uh, asking people to join the Congress Club. If you, if you go to ralphnaderradiohour.com, it's off to the right. It's a big blue uh, banner. You can click on that and uh, get involved. Yes, please. We're, we're learning how to organize through the Congress Club. We, we kind of do it, not kind of, we do it at office hours and people who are interested in learning how to organize from somebody who knows how to organize, join Congress Club, Ralph Nader's Congress Club. And we'll have another town hall with Ralph, uh, I don't know, in another month. We'll he'll answer your questions and give you advice on how to make your Congress pr pr people, like they're not really people, uh, do your bidding instead of Exxon Mobiles. So if you want to send anything, sure. If, if you want to send anything into the community billboard, you can uh, send an email to dentfeldman, dentfeldman at gmail dot com. And I uh, wanted to welcome Ethan Hershenfeld. And the last time we saw Ethan, he was uh, standing around a sex club blowing a bassoon until two a.m. <laughs> also joining him is John Ross. And the last time we saw him, he was uh, sitting around a submarine drawing stick figures all day. <laughs> so long. We have to bring Mike Rowe back. Thank you. Joining did us. Say, say brothel? Did he say brothel? Did he say whore? What did he say? Where was I hanging out? Well, the whole I, point is it doesn't matter what he says. You were standing you know, around in a sex this. club blowing a bassoon a sex at club. 2 a.m. It's funny because it's funny you said sex club because I was just thinking I was just thinking of a brothel joke. But go ahead. Uh, you should add in blowing a bassoon until 2 a.m. It'll, it'll work. Oh, no, I do. Yes. And, and, and uh, anyway, we have to get uh, Mike Rowe back on the show as soon as possible. Joining us in, I don't know, where, I, I would assume maybe both of you are in uh, Massachusetts. I know that John Ross is in Deerfield, Massachusetts. He is a brilliant comedy writer as well as a farmer. And Ethan Hershenfeld, it's good to see you on a Monday. Yes. I, uh, I usually just hang out the, the six days in between our Thursday shows just preparing and writing for our Thursday shows. Right. I'm glad you're having me on for Monday to break up the monotony. I'm in Brooklyn. Thug, Thug Thug Jew is the name of the special. John Ross, we're not, we, we have time. We're a little behind today, but what is, what is on your mind, sir? Well, I have breaking news. Yes. Uh, good news, bad news. Uh, Democrats are very close to a deal. They're, they're very close to a deal. Uh, the bad news is the deal stipulates that America be 100% coal powered. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's a deal we have a it's deal, a deal. The, it, the new bill is called build back the same John Ross, we're not we, i'm sorry what i i hit the wrong button say it hit again the wrong but uh you're like a heckler um I know. The, the new bill is called build back the same <laughs> uh yeah are you ethan your oh, yeah. thought no, my thought about the uh, the brothel. I, I was just thinking whenever I hear that phrase, whenever I hear that phrase, climate action. I think that would have been a great name for the very first brothel with AC. <laughs> <laughs> Who 
who was the first one, do you think? Where, where do you think the, the brothel? That, that takes it to, do you think there were street walkers first and then bordellos? Which came first, the street walker? No, 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 no. clearly the brothel came first and then the street walkers were the to-go version. That's a take <laughs> I, I think the, the absolute proof that brothels came first is I think pro brothels predate streets. I think literally before they invented streets, they had prostitutes, so. Right, like, you, like if you look at Pompeii, all they uncover are bordellos. Yeah, they had, they, maybe they, they had uh, dirt path walkers, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> not sure what they used to be. Also, the problem in Pompeii is those prostitutes were very stiff. <laughs> I mean, they barely move. They don't talk. Just... That has to be humiliating, though. You save up enough money, and you finally treat yourself to a bordello, and then for all eternity, you're just frozen there, so tourists throughout millennium can watch you in a whorehouse. That's got to be embarrassing. Yeah, that's like every bad photo on the internet. It's the same thing. <laughs> we all have that now. It's our own personal Pompeii. That, yeah, that was the original. That was the original social media. Was yeah, that was basically it was called Pompeii, then Facebook, then Meta. <laughs> well, are you optimistic at all about the Biden administration, John Ross? Is there anything that you see well, that makes you happy? Anything coming maybe from Donald Trump? I mean, we, you know, you know, you know, you talk about uh, the horse race. Yes, the horse is dead. <laughs> so. I, I don't know where we go from here. Uh, it's it's I, I'm getting pretty nervous. I mean, it, it's it's a bad. It used to be uh, the height of hackneyed uh, apolitical pablum to do airline jokes. Now mm -hmm. airline jokes are political because uh, I have to take a flight and I have to choose between Southwest and QAnon Air, and I think it's <laughs> going to be a tough choice. Uh, I maybe I, I may be flying QAnon Air before I fly Southwest. <laughs> What, you know so when a the, pilot, uh, explain what happened. A pilot on Southwest landed the plane and said, let's go, Brandon. Which is code for fuck Biden. And yeah. and what I hear, the question is, and probably scarier than that, is that Southwest Airlines has not even made a statement, as far as I know. They, they certainly haven't fired this guy. And I think Southwest Air is anti-vax and they don't want to have a vax mandate. Now, what I don't understand about this pilot, like, was he stupid enough to think, hey, this is a secret code. Nobody will know, you know, <laughs> and I'll just say it. And everybody who agrees with me will be OK with it, but nobody else will figure out. Or is it like, you know, Brett Kavanaugh said that a de de devil's triangle, that that's a drinking game. <laughs> that has nothing to do with the sex thing. And we all know, but you can't bust him because you can't prove that there is no such thing as a drinking game. But we all know the truth. So is this guy going to go, no, I have a I have a sick cousin who has cancer named Brandon. So I said, <laughs> let's go, Brandon. You can't prove that's not true. You know what I mean? Or right. was this guy going to quit anyway because he didn't want to take the, the shot? And did he just go, you know what? But it's scary that somebody is that indoctrinated, that in that position of authority and power of running a commercial airline would, why not just go on and go, hey, long live ISIS. How about, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just terrifying that that's where we're at and that it, the people sitting in Congress and that, what is it now? What is the percentage of Americans who think the uh, election was stolen? It's up to something like 40% of all Americans. Or I thought 40, no, like 80%. No, it's 80% of Republicans. Republicans. But but of all Americans, it's getting closer to 50%. It's terrifying. Wow. Wow. I don't know what to do. Take it away, Ethan. Well, the good thing about QAnon Airlines, um, you, you know about them. Uh, when Whenever you ask them, when is the flight leaving? It's always Anon. <laughs> So you never have to wait long for takeoff. You, you, the, the last people on earth you would s suspect could speak Elizabethan English. Yes. Yeah, it's a shock, but yeah. It's shocking, yeah. yeah. And can, can you get baby's blood on the flight? I always... <laughs> but only I actually person. didn't hear the, the, the uh, go Brandon thing. What, what was... Oh, you had, yeah, he said, let's go Brandon. 
which is that that kid who shot the people in in... i i you know the etymology of it i'm not even sure of uh exactly how it started but it it is now this well-established thing that you can say let's go brandon and everybody knows it equals fuck biden right i think i think it started at cow i think it started at college football games i think they started screaming fuck joe biden at college football you know i'm all for that but he hasn't earned their wrath i mean i would love it if he was actually doing something right to, to make them be be afraid of him but it's just hating him because it really does it really gets down to he's on the other side it, 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 it's, it's called it's cult behavior it is absolutely cult behavior yeah. The nice thing about a cult is you have friends. I mean, that's what I, I always thought. You're not lonely if you're in a cult. That's how the whole thing operates. You, yeah, always have a party. you always have a party to go to. You always have people who will agree with you. I, it is It is nice. It's got to be nice. There, there must be positive cults. I mean, yeah. I think. Yeah. Do you, did you see Wild Wild Country? No. Oh, that's a pretty what good documentary that? about the Rajneesh. It's like a three or six part. Uh, a documentary about the Bhagwan Rajneesh. The, right, the, the Rolls Royce guy. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they were having sex parties. I think that was a pretty good cult for a little while. I think uh, <laughs> until uh, it went off the rails. I, yeah, I saw was, the spoof of that on Documentary Now, that Bill yes. Hader series. Which yes, was I was surprised funny. that they could even make that funny because the the real one is pretty close to it. Yeah, I feel like I saw the real one after watching, watching that. Yeah. Right. I almost uh, Cyrus and I, Dave Cyrus and I, almost got. I'm being serious. Almost got recruited for Nexium by one of the actresses. Well, she was on your show. Yeah, and and so she was on the show about three years ago. And Cyrus and I, we were doing it from the studio, Alex's studio, in New York. And I'm thinking this is a a, a very friendly actress who's being a little too nice to me. It just didn't feel right. And then she had coffee. Cyrus should come on and tell the story. I guess she had coffee with Dave. And I guess they needed to recruit people like Cyrus and me to, uh, to jo- I don't know, to. I be- totally would have let her brand me. <laughs> Here, I'm, we have uh, Dr. Carolyn Baker. I'm going to turn your video off, Dr. Baker. We're, and we're running. Uh, it's good to see you, and I can't wait to talk to you about your new book. We're running five minutes behind, so okay. I'll see you in fifteen minutes. Is that okay? Sounds good. Thank you. Wow. There, nice. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, Ethan, you're in Brooklyn tonight. I'm in Brooklyn, and um, I also oh, I a little plug. My girlfriend's show opened. She's a, a painter, and there's a show yes. called Stride Arts. You can check it out. It's on Second Avenue, Fifty Eighth Street. It's up for about six weeks. It's a beautiful show. Went to the opening the other night, and then we went again on Saturday. Hold paintings, drawings, some watercolors. Stride Arts. Check it out there. I check it out. How uh, threatened are you? And I'll ask this of John, that your wife or significant other becomes incredibly successful and goes off and travels and you never get to see her. Is there a part of you that's rooting against her? My wife. My uh, wife. My wife. (laughs) uh, Just got accepted to a writer's residency in uh, Key West. Wow. Uh, she does have to take her, she has to fly herself down there. But once she gets down there, they put her up and, and they feed her for a month. She's wow. going down in March. It's a cult. Uh, I heard about this. They're well, going to brand. And, you know, and they, and they do have, uh, Ethan, maybe your girlfriend could uh, apply for a residency because there's there's visual artists, there's musicians, there's, uh, she's a writer and she has to run one workshop for the town, but they give her a little bicycle. And uh, look, I'm rooting for her novel to, uh, to, get published and then get turned into a movie and uh for us to you know is this near ernest hemingway's house the museum yeah i don't know it's in it's in key west so key west isn't that big is that where it's probably uh, linked to some relationship to key west are you going to be do you mind if i ask you some personal questions about this go ahead are you trying to sabotage this (laughs) <laughs> Why would you want her to be away from you for a month, or unless you're going to join her and play in the Grapefruit League down there? 
Uh, no, um, I'm going to be here. It's, it's a little bit of a uh, practice for her for empty nest. My uh, daughter will still, she'll be in her senior year of high, sc uh, high school. So I'll, I'll be having to stay here with uh, her and the dog. But um, so, so yeah, I won't be going. I'll be having plenty of fun here by myself. Don't you worry. Now, what happens, Ethan, if your yes. soon to be wife becomes a very successful artist? She yes. says to you, I'm going to, I'm going off to Antarctica. I've been, there's, there's a, because all I have left in my in my in the studio is white paint, <laughs> and I'm going to be I'm going to be away for six months because I they've asked me to paint. Would you feel good about that? Well, well, you know, I have a very weird relationship to my relationship. Um, <laughs> we've been in it for for over a decade, and. Um, Monogamy. You know, the only thing harder than mahogany is monogamy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah, I, so, you know, the relationship works. It's great. She's a, she's great. She's a wonderful person and a wonderful artist, but solitude is sort of my default setting. So I don't, I don't mind. I, I, and I want her to have huge success. And she, she's one of these artists who, uh, you really have to respect because there's some comedians and actors like that also in this world we live in that's so filled with promo and self promo and look at me look at me look at me it's amazing when you encounter people who don't do that and in fact are incapable of doing that so she's one of those people who's really into her work and she has been since, since she was very young and she is not into the promo at all you're, you're, you're so not I, answering my question so i'm going to be totally honest with you Cokes and whores. That's the answer. <laughs> Coke and whores. Here's, here's what I told John Ross. Yeah. I told my kids, don't go off to college. Do not leave me. I know you think you want to go off to college, but stay home. Go to a local community college. Let's prolong this nightmare. Let's keep this thing going. I know you're miserable, but once you go off to college, my life changes. I don't have young kids in the house anymore. And mommy and I then have to confront each other. <laughs> and it's not going to end well. I didn't say that. They knew I, they knew it already. No, no. Uh, but I did honestly say, I don't want you leaving. I, Wait, so I, I don't care. You're, you're, get, you're seeing if there's part of me that's like, please don't be a success so you don't have to go anywhere. To my I'm saying, why don't you poison like work behind, like undermine, undermine. I want like, her to be a huge want... success. I want her to be a huge success and sell the really big canvases for 15 grand each because she like, she's not, a, she's not like a, a socialite Upper East Society in any way, but she loves Gucci and I can't buy that shit. <laughs> so like, she's gonna, are you, do you worry that she'll trade up? Oh, in terms of men? Well, or trade down, even worse, where she meets like an, another artist. A I mean, how would you feel? What would be worse? Let me ask John and Ethan this question. All relationships end up in the dust heap. Would you prefer to be lost because she traded up or traded down? I would prefer her trading up. Trading down, she already traded down if she's in a relationship with me. Trading up, it means good riddance. You have no values. <laughs> I was too good for you. Well, let me say a couple of answer, things. But it's got to be one or the other. May I say a couple of things? Yes, sir. First of all, I am a very big uh, proponent uh, of monogamy. Um, I, I feel like every time I fuck somebody else outside the marriage, I feel like it wasn't that great. So... <laughs> I, you know, I'm every time, every single time I'm like, you know what? Better at home. Uh, so, so I don't have to worry about our next guest. I think she just went, okay. I don't know how I got on this show. You know, I will tell you something. I'm a guy who got, I didn't get married till after 40. And right. so, you know, you get certain habits um, that, you know, you you get used to your solitude. You get used to your alone time, and that that doesn't change. And so my wife and I very much 
we take separate vacations. I go down to Florida to play in a baseball tournament. I've invited her to come if she wants to go. But she's like, no, I'm going to go on my own yoga retreat. Some she we we spend a lot of time separate, and we love that. We love to do things together, but we also like to do things separately. Uh, as far as trading uh, up or down, I think I would definitely want her to trade up, and I would maybe carry around a picture of that guy and go, hey, <laughs> check, out, check out who my ex was able to get. So what's that say about me, huh? Well, if she Excuse trades me. down, That's it means gonna... she's, yeah, she's going for the sex. She's a, she's going for the raw physical lust. And that would be a threat to me. I'd rather have her just trade up for, you know, security, financial security. Ethan, you're, yeah, you're, so you're I feel like my girlfriend is very happy with me for the most part, but I know that she harbors this fantasy of you know, she's originally from Germany. She spent half her life here, uh, but she secret she harbors a fantasy of being married to a a Swiss diplomat. <laughs> it's very specific. It's a very specific fantasy, and I say, "Sei gesund, find a Swiss diplomat and and live on a mountain." And I, I feel like I can't, there's, I can't give her the things a Swiss diplomat can give her. That's so, but you're extremely talented. I can imagine you doing uh, uh, playing a Swiss diplomat. Right. I feel like you could do a little role play. That's one ethnicity and job I just could not do. I, I, I feel like it's just outside of my, my comfort zone, both yeah. ethnically and occupationally. It's because it's too mild in both regards. It's <laughs> the ethnicity and the job are very mild. But you're it's not weird trying that to get into that idea also because I'm the opposite of mild. I'm a nightmare to be with. I'm always, it's very opinionated all the time about her, about me, about everything around us. And the Swiss diplomat just, he has nothing to say, but he's always buying her Gucci and feeding her amazing meals. So. I have a question about Switzerland. I, I never understand world history. Whenever I'm reading about somebody escaping the Nazis at the height of the war, I just have to make it to yeah, Switzerland. Like in the, it's like the seventh inning of the war and they're going to Switzerland. Yeah, if I could just get to Switzerland, like there's this force field that prevents the most evil army in the history of mankind from obeying the Swiss boundary, which has no army. Hitler, do, do not step foot in Switzerland. What is that about? What You would think that, that an army that exterminates millions of people tramples Czechoslovakia, Poland, Moscow. You know, I, I'll tell you it's what it was. Switzerland, the Nazis, we can't step foot in Switzerland where all the gold is. What because, is because going on? The Nazis, the Nazis were lactose intolerant and all the cheese. <laughs> uh, uh, here's a, a, com a competing theory. If they needed to be able to get their watches fixed, you know, <laughs> And it's like, you know what? The we train's not run on time unless we have watches. we got to run on time. We burn that bridge, we're in trouble. I mean, seriously, I never understood. Like, I, I need, like, he needs, if he has his papers and he can get into Switzerland, he won't, be, like, it's like the Nazis are going, yes, we kill uh, millions and millions of people, but we are not savages. We obey the, the Also, it was the altitude. They, they didn't have a lot of good aerobic training, so to, you have to go up to go into Switzerland. Well, does it suggest to you that maybe Switzerland was a part of Nazi Germany? Certainly where the art and the gold ended up, right? I have one friend who was a little kid in the north of Italy, and he was smuggled across, and he's, his life was saved. He went to uh, Lugano, the, the, that first town over the, over the hills there in Switzerland. So uh, it worked. I don't know why, but it worked. He was able to hide out there. It makes no sense. I'm going to ask this guy how that works. That's a good, it's, it's a fine thing to wonder about. Yeah. yeah. Now, sowing your oats, what does that mean? Well, you said you got married when you were 40. That implies that you sew, you sow, sowed your oats. Yes, I did. And what, what does sowing oats mean? Does that mean, does that mean cutting them? You're a farmer. You know, uh, yeah, but I, uh, I mean, that seems like. Well, I'll tell you what I mean. Go. Oh yeah, to sow, that's when you throw it out in the, in the field. It comes from the word in Hebrew, in the, in the Bible, it says there's that phrase, um, those who sow in tears will, will reap in joy. 
So the harder you work putting, sowing the seeds, then the joy of, of the, the harvest will be that much greater. So the sowing is when you scatter the seeds. That's what it is, sowing your oats, you're scattering your seeds among the, uh, the brothels of Pompeii. So why can't you just say you're spreading your seed? Why do you have to make it confuse? Like, I don't know what's so. I thought it was like you were making a dress out of oats because oh, yeah. you didn't have cotton. Well, it's an, old, it's an old saying. It's not like they just came up with it and they said, let's confuse David and not say, you know, that back when you said sowing your oats, that everybody knew what that meant. It meant like spreading your seed. Nobody had a question okay. about it. Now it's getting, your, getting your getting your freak on. What does reaping your oats mean? That would be when you're uh, harvesting. Yeah, harvesting, and then I have in my kitchen. I have something called one minute oats. Those are for guys <laughs> to be a little more, a little more self control, a little more practice. Don't worry, kids. If you have one minute oats, it just takes a little practice. You'll get up to three minute oats and then five minute oats. I'm not bragging. Steel yeah. cut right here. Oh, steel cut right here. <laughs> So Bill Maher says COVID is over. Well, what a joke. Ever, what a joke. I'm, I'm nostalgic for the beginning of the pandemic. And so I uh, started hoarding toilet paper again, just for old time's sake. I go into the, mm -hmm. I just load up my cart with as many things of toilet paper as I can. Just uh, brings me back. Is that an American thing? Were Americans the, the ones who hoarded toilet paper or did yes. the whole? Only Americans. As far as I know. Before, go ahead, Ethan, and then I'll tell you what I saw at uh, one of the yeah. town hall meetings. Yeah, no, I was just going to, I agree with John. I'm very nostalgic for the beginning of the pandemic. I loved, I loved, my favorite thing as a child, period, bar none, was the snow day. I loved the snow day. The snow day when suddenly everything was off and you could just sit around and you didn't have to be jealous of the dogs who didn't have to go to school. The snow day was amazing. And that was like a, the pandemic was like a snow year. <laughs> I, I love that. <laughs> Greatest thing ever. I mean, I guess it's terrible what happened to everybody, but that snow year, I, I'll cherish that memory. It is, so, it is odd. One thing that's odd, I, I am not on the evil Facebook or AKA Meta or whatever, but my wife still has a Facebook account. And so the other day, you know, it sent, I guess it sends you memories and like a picture will come up of something. And she's, she had a picture of something that happened that we did. And she went, do you, you know, remember we did this and we went to this place with these people and I went, yeah. She goes, that was a year ago. And I was like, what? Like time is just twisted into this. It That seems like it was five years ago. Right. And I'm like, that, wait, that was one year ago? I couldn't believe it. So it's it's definitely done some weird things. Yeah. We have to wrap it up. Uh, Rebecca Irwin, who ran the yes. Public City Zoo is posting pictures of the club where John and I got our start. And I'm, I just stare at some of those pictures. And I really, it's like you see, you know how in a movie, somebody will look at a picture and then be brought back into, it's literally happening to me on Facebook where I, there's certain pictures. There's one picture of Monty, Steve Kravitz, and uh, 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 Steve Pearl. Uh, and Ray Booker outside, and Warren outside the zoo, and they're all in these tight fitting, like tight shirts, and it's like 1983, and they're all of them are just in their 20s, in their full bloom, and all their power, and I just keep looking at these guys, and it. it Don't say what happens after you are looking. Uh. Well, it goes without saying. Let um, me just say there's a lot of sewing. Can I just say one? Oats everywhere. One, one last thing about old pictures. Um, there's I, th this I, I know is not true, but I think it's sort of true. Is that every cell in your body it gets replaced? And yes. It's yes. like seven years. Is it yes. that it's That's every single one? And like yeah. I've seen old pictures of myself from like 20, 21 years ago, and I'm like. Oh my God, that's like three people ago. It's right. like a completely separate person, but by a factor of two or three. Like, wow. Wasn't that, the, wasn't that the defense you used at a murder trial? <laughs> and, and here I am, free as a bird. <laughs> John Ross, this was fun. Ethan Hirschenfeld, Thug Thug Thank Jew. You. Watch Thug Thug Jew 
Yes. On YouTube. Right and, uh, and, and come to the show Thursday night at Westside Comedy Club. Westside Comedy Club, Thursday night at 7 p.m. in a few days. And I have a promo code promo that, code gets, that you gets you 100%, 100 off. off. So message me. 100% off. It's an Are unbelievable you, promo do it, code. Do it slowly. Don't toss this off. Right. Start again. West, before... West Side Comedy Club, this Thursday, 7 p.m. show on West 75th Street in Manhattan, New York, New York. Tickets on Eventbrite, eventbrite.com, search my name, Hershenfeld, and use promo code, get this, promo code PRICE for 100% off. It's, it's ridiculous. There it is, this, this Thursday, West High Comedy Club. Let's do this again real soon. Thank you, John Ross. Bye, guys. Fun on Twitter. Love you. Love you guys. Thank you so much. Let us now go to Colorado. I believe we're going to Colorado where my next guest is standing by. She is Dr. Caroline or Carolyn Baker. I'm going to go with Carolyn. Thank you. Is it Carolyn? Yes. Yeah. Good. Dr. Caroline Baker. She's the author, the, a prolific author of many, many books, including Confronting Chris, Christo Fascism, Healing the Evangelical Wound, and you can buy it wherever books are sold. You can buy them, uh, you can buy it online from you know whom. And it has a forward by our friend Frank Schaefer, who's been on this show. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me, David. I really appreciate it. Thank you. What is Christo fascism? You, you, Frank Schaefer has talked about it, but what, what, what does Christofascism mean? Well, it's a word that was uh, coined by activist Dorothy Soleil, I believe back in World War II. And it really means an unholy marriage, as I call it, of Christianity and fascist ideals, fascist ideals. Um, and people more recently who have used the word are Chris Hedges, I believe he wrote a book on the topic. Mm -hmm. um, um, Kevin Phillips, who wrote American Theocracy. Uh, others have used that word, but I wanted to use it at, at this particular time for us to talk about this unholy marriage between um, right-wing politics in the Republican Party and the evangelical fundamentalist Christian movement. Uh, because I, I really see this as a dangerous trend, a dangerous reality that is taking us on, uh, on a trajectory toward fascism in the United States and the end of democracy. So we play clips on this show to laugh at uh, this guy, Greg, uh, Pastor Greg Locke, and he's a great showman. And then we've always laughed at Pat Robertson. Are they getting worse? It seems to me that once a day I see a pastor calling for armed insurrection. And I, I see Lauren Boebert, who is a congresswoman from Colorado. She might be your congressperson. Not my congressperson, no. And a great embarrassment to our state. By the way, she filled out her FEC filing and listed herself as a resident of Utah. I saw she that. Yeah. She doesn't even know she's. I know. Uh, I know. And I have some video that I was going to play for you of her talking before Christian Evangel, the evangelicals, and she's just calling for an overthrow of the government. Have we seen this before where you have Congress people like uh, Cawthorn and Gates talking about blowing up uh, the metal detectors inside Congress, speaking to, to church groups. Has this ever happened before? We really haven't. I mean, we've had people who are involved with the Ku Klux Klan in the state where I was born, Indiana, in the 1920s. Um, most of the state government officials were involved with the Klan. The government right. was a closet member of the Klan. But we've never seen this level of authoritarianism and this level of opening one's arms to um, 
really fascist ideals. We've never seen it. And as Frank talked about on your show a few days ago, uh, we now have a, a, a Republican strategy of, um, you know, making sure that the elections go their way through various means. And if they don't like the results, they just say, these results were flawed. We're going to have a, an audit or a fraud it uh, mm -hmm. to determine you know, what actually happened. And it's always in their favor and they throw out anything they don't like. So we have not seen that before. And that's truly terrifying. And what is the thinking behind this? If you have God on your side, it doesn't matter what the means are to the end. So you, if you believe God, if you genuinely believe God is on your side, then if you have to steal an election and lie about it, it doesn't well, matter. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, back in 2006, Kevin Phillips, a historian, wonderful historian, wrote an excellent book called American Theocracy. Is he and, a Republican? Uh, was he originally a Republican? He was originally a, a Republican uh, of the old school. Right. And, um, you know, I, I, I often go back and look at that book and think, my God, I wonder what he thinks about what's happening today. And it's really important that we understand the concept of theocracy or really government by God. And these folks believe um, that we should establish the kingdom of God on earth. And I have a theory about this. Um, I have a theory that, you know, they've been screaming for 200 years about the physical return of Jesus Christ. He's going to come back and establish his kingdom on earth. Well, I think they're getting really tired of that because Jesus has not shown up. You know, I, I don't know if you noticed, but, you know, well, he doesn't seem to have shown up. So, right. you know, it's so kind of like we're tired of waiting for him. We want to do it ourselves. And there is a group of reconstructionist fundamentalist Christians yes. who really want to establish um Christianity in its fundamentalist forms in all of the institutions you know, through art, through culture, in medicine. And really what that comes down to when it's all said and done is the handmaid's tale. So right. all of this is profoundly terrifying, in my opinion. This weekend, the New York Times published an op-ed piece by Senator Josh Hawley, who raised his fist at the yes. insurrectionists on January 6th. And I thought, why is the New York Times publishing a, 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 I think he graduated from Yale Law School. Yes, I think. yes, yes. Isn't he part of this? Isn't he, doesn't not he? So, well, not so much in terms of the religious aspect. Um, I think he's just basically flat out fascist and, and, and following the path of fascist politics. Um, he will certainly uh, pal around with fundamentalist Christians. He certainly, you know, will play the games that they want to play. Um, but he himself is not particularly a devoted Christian. I thought he was. I thought I read some things where he might have been part of this reconstructionist evangelical movement. What about Ted Cruz? I mean, who are the people we need to worry about here? And the problem with it is it's considered impolite to call a politician out on their religious beliefs, even when they're using their religious beliefs as a cudgel to get votes and get special permission to persecute the LGBT community or women on, on abortions. It's, they can hide behind their religion when they need it, but we're not allowed to question their, it's, it's impolite. You will never hear Chuck Todd saying, well, Mike Pence, what do you believe? Do you believe the Jews are going, like to me, the question you should always ask somebody like Mike Pence is, did the Jews go to heaven with you? That would be a good question to ask him. Well, I can tell you right now what his answer would be, uh, which is, well, we love the Jews and they're God's chosen people and they, they're they a wonderful nation and we want to protect them, but they have not accepted Jesus as their personal savior. So as with anyone who has not done that, they will go to hell. 
Right. And to me, <clears throat> it is journalistic malfeasance not to ask that question of anybody who brings up their religion. Once you introduce religion into the public square, it is the responsibility of a journalist to say, OK, you you talk about Jesus. You brought him up. What about our Muslim, the, the Muslim community? Are they going to your heaven? Are I think there are a lot of stupid, you know, I'm Jewish, don't mean to surprise you, <laughs> but there are a lot of stupid Jewish people in America. 20% of American Jews are stupid and they're, they're Republicans and they don't realize, a lot of them don't realize that just because somebody loves Israel doesn't mean that they don't hate Jews. Mike Pence doesn't even know he hates Jews because right, right. he's saying, I'm for Israel. How can I hate Jews? It's bubbling up now. I'm, I'm seeing it in the town halls where there was a veterinarian in Arizona who was talking about Big Pharma and the Jews. And I went, you know, this stuff needs to come out. We, we need to expose what these people think of the Sikh, the Sikhs and, and the Muslims and the Jews. And they need to be asked. And they're not because it's considered impolite to ask Mike Pence this question. And, and, and it, he couldn't lie. In other words, if he said, I believe Jews are going to my heaven, what would the reaction be? What would how would his base react if he was political and said, no, I believe we're all going to the same heaven? What would, what would the backlash be among his base? Well, I think pretty, pretty strong. The back, uh, backlash would be very strong. And so he, he really doesn't dare answer that question. And why isn't that brought up when somebody says, I believe this country was founded with Judeo-Christian values? When, 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 when George W. Bush is asked, who is your favorite philosopher? He says, Jesus Christ. The next question, there should be a follow up yes, on sure. that. And what does that mean? Yeah, absolutely. But they back away from it because they it's OK for them to discuss the religion the way anyway so how do we combat this how how do we how do we fight them on this well i think you know these people who you know they have no problem saying i'm a christian or saying i'm an evangelical christian um but i think the, the next question should be what does that mean to you and to what extent are you following the teachings of jesus because the teachings of jesus are not really at the top of their list at the top of their list is their political agenda. And, you know, Jesus was kind of, for the evangelical Christians, and I'm not saying all of them, but for those in the right wing, the teachings of Jesus are kind of soft, you know? There's a wonderful book that was written, uh, Jesus and John Wayne. It was written <laughs> by a profession, professor, a woman professor in uh, Michigan a few years ago, and I quote it in my book. Um, you know, Jesus wasn't really macho enough. And so they prefer to go further into the New Testament, the writings of Paul, uh, you know, who was much more macho and extremely homophobic and extremely misogynist. And then they want to take it further and go into the early church fathers, you know, the Augustines, the Tertullians, the, the different church fathers who were really very macho and very misogynistic and very patriarchal. And so they say, well, you can't just pay attention to the, ten, to the teachings of Jesus. You have to take all of these great minds, you know, together. Mm -hmm. and, and so... Um, so it's an ideology. It's an ideology, of, absolutely. Religion. They're, absolutely. They're searching... Yes. They're starting off with a belief system, then pouring through the canon to look for evidence to back up their 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 positions. Uh, Hitler. How did Hitler use Protestants and Catholics? How, how do the fascists use re deeply religious people? Well, in, in Germany, there was the Reichschurch, and their symbol was a cross with the swastika in the middle of it. 
And there were many, there were many Germans who joined that church and they were, they were able through, you know, the same kind of uh, not looking at reality that we see now in the evangelical movement, they were able to try to put together the teachings of Jesus with, with, you know, uh, Christian theology. So and I find it really curious because what, what, we're told, if you don't pay too close attention, that Hitler was, it was, an, the Nazis were a-religious, but that's not true, no, right? No, and, and so how much did Hitler use religion and which, I would assume mostly he, with pious, he made some kind of deal with the Catholics, but Germany is mostly a Protestant right. nation. Protestant and highly Lutheran, yes. So yeah. what what was happening? A lot of Catholics were being taken away by Hitler. Well, a lot of people bought into, um, you know, the, the boogeyman uh, that, that Hitler introduced to everybody, which was, you know, the Jews are going to take away this and take away that, and they're going to contaminate us because they're not a pure race. And, and so we're Christians, we're white, we're proud of our Christianity. Yeah, it really doesn't have much to do with Jesus because he was a Jew, but, you know, it becomes their own ideology. How much, how much did the Nazis, I don't recall any photographs or stories of Hitler wearing his religion on his sleeve? Well, the, I don't know. I, I don't think he did. I mean, he was involved in a lot of cult, culty stuff um, that he kept under wraps, and as, as many of his associates were uh, in right. the Third Reich. Um, but he was able to use... In the same way that, uh, you know, evangelicals now are able to use a lot of Christianity to uh, validate, quote unquote, their political position. It's very similar to what he to what is going on now. I see. What percentage of Christians in America are evangelical? I would say about 30 to 40 percent. And what percentage of evangelical Christians are dangerous? I would certainly say the 30 or 40 percent at this point who doubt the election of Joe Biden, who insist the, uh, on the big lie, they buy into the big lie, um, and, and who uh, are, are calling for the things that I have written about in the book. Um, I'm not saying that all evangelicals are terrorists, but those who support the Trump agenda and align themselves with white supremacy, white nationalism, hatred of the LGBT community, the right to reproductive choice as guaranteed in the Constitution, mm -hmm. maybe for only five more minutes, and who oppose <laughs> science, those individuals, particularly those who are working to suppress voting and rig the system so that if they disagree with the outcome of an election, they can just throw it out or participate in an insurrection to overthrow democracy. These people are terrorists. Yeah, uh, terrorists. Absolutely. And, and so what, how many are we talking about? Well, I would certainly, uh, you know, I would just go along with what the what the current uh, estimate is in mainstream news, which is 30 to 40 percent of the population of the United States does not believe that Joe Biden is a legitimate president and they've completely bought the big lie hook, line and sinker. And, and of those 30 to 40 percent, most of them are evangelicals or no? That can't be that high. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't think so. I would say maybe half of those are evangelicals, but the evangelical movement <clears throat> really has great power by, you know, the the uh, the allegiance, the alliances that it has made with Trump and other politicians. So it's very it's difficult now to draw the line and say, well. Tom uh, Cotton, for example, he's a he's an evangelical. It's from, senator from to... Senator from Arkansas. Yeah, yeah, and very right wing. He's very right wing. He's it's a lawyer, well educated lawyer from. He's an a well educated lawyer, and these are the fascist 
evangelicals that we need to worry about. You mm -hmm. know, Trump was not the brightest bulb in the chandelier as far as <laughs> intellect. Um, but there are some people like Hawley and like Cotton who are very well educated and very fascist in their thinking. Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so to me, the danger as more and more people in America stop going to church, stop going to mosque and temple, the ones who remain, many of the ones who remain, are the most dangerous. It's kind of like the Republican Party. Kinzinger is, go, is leaving. Every time we lose a good Republican, nature pours a vacuum and a really bad Republican fills that seat. Yes. As more and more Americans stop believing in organized religions, the ones who remain, even though they're fewer in numbers, they gain more power. The more we abandon organized religion, the evangelicals, even though they're not growing in number, will get more power. Is that a fair? Well, I think that's true. And um, I think that um, we see We've, we've seen a lot of the evangelical movement decrease. You know, there are articles almost every day on how the evangelical movement is decreasing in numbers. But as Frank Schaefer pointed out in his interview with you, once you have established this strategy around elections, it really doesn't matter what your, what your membership is, what the numbers are, because you have this strategy in place that questions all elections and that eventually gets rid of democracy. You know, we have to, I, I, I would love to uh, have you keep coming back. We're talking with Dr. Carolyn Baker. She is a professor of history and psychology. Go to carolynbaker.net. You're also a psychotherapist. I was. And, and, and a, student, a student of ritual and mythology. And you've written a, a new book called Confronting Christo Fascism. But you've written, I, I can't even count the number of books that you've written. It just goes on and on and on and on. You're very prolific. Why are you so prolific? What is the secret? Um, I don't know. I'm, I, yeah, I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, probably because I live alone. I'm not in a relationship at the moment. And, you know, I'm putting all my creativity into writing, which I absolutely love. Um, I'm not a psychotherapist any longer. I do life coaching and spiritual counseling. And I have a lot of people who come to me about this very question of, uh, you know, religious trauma. And how do right. I recover from this? Because, you know, a lot of people who've been through the whole evangelical experience um, have PTSD and uh, it shows up in their lives. Right. And so to, to, to reach you, they should go to Carolyn... Yeah. Baker.net, is that? The That's correct, carolynbaker.net. I have no problem with giving out my email address. Um, please, please drop me an email. Tell me that you listen to this program. And if I can help you, I'm happy to do that. And go by confronting Christofascism, healing the evangelical wound with a forward by Frank Schaefer. Before you go, can this happen without Trump? Can we can we end up with a theological state without Donald Trump? Who um, who is who is in who is out there that could pull this off other than Donald Trump? Well, some of the people that I've already mentioned, like Hawley, uh, like Cotton, and, and there are others who are um, great intellectual minds, but the, you know they've chosen to go down this path. I think that Trump is probably going to get reelected or really? re reinstated. Um, yeah, I'm not optimistic. I'm not optimistic about the Democrats winning. And I hope I'm wrong. My God, I hope I'm wrong. But I'm not optimistic. And, you know, I think he can get the ball rolling. But there are others who can perpetuate it once he does that. Right. But it would be hard to find somebody as craven as he yeah. who, who understands the media the way Trump does. 
Right. He, he, he is the threat. Well, Dr. Carolyn Baker, the name of the book is Confronting Christo-Fascism, Healing the Evangelical Wound with a forward by Frank Schaefer, who was introduced to the show by our next guest, Howie Klein. Hello, Howie. Hey, how you doing, David? Good, good. I want to thank Carolyn Baker. Please come back. I'm going to call you tomorrow you. to get All you right. back on the show. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Howie Klein is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America Pack. They raise money for progressive candidates all around America. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play our introduction and I'm going to grab some water. I've been talking a little too much. So we will be back in 90 seconds with Howie Klein. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to He's just a lefty from way back He's a union man with an Emmy for writing Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting It's time right now for the David Feldman Show To get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way Welcome back. Howie Klein is with us. Hello, Howie Klein. Hey, David. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for joining us. So I spoke to you yesterday and you were going after the Democratic Blue Dogs, New Dems, who have sold what, what was left of their soul to the pharmaceutical industry. And despite the polling where, as you point out, Americans want Medicare to be able to negotiate drug prices, they sided with the pharmaceutical industry. We should name these Democrats. Our listeners should know who these people are. Even if, even if it takes the entire segment to name the names of the Democrats who are siding with the pharmaceutical industry and who's, who are you supporting? Because aren't you running somebody against each one of these Democrats? Well, uh, we, well, some of them, the ones in the Senate aren't up for re-election. And uh, some of them are, are, some of these people, what they do is they're, uh, they let others stand up and, and, and support these bad policies or oppose these good policies. And they just hang in the back and, and don't have to do it publicly. Others are doing it publicly. So, in, uh, so we are supporting some candidates who are running against some of these people. Uh, and when there's a good candidate and he or she is running against a blue dog, we, we have a special page uh, which is called primarying a blue dog. And, and in order to be on, in order for us to raise money for a candidate, they have to be a good, solid progressive who passes who passes our vetting, and they have to be running against the blue dog, not running against anybody else. It has to be a blue dog because uh, they're the worst of the worst in terms of the uh, congressional caucuses. Although you know some of the uh, new Dems are really terrible too. That's not what this page is for. This page is just for um, blue dogs. So in that and in, in, in that instance. 
we have uh, four. So uh, Henry Cuellar from South uh, Texas is one, and uh, Jessica Cisneros is running against him. Another one is, um, is, is I mean, one of the, probably the worst of the worst in the house is a guy named Kurt Schrader. Uh, yeah, you so have Kurt, a story, yeah, we, bad, I mean, is that bad news about Mayor Mark Gamba? No, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. But it's, it's not bad news, it's okay. actually good news. Okay. So, um, Kurt Schrader. Kurt, Kurt Schrader of, uh, of Oregon, who's an, an heir of, um, of, a, of a fortune that comes from Pfizer. And he takes huge amounts of money from the pharmaceutical industry. And he was one of the people who voted in, in committee to oppose uh, the passage of a bill that would allow, of, of an amendment, or not of an amendment, a part of a bill that would allow Medicare to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies to get fair market price, price um, drug prices. And uh, and then, so that's him. Then there's a guy named Sergio Alcabula. Now I sent you Sergio's information to bring him on next week. You, you yes. got that, right? Yes, thank okay. you. He's running against Ed Case, a long time um, conservative Democrat in Honolulu, a very, very wealthy guy. Uh, related, he's the first cousin of Steve Case of AOL, by the way. Hmm. And that, and what I didn't say, by the way, is um, the the woman who's running against uh, uh, Kurt Schrader is uh, Jamie McLeod Skinner. And and why don't we talk about that uh, in in a minute about uh, why uh, Mayor Gamber had de- has decided not to run and instead yeah. uh, Jamie running. And then there's um, and then the last of them is uh, Michael Ortega in Orange County, who's running against Lou Correa. So those are, those are the, now those aren't the only uh, bad guys. Those are just the ones that, that Blue America is, uh, has candidates for already. We, we, don't, we don't manufacture candidates. Uh, we, we find people who are already running. We, I don't like the idea of uh, trying to talk someone into it, because if, uh, if they don't have the belly in their fire, and they have fire in their belly, and they don't really want to run and really want to do what it takes, which is a lot, then they don't win anyway. Right. So, so we we look for great candidates who are running rather than trying to uh, invent them. And and, and, not, and other other places don't do it. They do it the other way. They actually try to recruit candidates. A, a lot of times, candidates who get recruited who aren't really uh, running before that are um, don't win. They just don't win the races. They don't have what it takes. That said. Uh, Mark Gamba wrote a uh, he he ran against uh, Schrader last time and he didn't win, and he and but the district has been very very drastically uh, uh, re, um, not not gerrymandered but just redrawn, uh, and it, it now takes in a, a big part of eastern Texas uh, east eastern or or sorry eastern Oregon and that area is the area where Jamie lives, and she's very well known, and she's run there before and, and won both in a congressional race that she didn't win for the whole district, but she won that part of the district, and for Secretary of State. She didn't win the Secretary of State job, but she won that part of the new, uh, the new 5th District. So uh, I think that when we had um, Mark on the show, he even mentioned that he was, he was, uh, that there was another candidate that he was talking to, and that he would see which of them would run, and that they, that you know, whoever decided to run, the other one would support that one, and and they got together and and they really tried to figure out only one thing: who had a better chance of beating Schrader. That was all they thought about. Not you know who's who's more of a careerist, not who's going to be a better member of Congress, even just who had a better chance to beat Schrader. And they both decided that it was Jamie. And, and they did it very mathematically, and they explained it to me, and it made complete sense. And um, now we have Jamie running instead of Mark, instead of Mark. Okay, hopefully we'll get Jamie on the on the program. With Medicare negotiating, is it conceivable that they're going to squeeze some kind of? No. Have you heard rumors that this reconciliation bill does allow for Medicare to negotiate? With it's going to happen. It, it, I mean, uh, you, you probably heard Manchin today saying that he'll he'll tank the whole thing if they try that. So it's not going to happen. I mean, this is Manchin's and Cinema's bill. 
That's what that's what it comes down to. They have vetoed everything they want, and nothing is going in there that they don't agree. And it's not a negotiation. That's what people on the on TV keep saying, and on the radio also, and in, in, in the press, they keep saying it's a negotiation. It's not a negotiation. It's a dictation. There's no negotiating. Neither neither cinema nor mansion is negotiating. They are just handing down their conditions and you don't want to meet my condition goodbye that's it mansion has said publicly that he doesn't care if the bill passes or doesn't pass doesn't matter to him he does not care if it doesn't fit what his parameters he's not voting for it and it's dead robert rice the former labor secretary under clinton tweeted out something that was absolutely brilliant this week and he said there isn't a single billionaire who lives in west virginia why is Joe Manchin protecting billionaires? He does not represent the people of West Virginia. Who is he working with? Certainly, well, there are very specific billionaires that he's that he's very close with, and who have made him very very wealthy. I mean, I ran a little video on my blog the other day. I don't I don't even remember which which post it was, but it, but it talks about him. Oh, it was it was um, what's his name. That guy who makes videos, uh, oh, damn, I can't remember his name now, but it, maybe it'll come back to me. But in any case, it, it's talking about how, how wealthy the, the very rich have made, not just Manchin, who is very wealthy, but his whole family. I mean, his daughter, she, they have her testifying at a, at a hearing. I think she said she was making like upwards of $10 million a year in salary. At Milan, the drug company. Yeah. Right. So you can imagine how, uh, you know, how these companies are able to, you know, is it a bribe? You know, I, I think I've told you this before, but during the negotiations uh, about, over um, Medicare once before when they were doing Medicare Part D, mm -hmm. an ex Pratt who had become a Republican was the chair of the committee. You wrote about him this weekend, Billy Towson. You wrote about him this weekend. Oh, I did. Yes, I, I often write about uh, Bill, Billy Towson from uh, Louisiana. Right. And, and the bribe was, wasn't necessarily cash. Now, it may have been cash also. I don't know. But they during the negotiations for, for this bill, the pharmaceutical industry very much wanted Medicare Part D to be the way they wanted it. And Medicare Part D, which is the worst part of Medicare and a horrible part of Medicare, uh, and, and only deals uh, with, with advancing the interests of the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies, Medicare Part D, as it was being negotiated, as they were, you know, getting it through Congress without one in the House, not one single Democratic vote, by the way, not one vote, not one Democrat voted for that thing. Um, they, they offered Towson a job as the head of Big Pharma, uh, you know, the, Mm -hmm. the, you know, basically the chief lobbyist, but it's, you know, the president of the company. And, and it was a $2 million job. And back in those days, $2 million was a lot more than it is now. I mean, now everybody on, on the phone is probably thinking, who cares about $2 million? It's nothing. But back then it was a lot of money. Now, is that not bribery, David? Yeah, it absolutely is. You, like, while they're, you wrote that while they're negotiating this new Medicare Part D, Billy Towson, is negotiating a a new job. For a new job, and and he quit. He quit Congress after he got this thing passed. He, he you know he didn't. What, what, I mean, Congress, you don't make that kind of money. You don't make two billion dollars a year. He quit Congress and took this very very cushy, easy easy job for two million dollars a year before bonuses. Sometimes when people make a, a straight salary of two million dollars a year, they wake they walk away with four million dollars a year or more. Right. So that was George W. Bush's contribution to Medicare. Right. He signed it. He signed it ultimately. It was not written by George Bush or even anyone in his administration. It was written by lobbyists for the uh, insurance industry and the pharmaceutical But he industry. wanted it. He wanted it, and he, and, he was, and he was happy to sign it. But, but they wrote it. The, the, the lobbyists wrote it. And when I say the lobbyists, specifically it is lobbyists, who are working for those companies. So it was, in other words, it was written by the insurance company and, and the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical industry. They wrote Medicare Part D. 
uh, and uh, Towson, uh, uh, you know, got it through Congress. And then they rewarded him uh, with, with a job that they had negotiated while he was pushing it through Congress. And if that isn't bribery, there's no such thing as bribery. So when you, uh, a Gallup poll, I read, said that something like 8 million American seniors say they can't afford the prescriptions that are given to them. So the doctor says you need this drug and 8 million senior citizens don't fill the prescription because they can't afford it. And I'm I, sure it's more than 8 million, as a matter of fact. Who You know, it's, some of these I've told you many times, I have, I've been prescribed a drug that I'm supposed to take two, two, two pills a day every day, seven days a week, too. And, and, and the cost of, in America is $10,000 for that per month, $10,000 a month. Who can afford that? I mean, you can afford it, maybe you can afford it once, but who can afford that month after month after month after month? So they're killing us. It isn't even a drug that, gets you, that cures you, by the way. That's not what it's for. It's a, it's a drug to keep the disease from getting worse. That's what, and that's what it supposedly does. So why aren't we, well, you have. By the way, I, I didn't mention it, it costs not $10,000 a month in any other country. It costs $1,000 a month in any other country. It's still very, very expensive, but $1,000 a month is a lot less than $10,000 a month. We are being murdered by the pharmaceutical industry. And the politicians that they buy. And Rachel Maddow, because they advertise on Rachel Maddow. They advertise on CNN. They are not just lobbying. I don't even know who advertises on her show. She doesn't see those ads. The point is, you're not going to go after your sponsors. If you're, you're sponsored by the drug companies, you're not going to go after them. So, eh, I'm not so sure about that. Okay. I mean, you, you know, you have to look at that more closely than, than just leveling that. And, and I mean, has she ever said bad things about people who were involved in this uh, little game? I, I, I would bet she has. I don't know. Uh, I'm Maybe sure she I'm has. More, but, but I, I kind of have grown to trust her a little bit more. I used to a long time ago, and then I stopped. And now I, I, I guess maybe it's because she um, uh, denounces the word moderate. So anyone who does that, I love. Right. But instead of focusing on Russiagate and Michael Flynn and leave her alone with that Russiagate nonsense. I mean, hasn't, hasn't she suffered every, enough? From, every, has, every time I turn on Rachel Maddow, she's not anymore. She's not talking about what I care about. And that is unions. She's not talking about unions because her writers just went union. So, you know, they 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 have their own Overton window. Tuesday is election day. Chris Murphy in New Jersey has the potential to be good. I think you mean Phil, Phil Murphy, no? Phil Murphy, I'm sorry. Philip Murphy. Potentially could be a good second term governor, but not somebody who we have. He's not AOC. But, but he, he, he's, he, he's a decent governor, decent enough for Bernie to go campaign for. Right. And. Earlier in the show, I said, tell me if I'm wrong, that if you want to trace the roots of everything that's wrong with the Democratic Party, it's Bill Clinton, Rahm Emanuel, and Terry McAuliffe, who was running for governor in Virginia. Terry McAuliffe, bad guy, right? Yeah. Why? Yes. Uh, corrupt. Part of the Democratic uh, corruption machine, all about money. All about, uh, you know, I mean, look, I don't want people to misunderstand something. Is, is, he, is he as bad as Yunkin, the guy he's running against? Is his name Yunkin or yeah, Junkin he, or whatever, yes. Trumpkin, whatever his name is? Trumpkin. Right, Trumpkin. So Trumpkin is worse. Does that, and for people who, who want to vote for the lesser of two evils, they should vote for McAuliffe. But for people who f figure that evil is evil, whether it's lesser or greater, then they then they can't vote in that in that election or in, in many other elections where the Democratic establishment picks the candidates. When the Democratic establishment picks candidates, they're always bad. They never pick a good one. So Obama was in Virginia campaigning for Terry McAuliffe, could not travel to West Virginia to embarrass Joe Manchin and can't, who was not running for reelection. He couldn't hold a rally in West Virginia for 
build back better couldn't do it uh, you know you got to be really careful with mansion if you push mansion too hard he can just say fuck you goodbye i'm a republican as of today and give up all your committee chairs and give up uh give up any any chance of getting anybody uh uh confirmed they're in a, the democrats are in a really tough position with mansion and it's hard to blame them uh for that now on the other hand cinema who's just as bad a problem, by the way, Manchin's no worse than her, but she's probably worse than Manchin. That I can blame on the Democrats because they recruited her knowing what she is. I mean, when, when, when I hate to sound like a broken clock here, mm -hmm. but uh, when, when uh, Chuck Schumer found her, she was the head of the Blue Dog, she had the single worst voting record in Congress, and everyone hated her. He didn't recruit her despite that. That is why he recruited her. And now we have this idiot who is like saying, well, no, if you if you raise taxes on the rich, I'm out. You, I won't vote for you. I won't vote for the bill. I read that Chuck Schumer endorsed Indira Walton up in Buffalo. She's a socialist. Is he? It, 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 look, the, the, the race is over. No one cares what he says. He he's not he didn't give her. He's not really supporting her. He just said it uh, so that uh, people will, will say what you just said in some way and, may, and make him sound like he's a decent human being, which he's not. Forget right. it. He's, he's not for her. Right, right. Well, what are we looking at on Tuesday? How do you see, the, like, for example, Virginia, the, the delegate, the House of Delegates? Is that what it's called? The mm -hmm. House? The House is the House of Delegates, yeah. Um, right now, it's controlled by the Democrats, both houses? Yeah, the Democrats control it. Uh, it That's unique, right? That's into this thing, the Democrats look like they could actually pick up seats and, and have more control. But now I'm I'm doubtful that's going to happen uh, because McAuliffe is going to drive is going to drag the whole party down. McCull McAuliffe and and Mansion, by the way, because uh, for example, one of the places right now uh, when, when you're looking at the polling. So how do you look at how do you look at the polling in the state? Like that, where they don't say who's a Democrat and who's a Republican. It's very, very hard. But there, I can't remember the name of the organization, but I wrote about it this weekend. And uh, they um, they analyze the uh, the early votes. And, and you know who's not voting? The young people. Why aren't young people voting? You know, it's, it's polling shows really clearly that young people are by far, and, and I mean by far, more concerned about um, climate change and how we handle climate, the climate crisis. They're more concerned about it than anyone else. And, though, and uh, so these people aren't voting. Why aren't they voting? Maybe they're not voting because Manchin just stripped the most important part of, of climate amelioration out of the uh, Build Back Better bill. You think that might have something to do with it? I do. And why is Joe Biden in Glasgow uh the night before an election? Well, you know, it wasn't planned that way. He's meeting with leaders of other countries. Uh, I mean, to do okay. what? To learn it what? Was, he, already it, has, it, it, he already has a, a new Green Deal, a Green New Deal on his desk that he could push. He doesn't need to go to this climate summit. He knows what has to be done. Well, it's, it's a... It, it, it's supposedly all the leaders of the world being there together gives it some kind of impetus in various countries. I, I, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't know what to say. I'm glad that he's participating. Look, let's face it. Biden is a figurehead. It would be like Queen Elizabeth going there and waving also. But, you know, that's what is he going to do here? Actually, Prince Philip, not Prince Philip, Prince Charles has been... <laughs> Is, is is a better ally when it comes to climate change. Uh, and Prince Philip, they, they, the royal family has been speaking out. I don't know which one is Charles and which one is Philip. Well, I'm just in favor of all royals having their heads chopped off. Well, uh, I don't agree with you on that. So you, you, you're not so sure. Oh, why don't you agree with me? Uh, you don't think royal families, why? it's time for royal families to fade into oblivion no i think it's time for the rich to fade in i think you tax the rich into oblivion i think How about the royal family how about taxing them too 
it's the opposite. They give them money. Anyway, I don't care about the English royal family, to be completely honest. But, but you brought it up, and I, I decided to start running my mouth about it. Huma I, Abedin. I, prom- I do agree with you about taxing the rich into a certain kind of oblivion. And I've been talking about, like, anything over $10 million. And other people might tell me, you know, you're crazy. It shouldn't be $10 million. It should be $1 million. Um, but But I think... Any, any money over $10 million should be taxed at a very, very, very high rate. Very high rate. Like 90%. I had lunch Saturday with Professor Harvey J.K. Oh, lucky you. Yes. And we were at a, a, a very inexpensive, what's it called? It's a French bone something. I can't remember. And we we're sitting talking about how much money you need. And I said, in New York City. City, you need a lot of money. You need a lot of money. I said, you know, I would meet you for coffee to just sit and talk. There are no places in New York City. They've gotten rid of all the bookstores, so you can't meet at a Barnes and Noble for just a cup of coffee. They've they've set it up so there's no. What about like a, a Starbucks or something? Yeah, it's a little. They make it. Yeah, maybe Starbucks, but it, it's really hard. Other places like Starbucks? I, I don't drink no. coffee. I never had a coffee in my life, so I don't follow it that closely, but I keep hearing about it, or sometimes I see there are, like, uh, coffee shops and stuff. Well, nope. you go to Starbucks, and it's non-union. From the, from the time the bean is picked till the cup is served, it's non-union. In Buffalo, they're trying oh. to unionize the Starbucks workers, and now they're remodeling every Starbucks, they say, that has... Uh, union aspirations in Buffalo, but uh, how much oh, money? Oh, you mean they're closing them down? Well, they're remodeling them until they stop asking for a union. How much money would we need if America were livable? If this were a livable country that you know where you could find a quiet place to live with a little space and some health care and dental, people would not uh, people would not feel the need to fill the void in their life with work and buying garbage they don't need. They keep- and porno. Did you, did you hear that uh, Josh Hawley today talking about men using uh, more porno than ever before? Right, because they're killing our masculinity. Or that, or maybe we don't have uh, the money to live on, and they're killing our humanity instead. Right. All the same. Yeah. If, so how much money at the top end does somebody need until it starts getting sociopathic, where you start saying, oh, a billion? Well, like that, it's, it's no, something. no, no. The thing is this. What, I, what I've found from being around rich people is that the richer you are, the more grasping of money you become. And so it's never it's, – if, you know, if you're a millionaire, then you're going to look – not towards people who have a hundred grand and think, oh, I'm doing so much better than them. You look towards someone who has five million or someone who has 10 million and you think they're doing so much better than me. It's not fair. I have to get more. And I've, I've really, it was like shocking to me. I mean, I, I spent most of, most of my life, well, not really most of it anymore, but until I was uh, in my late twenties, I spent it outside of the, um, the money economy. I, I, you know, money was not part, really a part of my life. Uh, I didn't have any. That's why it wasn't. And I had a happy enough life. I loved it. Th- and then when I started uh, working at, uh, for Warner Brothers and getting money, I noticed that. I was thinking, I feel, I remember a friend of mine, very, very close friend who, who I love, uh, saying to me one day, we are going to buck this system and we are going to we are going to get rich, and I'm thinking to myself, I am rich. I, I'm making a hundred thousand dollars a year. I am rich. My father never made anything like that, and uh, but he he felt he had been working there a long time, and he he felt you know there is a if you, have you been on the phone with me when a mountain lion jumped on my roof? Have you ever been on the phone when that no. happened? No. There's a mountain lion that just jumped on my roof a, a minute ago. And I can't get the goddamn uh, animal department to come here and get it. Every day it's coming in. It's, I see it every day. Is he dangerous? Oh, I imagine. I'm not going to put my hand anywhere near him. <laughs> 
Anyway, I'm sorry. It just <laughs> call, happened. I call I Schiff. You. Call Congressman oh. Schiff. He's your call. Call constituent services. Well, that's a good idea, you know, that I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, yeah I will. Okay. Mountain Thank lion you. control. Don't they tag them? Like, they don't... They yes, just... this is, they know this guy. Was oh, he the famous one? They're all famous. They're, they're, every one of them is famous. This this one, unfortunately, he he comes up, he hangs out on my roof, and then eventually he goes and jumps over the fence to the neighbors who have two children, two little children. Right. And when I, and when I called the damn park rangers to come and get him, and they said they would, but they didn't, uh, they said, oh, yeah, one of these uh, mountain lions can take down a, I forgot the name of the dog, a mastiff. He said, well, you can take down a mastiff and, and run off with them in one second. <laughs> My neighbor has children. And they purr. That's the really mountain scary. Lion? Mountain lions purr, which is. Oh, yeah. I want to get, have you seen the servile? I think it's pronounced servile. They're, they're cats the size yes. of a dog. Yes. I, I was thinking of getting one for my mother. Fabulous. Yeah. They don't Just, eat people? What? They don't eat people? That's why I'm thinking of getting one for my mother. How nice. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I forgot where I was. David what are we talking about next week? With uh, Will, We're not going to see Bernie getting behind the infrastructure, bipartisan infrastructure bill or the Build Back Better, right? We're, we're not going to see anything passed. I, I don't know. I don't know. I wish I did know, but I, but I don't. I, I think that the Congressional Progressive Caucus is going to get behind it. I, I don't know what Bernie's going to do. Bernie has the power to stop it the same way that Manchin does. Bernie can just say no. Bernie can say, if you don't put this in, I'm not voting for it. And then he and uh, Manchin can stare at each other. But in the end, Manchin doesn't care about people, and Bernie does. Right. So what happens? Right. He would. So you're saying Manchin would prefer no Manchin, bill, no bill. Manchin care one way or the other. Manchin's constituents are not human beings. Manchin, Manchin's constituents are, you know, ATM machines that pay him off and have made his fam family fabulous. How do we get well. even with him? Well, we can't get even with him uh, until after this mess. And certainly, uh, you know, I mean, he may not choose to run again. Uh, and and if he or he may choose to just join the GOP, I don't I don't know how do you get, I don't know how you get him. I know how you get cinema. Uh, well, I, but you know I'm not talking about again nothing physical. I'm no, talking, no, I'm talking about electoral. Uh, well, what about but what about the daughter? What about shaming the daughter? What about like getting the daughter? Shaming? We've been shaming her for for years. She doesn't care. What about pri the price fixing that went on with the EpiPen? Yes. Why? Why? You know what? Now, there you got something, because May, uh, uh, Biden could have done that. He could have said, you know, we're going to open inve an investigation uh, if you don't get in line. But that's not Biden's style. I mean, that would have been L what LBJ would have done. Right. But that isn't what uh, Biden does. And, you know, Biden is not a strong leader. Biden's not. Oh, I don't want to. Let, let me spare me from getting into, into Biden again. I'm getting in trouble with some of my readers who are accusing me of being a Republican a a spy. Well, how could you look at what this piece of human excrement who Which calls one? Him, what the, are you the, talking the, about? The president of the United States. Oh, God. Going I to Glasgow. What is he doing in Glasgow right now? There's th there's nothing that he needs to be told that has to be done about. He knows exactly what has to be done about climate change. And it's sitting in the Green New Deal. They, it, they, uh, it, 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 he's a figurehead and they all are. They're not. It's just a symbolic thing. It's it's actually a good thing that they're doing it. What would he be doing here? You think he would be doing something? You think he would be getting this bill passed? He is. He's. You know what he is. We knew what he is before when when he was running. We knew what he was way before Obama decided. Okay, he's got to be the president and and pull the strings and got Clyburn to uh, cut off Bernie's head in South Carolina. Huma Abedin, who was married to one of your favorite Congress. And she may run for Congress now. She's running for Congress? She, no, oh, no, she, no, I shouldn't say that. She, had, she was asked if she, is gonna, if, she, if she may run for office, not Congress, office. And she said she won't rule it out. 
I'm going to open the floor when I say goodbye to you and ask the people in our virtual studio audience. I would prefer to ask the women this question. Huma Abedin claims that she was sexually assaulted by a senator in her new book. She says she was sexually assaulted, but she won't give his name. Oh, I, I have a, a future guest calling me on the line. I have, let me go. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Howie Klein, read him over at Down With Tyranny. And he is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America Pack. Thank you, Howie. He's gone. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. When we come back, we're going to talk about Glasgow with Peter Kalmus. He's a climate scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab and author of Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a climate revolution. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Let's hear some music from Professor Mike Steinel. There's so much to choose from. I think we'll go with this. Traveling light, got everything I need. Got a little bottle of wool light and a little bag of weed. Got to saw Bell on novel, cause I really like to read. I'm traveling light. I'm a creature of the road, got no regrets. Gave up my postal code and cigarettes. I'm doing much better with a touch of Tourette's. I'm traveling light. Just need a clean room in a Motel 6. Not too close to downtown, but not out in the sticks. I need my pen and teller magic kit so I can do my tricks. Got my favorite pillow, which I call Mr. Fluffy. Four kinds of allergy pills in case I get stuffy. A pound of Epsom salts, cause my ankles get puffy. I'm traveling light. I got two pairs of socks and shorts in my little valise. A couple of passports and my sex doll Denise. I'm staying real quiet so they don't call the police. I'm traveling light. I need my sedatives and my antipsychotics. A high-speed parallax motor, cause I'm into robotics. And my little red Speedo, I like to do aquatics. I'm traveling late. Got my CPAP machine and my George Foreman grill. A copy of Lolita and my little blue pills. A Navajo blanket in case I get a chill. I'm traveling late. And my rusty old blender A 50 tequila In case I go on a bender My attorney's number In case I want to change my gender I'm traveling light Expensive wrinkle cream, my Emmy statue for my self esteem. I'm traveling light. I 
I got my podcast mixer and a fancy microphone, my exercise bike so I have a place to hang my pants, my very valuable Hummel collection, a menorah made of fish heads, a Christmas tree, I like to keep my options open, don't you know, a shoe shine kit, a skill saw, a crossword book, a large supply of mechanical pencils, a year's worth of New York magazines I've been trying to get around to read, some scripts that I've been tweaking for those people in L.A., and my enemies list... Don't forget about my enemies list. Welcome back. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. That is Professor Mike Steinel. He joins us uh, in about two hours with some new music. And our guest, Peter, I don't think he's going to be showing up today. So we have 20 minutes before... We're joined by Dr. Harriet Fraud. I have two choices. I can run one of Henry's interviews, which I was going to run later. I can do that. Or I can open the floor to our virtual studio audience. At the top of the show, I wanted to talk about Huma Abedin, who is considered to be Hillary's second daughter. She was married to Anthony Weiner who used to be a congressperson from Brooklyn. He ended up going to prison for coercing photos out of an underage girl. Huma Abedin has a new book out, and she says she was sexually assaulted by a United States senator. And the question I asked at the top of the show is, what does she owe the Me Too movement? I'm not a woman. I don't know what she owes the Me Too movement. This is a delicate issue, but I'm curious if you're Huma Abedin and you have Hillary Clinton's ear and you're that powerful and you're sexually assaulted by a United States senator, are you falling short by just saying I was sexually assaulted by a United States senator without telling us who that senator is? I would assume that had you gone to the police, we would know about this. Uh, that means there's a United States senator who is free to assault other people. So I'm curious, what does somebody in a relative position of power owe to the Me Too movement in the 21st century? Is it enough just to write a book and say I was sexually assaulted? by a United States Senator without giving out his name. I was told not to bring this up. Somebody said, this is none of your business. Are there any women in our virtual studio audience who would like to comment on this? I'm curious what, what they think. Raise your hand to talk about that or anything else if you, if you wish. I see a hand raised. And there we go, Alicia in Mexico. Hello, Alicia. Thank you for, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. 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 So uh, what, what, do, what do you think? You know, I have real mixed emotions about people like, uh, what's her name? Uma. Uma Abedin. Yeah. Yeah, Uma Abedin. And I, to me, so much of the Me Too movement has become a kind of celebrity thing versus, I mean, I work in all these countries, well, the United States as well, you know, working class women who go to work uh, in shops and all of these things where they are subjected to all kinds of harassment versus, I'm not saying that powerful women don't have uh, things that happen to them, but there's there's a little bit more of a, a, of a game that goes on, I think, you know, um, so I... I, I, I really feel like it, it just becomes a kind of a gossip thing, a book selling thing, and we lose focus on the waitresses. I remember when I used to cocktail waitress, you know, to get my way through college and the kinds of stuff that I had to put up with. And I would like to focus more on that. I mean, I think most of us know that powerful men are can be and oftentimes are slime bags, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I just... 
I find it revolting, if I had to be honest with you, listening to all of these celebrity types go on about how they were assaulted or this or that, uh, when many of them had the opportunity in one way or another to walk away from it. I mean, I, you know, I will, I remember, you know, something kind of similar when I was, I, I used to write for uh, a column and I remember this uh, sort of like a uh, semi-successful TV screenwriter guy that wanted to meet with me to maybe get together and talk about writing a, a TV script. And so I went and, you know, met with him to, to have lunch or whatever. And of course, that wasn't what he was interested at all in, and I won't get into it. But I thought to myself, how many women say yes to that? You know, how many women say yes to that and get, I don't know, right thousand dollars and maybe maybe he would you know go through with that and write a screenplay or whatever and again i'm not trying to say that people like uma Ahmadin deserve that but i am i'm less sympathetic to them than i am to uh women that i have worked with in where they have no choice i mean they've got that job they have to keep it i i mean i the kinds of things that, and women around the world as well, in, in places right. where I've been in Cairo and Mexico City and so forth. So I, I'm i less concerned about her and I don't know how much her revealing anything does anything for working women. For, for okay, because my reaction, my reaction immediately, because I'm a man, was, and I, and I think, I, I suspect I'm wrong, but it was, and this is my honest, reaction which is by saying you were sexually assaulted by a united states senator but not giving out his name in a book who are you helping well she's helping herself sell books you know i mean i look who she works with look who she married i mean again she you know get yourself to a psychiatric couch you know as soon as possible but I, I just think that, um, again, you know, the focus needs to be on uh, working women um, who, who are trapped in these jobs um, and who have no choice. They're not, you know, it, it's, it's a different issue that she has. You know what I mean? And, and, and I just think that and. it's salacious. You know, what's happened with Me Too is it's become sadly salacious rather than really effective you know and play out for me we saw with christine blasley blazy ford the the woman who accused uh, the rapist uh Kavanaugh. when you name a name there are consequences to that well when you name a name but i mean she waited you're dragged so, through yeah, the mud there's reasons she, for not doing it but it turns into this kind of kabuki theater it just turns into a lot of wealthy white women. Um, and I'm not saying they weren't abused, but they kind of need to look at how they allow them. So I just, I don't know if anybody watched Miss Mrs. America about Phyllis Schlafly, you know, and there's this whole way that women, I mean, this is a whole other issue, but there's a whole way that women play into to harming other women. I mean, you know, if you, if you look at Handmaid's Tale and all of these kinds of stories, and I, I look at some of these women and, you know, when they decide to say it, who they decide, to, it's like after they've gotten all the benefits, after they've, after they've gone up the ladder, then they speak out versus women who, like myself and other people who've walked away, who've stood up, who've said things, do you know what I mean? Like, again, I'm, I, I, I want to be careful how I say this, but uh, look at what she's doing. She's writing a book and, you know, she's gotten together with her publishers, her agents, and they figured out what's going to sell books. And, and they then, don't want you know, the, the interviews. Want the, yeah. Why don't you tell us? And, you know, let's have her on an interview, see if we can get her to reveal. And, you know, right. it's, it's just disgusting. Anyways, that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> thank, no, thank you. I, I wanted only women to weigh in on this. So thank you. Well, thank you, Alicia. Let us now go to New York City, where Dr. Harriet Fraud is standing by. She is the host of two podcasts. It's not just in your head and Capitalism 
hits home. One of them is with Max Golding, and she is a licensed hypnotherapist. And let me ask you a question. You're, thank you. You're early. Uh, David Cobb can't do the show this week or next week. And we had a, another guest scheduled for 730, but uh, something happened. So uh, the topic I, I brought up, and I'd like to ask you this, uh, Huma Abedin, Anthony Weiner's ex-wife has a new book out. She says she was sexually assaulted by a United States senator. She won't name the name. Then you and I'm saying, well, what does she owe the Me Too movement? Does she owe it to us? And then I look at uh, Prince Andrew, who has been accused of sexually assaulting, uh, committing statutory rape with one of Jeffrey Epstein's victims, Virginia Jeffrey. Whatever. They are going after her now. They are dragging this woman through the mud, calling her easy and an opportunist. This is a girl who was set, was trafficked by Jelaine Max right. as a child. And Prince Andrew now is dragging her through the mud. I guess that answers my question. Why isn't Huma Abedin coming forward and naming the name of the senator? You go after a United States senator and accuse him of sexual assault. You're not going to win, are you? Well, it's going to, even if you win, it will be dragged out and you will be humiliated and accused and it has to be worth it to you. Right. And Huma Abedin is already kind of a victim in everyone's eyes because of marrying Anthony Weiner, well named. Um, mm -hmm. But I remember the Daily News when he wanted to stay in the race, the Daily News had a headline. Wiener sticks it out. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yes, it was. But I mean, she's known as a victim. And she was also probably doubly a victim. But the people who sexually abuse women are also monstrous people who turn around and accuse their accusers. That's a Trump style maneuver. Yeah. Use your lawyers, make them pay. And so it's pretty sick. On the other hand, I have a client who's a lovely fellow who was falsely accused and who's in terrible trouble because everybody believes the woman, even though he has evidence that her allegations are untrue. So that right. this whole area of sexual abuse and of calling out predation and sexual predation and acknowledging sexual predation is a new one and people are all over the place with it. It's and the new... men who perpetrate it are trying to defend themselves. Even Cuomo with those 11 women said, you know, it was just a paternal style I learned in the old Italian way and so on. You know, what was your reaction over the, over the weekend? We discovered that they are charging Andrew Cuomo, the former governor of New York, who had a step down for sexual. They call it harassment. I call it assault. If you touch somebody, grab someone's breast under their blouse, that's assault. That, that's assault. It's not sexual harassment. It's assault. And now he's facing. Uh, criminal charges, I believe, misdemeanor criminal yeah. criminal charges that may carry a year in prison. It's been politicized. Why aren't you know, why do they why is why is Andrew Cuomo being prosecuted? But Cyrus Vance can't seem to get Donald Trump behind bars. What was your reaction to Andrew Cuomo being charged? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that Andrew Cuomo, first of all, Andrew Cuomo is such a, um, a figure of very divergent feelings for New Yorkers. He was excellent during the pandemic's beginning. He was one of the few that gave weekly rundowns that were actually accurate. He did leave off the death count at the nursing homes whose donor he, from whose donor he richly uh, benefited. But he, he was one of the few reasonable voices. However, that style 
that aggressive bullying style, which screams and bullies men and women and sexually demeans women, is out of order. And where you have a he said, she said, you don't really know if the woman is making it up for political advantage, like the woman who accused Biden of pushing her into an alcove at the Capitol and molesting her. There are no alcoves at the Capitol. She was a little careless, or whoever was managing her from Trump's camp <clears throat> was a little too um, sloppy. And so she was silenced. But there is an environment in which sexual abuse is on the agenda. Sexuality right. is on the agenda. And if it's he said, she said, you really don't know. But if it's he said, and she said 80 times, that is Cosby's case, or he said, she said 100 times, as in Weinstein's case, or he said, you know, what is it, 15? And she, she said 15 times in R. Kelly's. All right, well, that's very different. And yeah. so I do think everything can be abused. Sexual abuse can be abused. Women can try to get advantages or men can try to get advantages through claiming sexual abuse. But if you have numerous counts, you're guilty. And in terms of Cuomo, there are numerous accounts of his overstepping his sexual boundaries with right. the women in his office. I, I want to Roger Ailes. A monster is a monster is a monster. You, you cannot compartmentalize a man's behavior. If you sexually assault a woman, that's not the first time you've sexually assaulted a woman, and it's not the only bad thing you do in your life, that you do other things to men that might not be sexual assault. For example, I was reading an interview with Kevin Smith, who somehow became a producer on Good Will Hunting, a movie starring Robin Williams, Ben Affleck, and uh, Matt Damon. Harvey Weinstein killed Goodwill Hunting in the theaters because Robin Williams had a bigger cut of the theatrical ticket than he did the video rentals. So the movie ended up getting an Oscar for, for Robin Williams. There was tremendous, you know, it was getting great reviews. Weinstein mm -hmm. is a monster and he screwed Robin. He, it was more important for him to see Robin not get his cut of the movie. And so the movie was taken out of circular distribution to screw Robin, just yeah, to screw him out of some money. Partly it is that within the capitalist system, those people who are the owners and the CEOs feel they have the privilege to access every service they need, all the money that they need, all the sexuality that they need. That is their right as dominant men. And I must say, as I have talked about this, it also came to light that there's a huge number of men who are sexually propositioned by their bosses and feel obliged. Now they're not raped and held down, but they're economically threatened. Sex is another- By male bosses, by other male bosses. And female bosses right. as well. Right. Sex is another service for the privileged. And it's another entitlement of the capitalist owner. I will access every service from you that I want, including sexual satisfaction. With men, it's not sexual, not always sexual domination of a mayor, ma male underling. It can be something as the meeting was called for noon, I'll show up at three o'clock. I will keep you better wait. and you will wait for me I for mean. three hours and I dare you to say anything. I'm going to rob you of three hours of time that you could have spent either with your family, pursuing your own interests or working for the company, doing work for the company. It's more important for my swagger to keep you waiting three hours. How many times have I gone through that?
How many times have we gone through something right. as simple as our time? It's, domin- it's a combination. Once you are a capitalist in charge, you have the right to dominate in every way. Cuomo was known as bullying the people in his office. He bullied the women sexually, demeaning them by calling them honey and baby, talking about their bodies and insulting their outfits. And what finally did him in was that bullying because he- And men, and men, he bullied men. He bullied men in some ways, he bullied women in other ways, but he was a bully and needed to dominate. And what finally did him in was that, you know, most state police who are guarding a celebrity don't tell what the celebrity is doing. Right. However, Unless they do it to the state police officer. Exactly. And not only that, that is an honor that comes with certain amount of service. And that's seniority. And he chose chose a shapely state trooper, pushed her ahead of all the others in order to access her sexuality. And the others decided, okay, your detail will rat on you whatever you do. So labor got him back. But then he would humiliate the husband of that, the the females. Yeah, he would he would humiliate the husband in front of the wife to establish dominance and say, look what I can get away with. So this isn't about, you know, they always say rape is not about sex. It's about power. power. So he wasn't going to get anything from the state trooper. And chances are he probably couldn't, if he could get anything from her, he couldn't perform. So all he could do was swagger. He, and say to himself, I am more because you are less. It's right. exactly the opposite of a cooperative arrangement where you decide together out of mutual respect whatever you're doing, whether it's in sex or whether it's in business. But he had to be, he had to dominate. You have to win over people. It's the goal is winning, getting more for you, more services, more acquiescence, more subordination, more adoration, more attention. It's the capitalist idea. More. I'm winning because I'm getting more. And in this case, it's more power. And it's ingrained. We, we see it with sports. It's yeah. winning for the sake of, I've never, I'm not a sport. I just, you know, I was interested in sports and then I, discovered a new set of balls to play with that were much more satisfying. And I don't, I'm not interested in childish games. I wish I could watch the World Series, but it's, you know, it's pick its side and root for it and win. And then you're in the workplace. And as you just said, you're dealing with men who, who have to win, who are competitive. It's not for the good of the company. It's not for the good of anything other than I want to win, I want to move on up, and I want that big office, and I want people to know that I'm important because I don't feel important. That's I don't. Right. I feel I lousy, need. so and I, I need power. Trappings. I remember my um, husband, who was a professor, saying there were big fights over who got the corner office among these professionals, really. I mean, it's a sense that I am more because I get more power, I get more privilege, I get more sexual access. And it isn't about enjoying that. It's about accumulation. Of, right. And that's what capitalism is about. You always have to accumulate more because your competitor might be doing something and you have to be ready to invest because you have more, you can, and you can outshine that person. And it's a very ugly way to treat people. And it's the opposite of what you want in a society. Our society is really sick. Yeah, I, I, you know, I have, I've been, I'm just old. And my advice to young people is show me somebody with a corner office and a title, and I will show you someone who is being marginalized at work. 
the, the, the power structure is such, especially when it's men who are in charge, anytime they give another man a title and a big office, it's to quiet him down and make him go away. <laughs> yeah. And, and you got, and, and, and if you have that corner office and that title, you are a threat to everyone who's above you and you will be so if you want to make it in corporate america don't have an office don't have a title yeah go for the, go just go for More. some money and yeah. influence and it's the thing is that really then you're a threat the down except in nursery school you have to civilize the children they don't say take all the kid, take all that kid's toys and sell them back to him for right. his lunch. Uh, right. No, everybody's supposed to share because you can't have peace anywhere without that. But capitalism brings out the most disgusting, competitive, ugly things in people. Alec and Baldwin, Alec Baldwin. Yeah. A couple of people says to me, why are you picking on Alec Baldwin? And I say, because he killed somebody. He killed somebody accidentally but because of his own greed because he was the producer of this of the movie and he knew they were replacing the union workers with scabs that day the day he killed somebody he was handed a a hot gun by a scab a a a, a what they call a FICOR member of the DGA who was against the DGA. He knew that guy was a scab. He knew he had a non-union set. And had it been a union set, he wouldn't have killed somebody. And I think of him punching somebody for a parking spot, getting arrested. For, and people say, they, they laugh and they go, you know, Alec has, uh, he's got uh, issues. You know, he's got a temper, but, you know, he means well. He he means and both he he somebody and over a killed. parking spot that's crazy also the woman that he killed had she walked off with the uh, yahtzee workers she wouldn't have been dead right and she said i'm in solidarity i will not work here right that um and i mean i'm sure he did feel badly afterwards but really of course that unbridled greed that he had paid for that day and that he was the he was in charge here was more important than anything else. You know, Kristen um, Godsey, G-H-O-D-S-E-E, -E, has a wonderful book, Why is Sex Better Under Socialism? And she talks about why it is better, why even people comparing the GDR sex and Western Germany, it's because if someone doesn't hold an economic cudgel over you to support you because you have state support and protection for yourself and your children, it really helps relationships because you're equals, you're economic and social equals, rather than someone having power over you and money over you. You're talking about the GDR, the, the German Democratic, Democratic Republic, East Republic. Germany before the wall collapsed. Right, and sex was better, relationships was were better. better. I don't know about the rest of the relationship. She doesn't discuss it, but she says the sex was better. And then after the wall fell, there, there were studies that she cites between um, Western German men, whether their sex was better with people who had come from these Germans or Western German women. And it was much better with the Eastern German women because even with all the ills and spying of that society, there was free subsidized childcare. There were meals you could take home from work. Women it had wasn't, the sex privileges. wasn't the sex wasn't transactional. It was more honest. It wasn't transactional. It wasn't. You didn't have to use sex in order to have economic gain, which is what these men are counting on in their offices. These women need the job. They can be manipulated and used for whatever the boss wants. And if you take that motive away, you have a greater chance of an agreement for mutual pleasure among equals. You know, I'm, I'm smiling. I've said this once before on the show, and it's true. I'm, I'm gonna, 
you know, I'm a baby boomer. I'm a product of my culture, my parents' values. And I'm being honest with you. I wish I got laid because I was rich, famous, and successful. <laughs> I'm being honest. I've been so conditioned and programmed by the, the culture that I'm thinking, I, I wish once I got laid because I was rich, powerful, and successful. I wish, I wish uh, a, a woman liked me only because I was successful. I wonder what that would be like. <laughs> I'm you being so I'm sorry. You what? Would, you would know you were dominating a person. I would know that. Yes, if you if someone had sex with you only to to get something out of you, you'd know you were using somebody and she was using you. And it Suppose would be she was just starstruck. Effect. What about what about just being starstruck? Is well, that okay. domination? No, that's possible. Although taking advantage of a starstruck person who admires you is a little strange because you're not equals. What Kristen Godsey's book, Why Sex is Better Under Socialism, is about is sex among equals is a very different thing from sex as domination. Right. You know, right. one of and the- in fact, So learning, uh, this is really important. So uh, I, I don't want to make a joke about this. Sex has to be equal. It, it has to be consensual. You have to keep communicating and asking, and is this okay? Is that okay? The idea that you take somebody. Right. That is society conditioning both sexes to, to think that way but that's not natural right that's not, not that's no, not there a is nothing natural humans right. are cultural beings right so that's not natural and what you have there's a guy in moscow idaho with a mega church which is a very well-known mega church uh evangelical meta uh, mega church who says sex should not be a pleasure party well, in sex, <laughs> the man yeah, conquers the man conquers and dominates and the woman receives as she should. In other words, he's counseling rape, which is another extension of this. I take power. You don't have a choice. It's little sort of mini imperialism. I take over. You have no choice. I conquer and I dominate. And my, in the case of a guy like Weinstein, Epstein, I don't wanna make them all Jewish, um, Cosby, Lester Moonves, Roger Ailes. It's that same idea. I conquer, I take for my pleasure. And fuck you, literally. Right, right. Do not exist as a person. In, in, in nature, I can remember being younger, being around male friends, and there'd be cats screaming outside. They were in heat. And Somebody said, see, that's, you know, sex is uh, non, -con you know, it, something that the cat was not, it was non consensual. And I remember thinking, well, wait a second. The re th that's the female cat saying no. Yeah. Th that, that's not a, a female cat. need consent. They don't necessarily rape each other. A lot of animals need consent. Right. Most of the, this is gruesome, during rutting season on the highways, you, most of the, the deer you see on the side of the road are female deers who, are, who have been, they've been snuck up from behind and they've said, get, get away from me. And they b bolt out onto the street and get hit by uh, cars. So uh, kind of depressing to bring that up. I don't know why. <laughs> Well, let's talk. But Sorry. Leave, you know, but animals have the choice. Most right. animals have the choice to leave. They're not right. raped. Rape is right. taking power over someone for your own privilege. It is exactly equivalent to imperialism. Right. To 1452, that Pope saying, any Christian who lands at, on a land that is not Christian has a right to conquer and invade. So well, when, 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 uh, 
Cosby, w w Weinstein, when they're called animals, that's a disservice to animals. It's totally unfair to animals, right? They, they are humans. They are very much capitalist humans. Right. Let's talk about workers and the Democratic Party. I'm obsessed with false allies, people who present themselves as allies of the world, like Alec Baldwin. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to let up on Alec Baldwin because I mentioned this at the top of the show. He the, the night before he killed somebody, he went on Instagram and said he supported IATSE. Yes. And if you decide <laughs> to go on strike, I will support you. He was in a hotel, a luxurious hotel that was also promised to the IATSE members of the movie he was producing. And they showed up and were told, no, you're staying 50 miles away at a flea bag in Albuquerque. But he said, I support your right and I will support you if you strike like he had any choice in the matter. If they go on strike, everything gets shut down. The very next day, the police escorted IATSE off the, the set that he was a producer on. But he gets to present himself as a left of center ally of the working man. And, you know, there would be as you pointed out, a cinematographer alive tonight right. had he not hired scabs. That's right. That's right. She would be alive if she had walked off the set and he who had real power would also be alive. But that false allies is a very important thing. It's very important in the workers movement now because I was trying to figure out what happened to the Democratic Party. It used to be allied with the union movement. It was union contributions that pushed them over the top. And the one who changed that was Clinton, supposedly a progressive ally. And what he did was he may, he was progressive on gender, at least in his statements, even though he molested people. And, and he rape. was progressive. And okay. I'm sorry, what'd you say? And he was a rapist, Juanita Broderick. That's right, he was a rapist. And he was progressive on race relationships. And yet what he did was the democratic recipe changed. He's the one who initiated the um, treaties, the North, the Na Free NAFTA, Free Free NAFTA right. which then lost about, well, 700,000 jobs directly, well-paid jobs to Mexico and then those workers could never get such well-paid jobs and gave the manufacturers freedom to threaten with every strike, we'll move your jobs to Mexico. Right. And then that same recipe was taken up by Obama. So the white working class was made more and more oppressed. And it's only with the pandemic where people were told how essential they were and then not paid and where the top billionaires made 400 billion and they didn't get a raise, that that changed. But it was that Clinton plan. So Hillary Clinton could refer to the mass of people as the basket of deplorables, right? Because if you don't have money and you're not in the rich celebrity culture, you're deplorable if right. you have to work. And so they changed the recipe. They got much more corporate money. They sold out the unions. They sold out the working class. And they made some symbolic gains that are important. But right. nonetheless, Hillary Clinton was such a fake feminist. She was for um, raising the minimum wage to $12.50 an hour. Well, 65% of minimum wage workers are women. So that's not so progressive compared to, to uh, Bernie with $15 an hour. And yet, it was really the Black South that that um, what voted for Hillary, right. because Even he, 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 race. he got rid of welfare. Bill he Clinton got rid of welfare, and also he had symbolic events. He had a, some of his campaign headquarters at the Teresa Hotel in Harlem, but meanwhile, he's shafting him like Obama, who is brown and who made 
a point of saying some very progressive things. Meanwhile, since he rescued the banks and didn't rescue the homeowners, and it was the subprime mortgages were sold overwhelmingly to blacks who lost more wealth under Obama than they had for the previous time since uh, the end of reconciliation and in the South. I mean, really, right. it's that fooling them. And that's why I think Trump's voters hate women's rights and hate minority rights, because somehow that was used to immiserate them as a cover. But right. still, you know, I think it was the Clintons whose recipe look progressive on race and gender, while you shaft the masses of working people, black and brown and white, and you get all the corporate money. Right. And they got us convinced, or not, not you, uh, maybe me, uh, sometimes, right. convinced, oh, these are the things they have to say to get elected. You don't, you know, you, you have to look like you're pro-business and pro-Wall Street and that you're strong on military. Otherwise, you're going to be seen like McGovern and weak. Right. So they're just looking strong. But, you know, you know his heart. That's how Joe Biden ran. He, he's like right. a character. But what, but what do you do when you get in? I mean, when Clinton yeah. got in, the unions that backed him and raised the money for him expected he'd kill NAFTA. Right. It was Democratic. It was a Democratic Congress that killed NAFTA before under Bush. So right. he's not sure. But no, he changed the recipe. And they and had Al Gore. contempt. And Al Gore. And they Al had Gore. contempt for the masses of working people who are immiserated. Other countries like Germany, the strongest economy in Europe, all of Scandinavia with stronger economies, and even France forbid outsourcing. It's illegal. If you want to outsource in Sweden, you have to find every single worker in your current factory an equivalently paid, equivalent job. It's cheaper to make a different product if that one didn't sell than it is to outsource. It's just right. forbidden in Germany. And we you know, I, I, I was saying, Earl, I say this all the time. I don't have a, I do have a problem with ExxonMobil, yeah, sure, but sure. ExxonMobil has to do what it has to do. And yeah, yeah. they have to do what they have to do. And uh, I know that they're the enemy. My problem is the, 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 the faux ally, the right, person right. who's supposed to be representing me and says, you know, it's complicated. Yeah, right, right. And and they really ordinary folks. They're divorce attorneys. They, they they are divorce attorneys prolong the divorce by creating nuance, gray areas because they make more money the longer That's this right. goes. They are they are they should be driven off a cliff every single divorce attorney. It should be against the law to have to have a divorce go through the courts. That's ridiculous. Um, and so, you know, when Joe Biden and the Democrats present themselves as the friend of the working man, that's more sinful than somebody like Lindsey Graham's uh, saying, hey, we got to get rid of that extra $300 a week. We can't, it's costing management too much. You know, they're, they're, they won't come back to work. We, at least the Republicans say, get rid of welfare. Get re Let's starve them out. Hungry, that they have to work no matter how degrading and underpaid. That's right. Although God bless, I'm serious. God bless them for for drawing a line in the sand and telling us who the enemy is. Except and that they believe Trump said that he was the working person's friend. He was going right. to make America great again and bring them back their jobs. Right. So they all need a bit of that false populism. But it is more fake. Like Hillary Clinton tried to get the feminists to vote for her because she has a vagina. However, what she did to women, not for women, was terrible. It was terrible. 
to um, suggest a lower wage. It's terrible to call people a basket of deplorables because they don't have money. They also initiated that money and prestige, money and fame. That's what's important. Not well, the they hard work that built this place. The, the people who stormed the Capitol and the people, I went to those rallies for Trump. They're deplorable. Oh, they are. <laughs> those people are deplorable. They are deplorable, fascistic people. And they're stupid. And stupid. That is yeah. true. Yeah, stupid and they're getting us killed. Deplorable. They won't yeah, get back. Right. They're getting us killed. I mean, at some point. They are. And also, they have no program except to negate the current program. They have nothing right. positive at all to offer. And they're proto-fascists. They really are. They're angry proto-fascists who don't want to look at the real enemy because the real enemy is actually more powerful than they. They want to stomp on whoever is lower in the social order than they. Women they are building are the poor. I, I was watching uh, Matt Gates. Uh, is it Cawthorn? Hawthorne? Cawthorn and, and Bobert and saying things that have nothing to do with policy, pure hatred. Yes. You know, let's go, Brandon, this attacking of Biden. And it's just about hating liberals and hating Democrats. Uh, hatred for the other side. You, you can actually build a movement on nothing other than hatred. Right. We're offering you nothing other than hatred for the other side, hatred for blacks, Arabs, Muslims. Now, I'm kind of pleased to see that the anti-Semitism is out in the open now uh, so that my oh, Jewish friends, the, the, the Jew, my Jewish friends who uh, the, not they're not my friends, my relatives, who, yeah. my, who thought who think that they're not these people don't aren't coming for the Jews, which they are. Yeah. Yeah, that's Heather Heyer. They killed Heather Heyer and those same people that Trump said there were a lot of nice people in that group. You know, they were fascists and anti-Semites and they are angry and they have a right to be angry. They have been shafted, but they don't want to look up the ladder to see who did it. It's suck up, kick down in a right. classic way that is sick and cruel and it won't help their cause. It will just express their rage. And someone like Bernie did express people's rage, but he had a program to help. He understood the rage. That's right. And yeah. he was defeated in large part by Southern and many Southern blacks who thought he was progressive because he made, you know, he had his campaign headquarters, one of them at the Hotel Teresa. You know, You're talking about who? I'm talking about Clinton. Clinton, right. Oh, you know, and Hillary Clinton. Yeah, and what would have happened? The, what happened was the Democrat, it was a given that the Senate was up for grabs. It went back and forth between Republicans and Democrats. But Clinton lost the House two years into his presidency. He lost the House of Representatives. That was a tectonic shift when Newt Gingrich won in 94. The Republicans hadn't had the House in, what was it, 40 years? How many years had it been? What? I didn't you turn your back on the working people, right. you lose the House. That's right. And there are now two classes in our capitalist system. It's now the employers and those who work directly under them and get a decent wage, and the employees who get cheated all the time. And, you know, Trump is a classic demagogue and the Republicans went to demagoguery. Right. And the Democrats went to corporate money with a veneer of progressive gender and race politics, but only a veneer. Because the people who were shafted were black and brown people and women who earn less. You know, uh, I hear we have to wrap it up, but let me uh, let me ask you if this is too simplistic, because I'm utterly convinced this is the answer. I have spent the past 11 years hearing Democrats say 
overturn Citizens United. We got to get the money out of politics. I've heard Democrats who are very wealthy say we need a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. And good luck with that. And my answer is we don't need to get money out of politics. We need to get you out of the Democratic Party. We need to get people who have money out of the Democratic Party. And there's one measure. If you're worth half a million dollars, quarter of a million dollars, that is a liability. That should be held against you. Well, if, if you have different values, of course it would be. You wouldn't think someone's qualified for a government position because he's a CEO. You'd think, well, if he's a CEO, he's used to cheating ordinary people, you're excluded. Who makes an honest living? Okay, who's a champion of the people? Who's working for nonprofits? Those people are the ones we want. However, the culture is so saturated with capitalist values that it's assumed that those people can lead. We want a business leader. Most businesses fail. And these people are kept on even when they wreck everything. They're given golden parachutes. You know, Roger Ailes with a disgusting culture, he got 60 million to leave. Lester right. Moonves, who was raping people at 50 million. People who fail get these amazing golden parachutes. While the people under them are thrown out with nothing. And the American culture eulogizes money. If you're, you're rich, there's something good about you rather than yeah. you're suspect. Yeah, we, we have to change the culture. Yeah. Parents, parents need to teach their kids that the rich will not save us right. and don't go to movies starring millionaires. Don't watch anything that's made by a corporation. It is suspect. Anything that's made by a corporation is suspect. That's true, but I also don't think you should just forbid them there. I just think you should have taxes that remove their money. Yes, well and said. And not Dr. allow the little, you know, often people like uh, Bezos and others will say, I get a dollar a year. That's what the person from Whole Foods said. Yes, you get a dollar because your stocks are not taxed. The wealth in them are not taxed. And when you and so you don't have to pay a penny. And then when you need money, you borrow against those stocks. So then you can get tax write offs on your debt and nobody touches your wealth. They touch your wealth. If you're somebody with a little house, you get property tax. They touch your wealth. If you have a car, you get a car tax, but not your wealth with stocks and bonds and not your wealth in all of those things that are not taxed. So if we wanted to equalize things, we would take what FDR did, 96, no, 94.8% of that wealth should be taxed. Great. Dr. Harriet Frott is the host of Capitalism Hits Home, and it's not just in your head. How do people contact you? They, um, hfraud at gmail.com or harrietfraud.com. Um, on my website. Fantastic. You Thank have you. have a great show. I love talking to you. I, I, the show is only as good as the guests. So That's this a is a great guest. show. Thanks. It's a great show because of you. And our next guest, Professor Adnan Hussein, is bringing back Professor David Schmidt, who I know from thegreatcourses.com. He has a fantastic lecture series called Mystery and Suspense Fiction, which I have not finished yet. But if you're a fan of the detective novel, I'm going to tell you to go to thegreatcourses.com and purchase Mystery and Suspense Fiction. He teaches a class in the detective novel from Edgar Allan Poe, uh, the, the Rue Morgue, the murder at the Rue Morgue through uh, Sherlock Holmes and then Agatha Christie and then to on to all the other hard boiled type of detective novels from Dashard Hamill, Mickey Spillane and uh, uh, Raymond Chandler. And he it's a really great lecture series. And 
The other great thing about the great courses dot com, and then I'll be quiet, is <laughs> these classes online teach you that you can learn anything anywhere. And the idea, I'm going to get angry, of <laughs> sending your kid to an elite private school. I used to drive a Taurus and it had the same body as a Jaguar. I was told that they just replaced, I'm, I'm telling you that when I, my Taurus at one time was identical to a Jaguar. They just, they changed the body, but it had the same engine basically as a, uh, as a, a Jaguar. You don't need these elite private schools. They go to thegreatcourses.com and take mystery and suspense fiction, study with Professor David Schmid, and uh, I will shut up about this, but it'll turn you into a connoisseur of professors. And you'll see that just because somebody says they're sending their kid to a $50,000 a year preschool to get them on that fast track into some $2 million a year private school. It's not about education. It's about something else. Take it away. Deep Springs graduate, Professor Adnan Hussein. I'm going to turn my camera off and uh, be quiet. Well, thanks so much, David, um, for uh, having us on again. And for David Schmid um, for returning. It's wonderful to have you back uh, with us on the David Feldman Show. Thanks, Adnan. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, we had a wonderful conversation a few months ago about um, serial killers, mass killings and violence in America, in popular culture as well. And since it was Halloween, mm -hmm. it seemed like it was a good time to come speak with you perhaps about um, why Halloween and horror and the whole genre of uh, horror fiction and horror movies that you know, we're used to watching in the lead up to um, Halloween over this last weekend, last month or so. Why does it matter? Why should we care about horror? Mm. Well, actually, Adnan, I probably should have given you more notice about this, but I feel like, you know, we need to begin by discussing really the most pressing issue of the day. And that is, of course, the Nuno has been sacked as the boss at Tottenham. Oh, so yes. the question is, like, who talk are about, they going to hire next? Talk about horror. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. See, it's not a million miles divorced from the subject of our conversation this evening because Tottenham have truly had a horrific season so far. But anyway, I digress. Uh, no, your question is an excellent one. I think I would answer it by saying that part of the reason that we should care is because horror as a genre is booming. And it's booming across all media, whether we're talking about film or television or fiction or video games or on the internet. And I think part of the reason for that is because everyday life for the majority of people is at the least anxiety inducing. Uh, it's frightening for others. It's terrifying in the worst case scenario. And I think part of the reason that horror is booming today is because the genre speaks to those fears, sometimes in a cathartic way, so that we can use horror narratives as a kind of uh, therapeutic release or relief from these fears, but also because horror has a long history of providing a uh, social critique of one form or another. So I think part of the reason we should care about horror is this is where we find a uh, social critique in unexpected forms um, and in very effective forms, I would, I would argue. Well, that's very interesting. I mean, I think if we're thinking about the consumer capitalist era that we're living in, that you're alluding to as this anxiety producing uh, system uh, that uh, infuses daily life with worry, anxiety, fear, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me um, in terms of social critique of, um, 
you know, Marx is capital in this community. Many people participated in a weekly reading group, Weekly Marx, and we read Capital Volume One. And I think everyone was quite astonished that um, he filled his discussion of political economy with a very vivid sense of the horror and even refers to the werewolf like hunger for surplus value talks about vampires several times as like draining the workers of their lifeblood in the capitalist system and workers uh, you know become extensions of the machines it's kind of this dystopic uh, you know matrix like uh, automatons that workers become subordinate to machines so you know if we think about um capitalism even from the very early period it seemed that marx employed gothic and horror imagery i'm wondering you as a horror a scholar of of, of horror literature um what do you make of this from its very origins and beginnings um, well <clears throat> i think if marx was looking for an objective correlative so to speak a, a way to convey the visceral brutality of capitalism on the one hand, but also how it often um, conceals its monstrosity mm. in such a way that people are tricked into giving their consent. In this case, they sell their labor supposedly freely and voluntarily and enter into a contract. And then once the contract is signed, they find themselves in a situation that is uh, much more horrific than they were anticipating. So if you're a writer like Marx, who obviously has strong literary inclinations in his style at all times, um, it should come as no surprise that he's going to go to the Gothic uh, to find um, that objective correlative, because it gives him, I think, a, uh, a fountain of, um, of images that he can use to dramatize what otherwise could be you know, a very dry and abstract concept. And goodness knows, there are plenty of passages in Capital that are indeed dry and abstract. But um, every so often, you know, we come upon these uh, images of vampires and werewolves almost as a kind of oasis in some ways. And they, they really succeed in doing what they set out to do, which is to give us that very immediate sense of what capitalism does um, to the human body, how devastating it is, how violent it is. And I think it's a tremendously effective technique. Yeah, indeed. Um, that's really interesting. I mean, I think, uh, you know, one of his uh, remarks, I think, uh, when he's talking about uh, capital accumulation is to liken it to cannibalism, you know, mm -hmm. so there's just so much um, of that. It's, it's interesting to think of him as a literary figure and not just a kind of dry political economist. We're reading Capital Volume 2 now, and unfortunately it doesn't have as much of this kind of metaphor since it didn't go through his own final editing. But what do you think this kind of literary sense of um, the horror genre has been able to accomplish after Marx when it really begins in film and, and so on? How does it continue to um, how does the gothic and the horror uh, continue to provide a sort of social critique? Right. Well, there's a, a you know a continuing debate about what the first true horror film would be, um, and in as much as there's consensus on that matter, a lot of people point to the cabinet of Dr. Caligari mm -hmm. as as inaugurating the uh, film horror genre, and there I think if you do choose that as your starting point you have a very interesting example of a film produced immediately following um, Germany's loss in World War I and the way in which the filmmakers, um, both of whom had traumatic experience during the war, use the horror genre as a way to comment upon what the country had just experienced. And in particular, um, 
trying to encourage a kind of healthy suspicion of authority and to point out the consequences of what happens when a single individual is given too much power. So right from the beginning, you can see that horror film has that potential to be used as a form of social critique. And even if you were to choose the other popular um, candidate for the beginning of horror film, which would be Nosferatu, Mm -hmm. There you have a figure that is the vampire that's not only used by Marx, but is also, of course, famously used by Bram Stoker in Dracula as a kind of embodiment of colonial and imperial um, conquest and everything that is associated with that. And you see that very clearly in Nosferatu as well. So you could argue that this um, tendency towards social critique, or at the very least, the ability to interpret horror um, as a form of social critique is really sort of built into uh, the DNA of the genre right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, I'm, of course, inclined to want to add to one of the uh, early uh, uh, films in the genre, Birth of a Nation, but I don't think it was intended right. to be a, a horror film, but uh, for... Well, uh, you know, I, I would say about that, Adnan, that I think one of the advantages of um, a generic classification like horror is its flexibility. Mm. And I think that that in itself can be a useful tool of critique because you can take... Um, a narrative that wouldn't ordinarily be classified as a horror narrative and in making an argument for why it should be considered that you not only encourage this kind of self-reflexive um, relationship with the genre but you also make uh, an argument for why that genre should be extended and why it should be applied in this particular case. So I'm not one of these uh, people who insist upon, you know, very sort of firm limits to the definition. I think the interest in uh, occasions is when precisely you can argue about whether something should be reclassified as a horror narrative. Well, in this case, I would just say for if you take, uh, you know, audience uh, response, <laughs> you know, right. Uh, it certainly is terror inspiring and terror inducing, you know, the racial violence uh, of the KKK and so on. Um, but I understand that in the 30s, um, the monster movies like Frankenstein and others became really uh, popular. And how do you see yeah. the growth of the genre in, in the course of the 30s um, reflecting social critique in that time? I mean, one aspect of this is escapism. Um, so in other words, the monster movies were particularly popular um, in an era not long after the American economy had collapsed in 1929. So the standard explanation for the popularity of the universal monster movies in the 1930s is that uh, the public were looking for an escape from everyday reality. And I certainly wouldn't dismiss that reading. And I would also just say as an aside, I don't really agree with the attitude that you still find amongst a lot of critics of popular culture who consider escapism to be a, a bad thing. I think it's an absolutely necessary thing. It serves a very important social function. But beyond that, I would argue that what you find in those uh, monster movies of the 1930s is another very important element of the horror genre is this engagement with the figure of the other. Um, mm -hmm. that is embodied in various forms, whether it be the mummy or Frankenstein or the Invisible Man or Dracula. And on one hand, that engagement with the other is obviously characterized by monstrosity. And to that degree, the monster is this abjected figure that we are meant to be scared of. But that's not the whole story by any means, because if you were to take... James Whale's 1931 film, Frankenstein, uh, as an example, that film is typical of many monster movies of the period in that it also encourages the audience's sympathetic identification with the monster. So mm -hmm. otherness and the way it's treated in these films, is it's certainly not as simple as just identifying a target for hatred or aggression. It's 
got just as much to do with this sympathetic, sympathetic identification with the figure of the outsider. And in that sense, you could argue that part of the appeal, especially in the context in the years after the Great Depression, was it spoke to people's um, realization that they had been left outside of the social contract. This system that everyone uh, uh, believed would take care of them had suddenly disappeared and they'd been left to fend for themselves. And in that context, a figure like Frankenstein would, in, I mean, the monster rather, would indeed be very sympathetic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, a different uh, twist to it. I have another thought on it. I'm wondering during that era, this is more, uh, technical dimensions of the genre mm -hmm. do you think that um it's, i'm just struck by the fact that there seem to have been so many interesting early films in the horror genre and i'm wondering if the era of silent films somehow was conducive to this kind of wordless uh, nameless fear i don't know if the if the I mean, of course, obviously the genre has developed very well with all kinds of audio and dialogue and, and everything. But it, it, I wonder if if um, there was something about um, the filmmaking and uh, that that um, you could tap into some elemental form of social critique through horror that would have been, I don't know, less possible to do through. A, um, uh, you know, a, a kind of subject that would have required a lot of dialogue and, and, and so on. I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts about that. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I think you could definitely, if you go back to Caligari and Nosferatu, you can make the argument that the visual language of German expressionism, which influences those films, was um, more than able to communicate uh, without the use of audible dialogue, whether it be through the way that which the sets were designed, or the lighting or the actors expressions, um, along with subtitles, it was able to convey uh, meaning very effectively. And in fact, um, ironically, if you again go to the example of Frankenstein, the reason Bella Lugosi turned down the role of the monster was because it had no dialogue. It wasn't a speaking part. <laughs> he felt that that was beneath him. And so Boris Karloff got the role and does an absolutely extraordinary job of communicating to the audience why that monster deserves sympathy through a very um, sort of pre-linguistic uh, code of grunts and moans and facial expressions. So I think you're right. The, the visual language of horror is already sort of very communicative, but when you add dialogue into that, obviously you're able to add yet another um, uh, weapon in your arsenal, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So what did filmmakers accomplish in terms of cultural and social critique in later eras when they could combine that visual dimension, uh, you know, the gruesome, uh, you know, kind of slasher type films or, you know, right. uh, what, what happens when they can also combine dialogue in the sort of post-war period? Well, I mean, very quickly, we should say that um, this is where we need to draw a, a quick distinction between what we, the, the audience, can read into um, and decode from a film and what the director necessarily intends. Because if you take a film made during the height of the Cold War, for example, like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, uh, the director, Don Siegel, and the star, Kevin McCarthy, have both described that film as just a, a simple adventure film. They never meant for it to be um, some kind of allegory uh, about anti-communism or an allegorical critique of American conformity in the post-war era. And yet the film has been read in both of those ways um, consistently. So the dialogue um, can give that additional layer of meaning, but it can also be so generative that you can have a film like Invasion of the Body Snatchers that can have two completely plausible, but ideologically and politically polarized readings. Um, is it a critique of uh, anti? Is it a critique of communism? Is it a critique of American conformity? And the answer is yes. <laughs> it's both of those. Um, another example would be um, a really landmark film, *Night of the Living Dead* in 1968, directed by George Romero. Again, Romero, you know, never pretended to make some kind of grand ideological statement with that film. 
And he's uh, he famously claimed that even his casting of Dwayne Jones, um, an African-American actor in the lead role, which historically was immensely important, had absolutely nothing to do with Jones's race. He just said he gave the best audition. That's why he got the role. But even there, um, people very, very quickly, considering the year it, it was released, um, saw the zombies not only as a kind of symbol um, for the excesses of American capitalism and consumerism, but also as a kind of uh, allegory for American involvement in Vietnam at the time. And so this is, I think the best way to think of this is that these horror texts have potentialities in contained within them um, that can be realized by the audience. It doesn't really matter whether or not the director intended um, that level of meaning. Um, as long as uh, audiences are responsive to what they see as that potentiality, that to me is more important because it points to how generative horror attacks can be. And I would say this is true, even of a, a film that not many people would say has any aspirations towards social critique at, at all, which is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, produced in, in the 1974, which many people would regard as being in the absolute gutter of exploitation films, and in fact is celebrated by many people um, precisely for that reason. But even in the case of Texas Chainsaw, bear in mind that the family of cannibals that's at the center of that film are former slaughterhouse workers who have been made unemployed. And consequently, with no other means to support themselves, what do they do? They start a family business. <laughs> they become entrepreneurs, as a matter of fact. Um, this is not necessarily something that we're meant to admire, their entrepreneurial spirit, but that economic subtext to Texas Chainsaw, um, you don't have to read too deeply into a subtext to find that layer of meaning. So there's another great example about a film which a lot of people absolutely despise um, can be read in such a way to give it uh, that dimension of social critique. Well, that's fascinating because I think, you know, we've heard some language about those who have been the losers and displaced in neoliberalism in recent times. Uh, and in fact, actually 1974 is about the time that whole process of exactly. liberalizing the economy was, was beginning and taking place with the oil shocks and so on. Um, but we've heard about deplorables, we've heard about, um, you know, people who should basically be considered um, much like those characters in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'm wondering about the contemporary relevance. You mentioned how important horror as a genre in every kind of field of contemporary popular culture, you know, is there something to the to this that um, that shift or change in direction of aspects of the horror genre, um, you know, since these slasher films, um, you know, if if there is something, you know, to recover, you know, you might say about. I think definitely there is. I mean, we we can't possibly conclude this discussion without mentioning uh, Squid Game, mm -hmm. because there is an example of a piece of popular culture that a is generically difficult to pin down. Is it horror? Is it suspense? Is it thriller? Is it crime? Yes, it's all of those things. So again, we have this idea of a hybrid monstrous genre that doesn't obey sort of neat generic classifications. And what I would add to that is to me, it's so extraordinary and telling the, the, the resonance, resonance that this, this narrative has with so many people. I mean, the most popular program ever streamed on Netflix. Why? Because I think it's anti-capitalism is there right on the surface. It's not subtext. We all know that we cannot have Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos without having the dispossessed on the other side. These two things exist in a complementary and symbiotic relationship to us. But we, it's one thing to know that. It's another thing to see it visually presented in a compelling way in a series like Squid Game. And I think this is a big part of the reason why um, that show resonated with so many people. It really encapsulates horrors, 
ability to speak to the contemporary social formation in a way that is not didactic, uh, it's not preachy, it's dramatic, it's thrilling, and it's able to dramatize things that we all know exist, but to do so in a memorable way. That's absolutely terrific. Um, I'm wondering if anybody has any other questions. Well, I, if I would like to open, I don't know how you're doing on time, Professor, but I have some questions and I'd like to ask sure. people in our virtual studio audience mm -hmm. to raise their hand. Cancel culture. Right. It exists. I, I don't think it really is a problem, but people are mm -hmm. being censored. How is that affecting horror films? I don't think it is at the moment. I mean, to me, the market for horror narratives is more active and more wide open than it's ever been before. And I think a lot of this um, can be attributed to the success of Get Out a few years ago. I think part of the reason that Get Out was a game changer is that like The Exorcist in 1973, it persuaded the culture industries and the financiers that horror could be a mainstream phenomena. And it could be something that should, can and should be taken seriously. And so I think that for that reason, studios um, are more willing to take a gamble with horror narratives than they've ever been before. And more projects are being greenlit now that previously would have had a really hard time getting funding. Right. But the success of Get Out just changed everything in that respect. The reason I bring this up is because I'm interested in comedy. Get mm -hmm. Out was a comedy. Right. Is it, do you find that horror films are more subversive politically than today's comedies? I think they tend to be because, well, do, 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 is that a fair statement? I, I personally would agree with that. Um, but I would also add, and this is a point of view that not everyone agrees with, but personally, I don't think comedy and horror necessarily go very well together. I can think of a lot of uh, those hybrid narratives that work as comedies, but not as horror narratives. I, I was think just going to ask you about that. Yeah, I think you can really? count on the you can count on the fingers of one foot how many of these hybrids are actually successful as uh, horror narratives in the in the sense that they frighten you. Because to me, laughter is the antithesis of fear. Laughter dispels fear in a way that you cannot have um, a comic narrative that is also a horror narrative. Now, what about Get Out? Well, I think the reason that Jordan Peele succeeds in combining those two things is that he keeps the comedic elements rigidly under control. They are almost all associated with the character of Rod. Whenever Rod shows up, the TSA agent, we get these moments of comic relief. When he's not on the screen, there's no comedy. And I think that's how you do it. And that's what Jordan Peele understands. Um, and so it has to be something that's introduced with a very, very light touch. So it doesn't dissolve uh, the fear and the dread that we expect from horror. To, to me, uh, excuse me for one second, Professor Hussein, and then I'll, I, I, but this is really important to me. Com See, I do think there's a link between comedy and horror. Th that the more horrible something is, the funnier it is. Mm -hmm. I, I always say, you know, a, a the only thing funnier than your grandmother falling down a flight of steps is if she's in a wheelchair and has the flu. Right. So, uh, you know that that that's a fact as far as I'm concerned with comedy. And I've I've seen myself so horrified at some horror films that I've seen that I've laughed out of surprise and shock. So if you're playing it for comedy, it's no good. But if you're playing it for sheer horror, you're going to get bigger laughs. Is that a fair statement? I think that is a fair statement. And we should also add that uh, to me, this makes a difference as to whether you're watching a horror film by yourself or in a movie theater. Because I think once you add that communal dimension to the experience, the comedy tends to get amped up. I mean, I'll give you an example. Before the lockdown, before the pandemic, I was watching a not very good horror movie 
uh, with my kids in the movie theater called The Prodigy about an evil child. And at one point in the film, when it's already been established that the kid is evil, he comes into his mother's room and the kid's about eight or nine years old. And he says, mommy, can I sleep in your bed tonight? And before the mother replies, someone in the audience said, oh, hell no. And the whole <laughs> movie theater collapsed, right? Because it was, it's what we were all thinking, but the timing was perfect. The punchline was there. And that kind of interaction between the audience uh, and the screen, I think, can play such an important role um, in the there success of a laughter. horror narrative. To me, there can't be great laughter unless right. there's unless you've created tension. Yes, unless, absolutely. And, and, and laughter is, is the release. Yeah. Uh, evil is funny. Iago in Othello is funny. And, yeah. You know, people get but, uh, but people I'll tell you this, I mean, it, but it also varies. I mean, for example, I assumed that, to go back to Get Out, I assumed that most people's reaction when uh, Rod, the TS agent, shows up at the end of the it's film to rescue film. Chris, is that when they realize it's Rod, when I watched the film, the, film, the, audience, the audience went crazy. Went. Everyone started clearing, cheering and clapping. I spoke to someone recently who saw Get Out when it was first released at a cinema in the Deep South. They started clapping before they realized it was Rod. In other words, they were cheering and clapping when they thought it was the cops. When they realized it was Rod, there was dead silence in the cinema, at which point my friend started to feel really nervous and said, maybe we should leave. So, right. you know, those moments of like laughter and release and tension also have that kind of unpredictability um, sort of built into them. You don't always know how someone's going to respond, even though it's coded. Right. Professor, uh, uh, I'll turn it back to Professor Hussein. How much do you have time to take some questions from the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I see that John Hayes has a question. Why don't we ask? have John Hayes ask? Yes. Yes, um, David, what do you think about David Cronenberg, for example? He, he focuses on body horror, as it were. It's uh, <clears throat> dealing with the self, and that's my feeling about it. It's just people are insecure about their own self and if they trust themselves or their own bodies and how that might relate to uh, horror in general. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge Cronenberg fan. I think the body horror genre in particular can be um, extremely subversive because it sort of speaks to those very intimate fears we have about our own bodies, their ability to turn against us, or our perceptions of what we feel to be their inadequacies. And it's also a great subgenre to explore the gender dimensions of bodies as well. So although body horror is not to everyone's taste, I think it's a really good way to touch the audience, <laughs> the pun intended, to touch the audience in a way that really um, makes them experience those fears at a very visceral level. And that's what I admire about it. That's why I think it's useful. Thank you, I agree. Rodrigo has a question. Let me... Uh, Can he unmute? Rodrigo? There he is. Hi, David. Uh, my question is, aren't there lots of uh, horror movies where we're expected to root for the rich white survivors when they come after Frankenstein's monster for being bear challenged? Uh, I'm conflating a lot of things there, but... Yeah, I, th I think on the surface, when we see, you know, that classic image of the mob of angry villagers with the flaming torches pursuing the monster. In theory, we're meant to be um, on the side of the angry villagers, but um, I don't think that's necessarily a given. And I think especially if you rewatch Frankenstein in 2021, uh, hopefully you would be less inclined than ever um, to identify with the angry mob. Now, that, of course, is not going to be true for everyone, but that's one of the things that makes um, the political messages or content of horror narratives so interesting. As I indicated before, when I was talking about Invasion of the Body Snatchers, 
you can have mutually incompatible readings of a horror narrative that coexist with each other. So that means that you can show a film to a hundred people and, you know, they could split right down the middle in drawing completely different messages and conclusions from it. So even though the subtextual layer of meaning may be there, that doesn't mean that it's always going to be read identically by every member of the audience. And it's one of the things that makes these texts um, so rich. I think we have a question from Professor John. Professor John, I have to allow you to talk. Yes, hello. Uh, Hi. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, you know, on that point of, you know, the audience interpreting the message of or messages of the of the work, whether it's yeah. film, what have you. Um, if you're trying to create a film that is delivering a particular message or getting people to think of, in a particular way about something, mm -hmm. um, television shows or criticized for being heavy handed. Yeah. Uh, is there a way to do that, that, um, you know, is not knocking the person over the head? And, and do you have any examples of that? Well, I think very often um, in horror narratives, especially in films, over the years, there's tended to be a kind of tension when it comes to the conclusion of a narrative, which is, obviously where you're going to you know leave your audience with something like the moral that they're meant to take away from this story and there has been a tension between providing resolution on the one hand and leaving things open-ended on the other and some people have felt very strongly that part of the appeal of horror narratives is that in the narrative horror comes to an end and so for that reason resolution of some kind must be provided now you can do that in a way that's not necessarily didactic if you can also combine that resolution with the possibility that not everything is as neatly resolved as it appears now apart from anything else this is a good business model ironically because then you leave open the possibility uh, of a sequel <laughs> and this is something that actually goes again all the way back to dr caligari one of the interesting things about that film is that it provides a frame narrative and a lot of people have been critical of that frame narrative because they say it makes the story too conventional. It wraps up all of the loose ends and it allows the viewer to walk out of the movie theater with a, with a feeling of tidy resolution. Some filmmakers want that, other filmmakers definitely don't. I think nowadays we're tending more and more toward a lack of resolution because we're comfortable with that. And part of the reason we're comfortable with that is because we live in a world without resolutions. We live in a world without, you know, any so tidy conclusions to these problems. I think, we, I think we've gotten to everybody, I believe. Uh, I'll be piggish and ask one question about The Exorcist. Yeah. I went and saw the 25th anniversary of The Exorcist. It was showing at UCLA. Now, the first time I saw it, I had never been that scared in mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. 25 years later, I'm living in Los Angeles, a friend of mine, and I go to UCLA, <clears throat> and it's filled with young co-eds who, in the lead up to the movie, the coming attraction, there was an energy in the room that reminded me of my father showing me Frankenstein and telling me there was a t you, you're not going to believe how terrified my generation was. Right. You're going to laugh at what scared us. Yeah. And I, and I remember I hadn't seen I hadn't seen The Exorcist in 25 years, and I just heard these young kids laughing, yep. and they were smoking and probably taking mm -hmm. mushrooms, and I'm thinking, they don't think, they're not anticipating <laughs> this movie, and I don't right. know how scary it's going to be. And right. I saw young kids 
freaking out. Yeah. From that I, movie. I would and, actually say I that. I admit. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed of, it. Of all, of all the movies I teach on a regular basis, The Exorcist is the one that still tends to get under their skin. Um, when I first started teaching a horror film, there were films I left off the syllabus thinking they might be too intense for them. And as it turned out, not only had they seen them, but the average age at which they first watched them was 10 or 11 years old. <laughs> like what so, movie? you know, um, well, for, for, for example, like Takashi Miike's Audition, which is a terrifying movie, and they'd watched it at 11 years old, which is just inconceivable to me. But The Exorcist has that rare ability to still be shocking and disturbing to the contemporary generation. The other thing I would compare it to in that sense in literature is William Burroughs's Naked Lunch, not because of any similarity in subject matter, but simply because you can still teach Naked Lunch today and students are disgusted by it, which is one of the reasons I love Naked Lunch because so few things, so few things can do that. However, I would just add one more thing, David. Um, I once saw, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And the next uh, week, uh, a female student came to me and said, um, oh, by the way, the class had let out about 10 o'clock at night. So she drove back to her apartment and realized that she'd locked herself out of her apartment. So had to spend the night in her car mm. after watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre. She said the film hadn't scared her at all, but the combination of the film and having to sleep in her car for the night, that did it. So I would say, if you think a film hasn't scared you, try sleep in your car the night after you've immediately <laughs> seen it, and you'll have a much better sense of how much the film got to you or not. Can a movie tra can a movie traumatize somebody? Like, I think it can. I mean, yeah. that gets us into the whole area of trigger warnings, which is obviously like a whole kettle of fish. I mean, someone right. said I should have trigger warnings in my horror film class, and I felt I, my response was to say. If you're taking a horror film class, I would think the trigger warnings are, are unnecessary. But yes, I think so. And, and often they can sneak up on us. We don't know that we're going to have this response until we're in the middle of the movie and then it's too late. Um, but arguably, I would say a lot of horror films have psychological escape hatches built into them to stop us from becoming over-identified. There's a very, very, very small number of horror films that make us feel complicit with what we're seeing. Mm. And that to me is the sign of a truly great horror film. Uh, and I'm thinking of films like Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer or Michael Haneke's Funny Games that make us feel that we are responsible by virtue of the fact we are watching for what's happening on the screen. And that's an intensely uncomfortable feeling and it's a feeling that most films want to avoid like the plague because what most of us want is guilt-free enjoyment of violence and that's what we get from horror i the hardest i've laughed at a horror film was henry portrait of a serial killer i only saw it <laughs> once and i remember it the henry said to his roommate it was 30 years ago that i saw it that's your sis he was flirting right. with his sister Right. And he said, that's your sister. That's wrong. And I remember thinking, I think the audience laughed, but. Well, when they, when they sent the movie away to be uh, classified by the censorship board, they, they got, it got sent back saying, we can't give this a rating. And normally they suggest what scenes need to be changed. So they said, well, what scenes can we change? They said, nothing. You would need to change the entire film. The entire right. film has an objectionable moral content. And to me, that's what makes the film so great. Right. What film can you just, if it comes on TV, like to me, The Godfather, obviously. Right. You know, I get locked in. Is there a horror film that it's on the TV and you say, okay, I'll just two minutes and next thing you know, you're locked. In. Um, the most recent one, I would say that I, I really wanted to take the opportunity to recommend that just blew me away was a movie that came out a couple of years ago called St. Maud. Um, don't think it's been seen by a lot of people, but it's just an absolutely powerhouse film, kind of a slow burn, psychological suspense, not much gore. Uh, but once you're locked into that film, you absolutely cannot look away. It's a great, great film. Well, I'll let Professor Hussein uh, wrap this up. I just want to tell my listeners to go to thegreatcourses.com and take Professor David Schmidt's class 
on the uh, the mystery, the detective novel. It will uh, change the way you read. And I hope you can come back and talk about the, the detective novel. And uh, I would love to do that, David. It's, uh, I really enjoy being on the show. So thank you so much for having me back. Thank you. I'll, I'll let Professor Hussein. Well, just, just to say thanks so much, David. How can people follow your work? And also, before we do the, defect, the, the detective, I've been trying to get David to agree to come in and talk about the political spy thriller uh, oh yeah 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 as well so we got we've got Definitely. a real agenda yeah. here but how can people follow your work um probably the easiest way to to do that is to go to the uh english department web page at the university of buffalo and uh, i update that page pretty frequently but i can also be found ranting on twitter and facebook as well right what's your twitter mayor name? tomorrow night have... who's mayor yes. of buffalo next tomorrow oh, hopefully hopefully we'll have a new mayor in a couple of weeks it's a very exciting time yeah please vote for india walton if you're listening to this and are from buffalo um but uh actually i don't know my uh, twitter handle offhand but i think it's david schmidt one yes i think it's at david schmidt one so do okay, give a there follow you go. Yes, please do. And also just to announce, um, Guerrilla History is turning one years old. We're having a our very first inaugural live stream on Saturday, November 6th at 6 p.m. You, I've already booked it into office hours as well, so you won't be missing anything. So come celebrate with us. We're going to talk with uh, Professor Gerald Horn about a variety of topics, including Texas and American fascism, solidarity with Cuba and uh, U.S. in uh, CIA in Africa. So it'll be great. We'd love to see you come out there and help celebrate one year of left history on our podcast. Well, thank you so much. Both Thank of you. you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Adnan. Thank you. Please come back as soon as possible. Th do. And Take care. Thank you. I know how busy the both of you are, and it's a, an honor. Thank you. Well, you're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Please let me push The Secrets of Great Mystery and Suspense Fiction by Professor David Schmid. Schmidt and go to thegreatcourses.com. For me, the great courses, and they're not sponsoring the show. I, I, they were uh, changed my life. Uh, you have access to the greatest professors in the world over at the great courses. They have a again. I promise you, I'm not making any money doing this. They have a Netflix type of streaming service. I think it's, I think I pay $15 a month and I have access to the entire library of the great courses. And you can just study whatever, you know, if you're in the mood to watch a lecture on the CIA, they have lectures on the CIA. And if you're interested in, in Agatha Christie, you can watch a lecture with Professor David Schmid about Agatha Christie and Miss Marple. It's a fantastic way to better yourself, thegreatcourses.com. Introduce yourself to this. And again, as I said at the top of this segment, it'll teach you that there are good professors and bad professors and good teachers and bad teachers. And just because you're paying a lot of money to send your kid to a university, it doesn't mean uh, that kid is getting the best professors. There are some amazing professors in this world, many of whom are on MOOCs. You can find them at, over at YouTube. They do a pretty fantastic job over at the great courses, uh, being respectful of your time. The, the lectures are all 30 minutes each and their booklets and study guides Go pick up Professor David Schmidt's class, The Secrets of Great Mystery and Suspense Fiction. You will thank me. You will thank me and Professor Schmidt. We will be back. I believe uh, it's Professor Marianne Cummings is next. Is that correct, Professor Marianne? Are you next? Yes, it is. Do you mind? Well, let's, let's, just, let's just go. I was going to play a song, but... 
Let's bring you in. Sorry, sorry to keep you waiting. Did I keep you waiting? I, maybe I didn't. Who do I have to apologize? Uh, well, uh, you know, I didn't have anywhere else to go. Neither did <laughs> so. I. Uh, uh, anyway, I no, I was listening. I could have, I could have listened to another hour of that. To tell you the truth, um, yeah, yeah. I, I saw. I feel I, I saw have to apologize. Birds. I have to oh, apologize. Well, you have to apologize to me so we can get this over with. Um, All right. But I wanted to talk about the birds. I just saw the bird. Watch the birds with a friend. I saw the birds and vertigo. Vertigo. I saw now what you me. tweeted. It was very funny. Yeah, and it's just, but it, it, it dawned on me that. The, the birds and Night of the Living Dead have sort of the same plot in that the evil, the elements of the evil, like individual birds or even individual dami, uh, zombies, they're, they're not really very dangerous. You can just kind of whack them with a baseball bat individually. It's just the... In, it's just the incessant kind of the coming of these, these things that keep coming and coming, that, you know, like the hordes of them and and they're all just like you know no no particular uh one villain or or brain behind it it's just this force that you can't reason with that never lets up and the real horror of course is the um it's not so much the the things that are out there which are just forces of nature but it's the uh, psychological breakdown of the group that's trapped by them so mm -hmm. you know and that's kind of most of the story. And a lot of horror is kind of like, in a certain sense, alien or aliens is kind of the same thing, even though those things individually are quite dangerous. They're not, uh, you know, they, they, they're, they're certainly killable. It's just that the whole group starts having its own breakdowns and, you know, it ends psychoses and, uh, you know, who survives is, is one of, you know, psychological resilience more than anything else. I don't remember being scared by the birds. I, re uh, as well, I saw it when I was a kid and I was. Now, did you see it when I saw it? It was on NBC and it was yeah. the most watched movie of the week for some I reason. I remember my mother let me stay up late and watch that movie. I think she wanted somebody to watch it with. And right. the, the I think what makes it when you're not trying to overthink something, what makes the birds so compelling, if you just let yourself get sucked in, is Bernard Herrmann's soundtrack. There's not a single song in the whole movie except that scene where the school kids are singing and the mm -hmm. crows one by one are assembling behind Melanie Griffith's mom. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, as he's saying they're having a cigarette, that was just creepy. That, by the way, that's a proper murder of crows. It's oh, that's right. Crows. It's a murder of crows is a line of them. And there were one murder of crows after another assembling. And so the way they, they did it. Pun. Yeah. So that was and, and it, there, it's kind of funny. And, and the usual thing, like if people behaved rationally, you wouldn't have much of a plot. But I, you could probably say that about any great movie or novel. Like if somebody just, you know, did something reasonable. <laughs> You wouldn't have you wouldn't have the drama. But, yeah. well, so what scares you? I I'm not I am scared by the unseen, like The Exorcist scares me, the unknowable, a, a slasher movie hmm. that doesn't scare yeah. you. Well, I, you know it's funny you said you're. I, I remember going to see The Exorcist, and I think I saw it with uh, Saul and our friend Michael, and there were only three of us in the theater. And then a bunch of kids came in and a bunch of kids were kind of laughing and joking and they thought it would be another like, you know, Halloween or, or, you know, Friday the 13th or whatever. And they were like you had described, they were chattering and they were having a good time. And boy, I, I mean, I didn't I did not see that movie when it first came out, although I remember people talking about it. But that movie you had really no idea. It was a differently paced story than we had been conditioned to up until the 90s, the late 90s. And it was like, I think what was freaking those kids out is they had no idea to where this was going. They had no idea what the resolution was going to be. They had, I mean, it freaked me out. I mean, it freaked me out when, uh, who was the character, Linda Blair, is yeah. crab walking downstairs. I did not expect that. That Reagan. just, yeah. Ooh. And they so, named her Reagan on Ray, purpose. Yeah. 
That was a slam at Reagan. He. How could that be a slam of Reagan? I mean, that The Exorcist, I think, came out. Seventy-four. He was book. governor. Of Cal he was governor of oh, California. Okay, that came out as a book, but when did it come out? It was a book many, was much, much longer before. Before it was. It, it, I think it was B William ba Beatty, Beatty, uh, something Beatty, I, and uh, they okay, purposely I named the devil Reagan. Reagan, huh. on purpose. It was not. Uh, they were right. Uh, but um, when I was a kid, so the movies that actually scared me, like was, was and that was kind of creepy. I don't know if that Jaws scared me. did not scare me. Jaws, Jaws is not scary. Oh, no, no. But the movies that scared me was Carnival of Souls. I watched one afternoon. It was Sir Gastly Graves program in the Detroit area. And it was like a rainy Saturday afternoon. That was a genuinely terrifying movie. Carnival of Souls. And I think that's a bit of a cult classic. Then it was Night of the Living Dead. I was staying up at age, oh, I don't know. I, I was young, but my parents were just down the street playing pinnacle. So they just set me up with, you know, milk and cookies. And I was watching this Night of the Living Dead. And they showed it without much commercial interruption. So it really did look like it was a real, you know, they had Chili Billy, which told my friends told me was a real newscaster in the Philadelphia area who was doing the... Uh, broadcasting the, the little t when they were watching the tv in the movie and it was the you know grainy sort of video film that news films were shot i mean that was who and the next the next monday because apparently that night there were like dozens of dozens of calls into it was a wjr tv station because people thought this was real and then my teacher got to teach us about you know uh orson wells and the you know the, the War of the Worlds. War of the Worlds. Yeah, that's how I learned about Ocean Wells. We talked about Night of the Living Dead. And I told him I saw the whole movie. And then the teacher's looking at me, aren't you a little young? And oh, my parents were next door playing Pinnacle. I got to stay up. But now, there's a myth about War of the Worlds. Yeah. That Americans didn't fall for it. That was part of the marketing behind. They've done a whole PBS documentary about war of the okay. world and how americans believe that we were under attack by aliens and now it turns out all that it was mostly hype okay that, how would i know i wasn't alive at the time all i knew is that alive. that's the first time i ever heard about it right i think the but uh, that was kind of creepy i saw alien the first alien movie uh after it was released but i saw it like in, in ann arbor at a late night show that was genuinely mm. terrifying the first one because you again you didn't know how that was going to end up jacob's ladder is a one has i don't know if you've seen that and i think what creeps me out about that again i had no idea what was going on and at the end it sort of is explained what might be happening. And I kind of believe that, hey, maybe that's actually what might, what you might go through if you haven't resolved crap and on your way out of this life. I mean, that was, that's what creeped me out. But, um, you know, uh, a lot of the, the horror, um, uh, the horror genres, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like, I've, I've, I've kind of taken by the fact that horror and comedy are very, very close in my mind. It's yes. like something that can be hilarious could have ended up horrifying and possibly because it could have been horrifying, it, it ends up being hilarious when the worst did not happen. And, you know, that's, right. that's, 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 I think. With comedy kind of though, comedy is considered more benign. So you have to pull your punches horror you don't yeah um th 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 that's true um i think that some of the funniest lines shakespeare ever wrote was in his tragedies mm -hmm. I mean, it, like, and for the same reason that uh saul goodman in breaking bad was like the most popular of the minor characters which because right. He kind of provide. It's it's a very dark. As the whole story starts, you know, just spiraling downward into darkness. There's the lawyer. There's a sleazy lawyer who is like a beacon of sanity and humanity and all this. Right. You know, so that's. that's well, I, I, I I've met, yeah. Uh, speaking of horror shows, uh -oh. Uh -oh. are we going to talk about Democrats collapsing? Um, 
what are we looking at here? What are we looking at? This is I'm you, you know, you're right. And, and, and I remember saying to you when you said you weren't going to vote for Biden, you're right, but I'm voting for Biden. And looking back, I still would have voted for Biden. I wanted Bernie, but you're right. The well, the problem is we only have four years left before the planet is irredeemable, right? And the left is asleep. Good chunk of the quote left really isn't the left. I mean, Rariki is going to be lecturing me now from here until next Tuesday on, you know, my use, my my easy word use of the word left. But, you know, the people who would consider themselves leftish are largely asleep. They think that it's just going to be handled because Democrats are in charge. And after all, they're not the like the evil Republicans. They won't let the world collapse and they're letting the world collapse. And it's yes. uh it's one of these horror, horror movie things where you don't know, there's no like central brain anymore. There's no central evil. There's just a bunch of, you know, like creepy zombies that don't even know what they're doing. That'll suck your brains out if you're not careful. And it's, and I don't know, and they keep coming. <laughs> right. I don't know what the answer is, except that it's probably not going to be in electoral politics, at least short term, I think the the, the biggest, I, I mean, the biggest hope for anything changing is the direct action in, in the strikes. And yes. I mean, because there is something, look, these guys who think they run the world, you know, the, the Obamas and the Clintons, I mean, people who might have gotten through graduate school or law school, but couldn't make breakfast to save their lives. Or right. You know, it's like, these are the guys that get rewarded. And these are the guys that really don't have, they think they have technical ability, they have no technical ability. And they, you know, if, if, you, were, if you were in the Hunger Games, these guys would be the first to die. You know, mm -hmm. at least in living in my neighborhood, people still know how to do things. So the people that know how to do things, and it's all labor. I mean, money doesn't create all this wealth and innovation. It's labor. It's a it's a person or people cooperating, uh, you know, when the project is big. So uh, that's what I think is going to happen. But I did read something that was very interesting to me. I read CNBC just, you know. Good. It's a good website. It's, it's, they kind of cover. The, well, they, they had a great website. article. Brian Schwartz today, frustrated Democratic donors threatened to hold back midterm donations over infighting in Congress and the tight Virginia race. And I'm going, whoa, you mean if Terry McAuliffe loses, you're going to take your money elsewhere next November? That's fantastic. Or at least next, next spring when there are several uh, pro genuinely progressive uh, challengers to uh, conservative Democrats, they won't have their money to spend. So uh, maybe I should be hoping that McAuliffe loses. Not what that. is, if the Democrats keep the House of Delegates, how bad is it? Then there's, they... then, there's, then there's gridlock, which is probably better than whatever, you know, like the, whatever Democrats like Terry McAuliffe would think of as progress, you know, and, and uh, speaking of which, I, I think that um, I was listening, talk about horror films, I was listening to uh, come on, uh, Pramila Jayapal talk about the leap of faith they're all going to take. And I'm like, the leap of faith, this sounds like, hey, you go up to the attic and I'll go down, check the cellar out. <laughs> <laughs> in a horror movie. What are they talking about, Leap of Faith? They are going to vote. Anyway, they made they're indications. They're going to vote for both bills, you're saying? They're going to vote for the infrastructure bill with the assurance that the reconciliation bill will be brought up. And I'm like going, don't. Are you effing with us? I mean, seriously, are you really, are you serious? You've got to be joking, you know? It's, um, but anyway, um, this is, uh, the, the rest of the article uh, describes how not only are they frustrated, they don't, they didn't think that Terry, they thought that McAuliffe would be a much stronger the performer than he is. And they're also frustrated that the Democrats haven't voted, you know, haven't gotten the bills together yet. In other words, voting for the massive subsidies that corporations are going to get if 
you know, the votes go the way they want. If you've got a completely gutted uh, reconciliation bill and the infrastructure bill, I mean, what's left of the reconciliation bill, a lot of it, I mean, if we are to believe what we hear, I don't know. I mean, there is some word that, uh, that, um, that Bernie is going to insist that they vote the 3.5 trillion or he's walking. Right. And I think at this point they should, they should call, they should, they should call Mansion and Cinema's bluff because Mansion and Cinema's donors want that uh, infrastructure bill. They want something, so you have power. So you say, okay, you want that, then we get this. Well, how badly do you want it? If you, if we don't get 3.5 trillion, you don't get that. I mean, that's how politics works. And if you're the one that is always blinking, if you're the one that's always caving, you're not gonna get anything. I, I mean, I don't understand what they think to get, and they're trying to be nice to Biden. I mean, some people were showing Biden today just kind of sleeping during <laughs> the, the big uh, uh, plenary talk at, at was it COP26 in Glasgow this morning? And I'm going, okay, you know, that's, that's, that's just so, you, that's you just know thing. More, you know more about this than I do. Earlier I was saying, what is he doing in Glasgow? He's got the Green New Deal on his desk. Get it passed. There's nothing. Oh, that's absolutely in, right. Yes, I mean. nothing in Glasgow that he needs to be told. We know what to do. He doesn't need the, the permission of any world leader. He doesn't need to play nice with China. If the, the U.S. is still a major force in the world, even economically, if the U.S. took the lead if they showed any leadership at all, there would have no problem with the other countries getting in line. I mean, but there no, right. there's no leadership. And that's what you get. We have a we regency have a government going on. I don't know who's making decisions in the Biden administration now. It isn't Biden. I, I, I mean, um, you know, I, I, I was listening earlier to your conversations about, um, I know, Uma, who, who is it, Uma Habedin? Right. She should talk. I mean, she should she should talk. It was just like Megan Kelly. Megan Kelly, that's no great profile and courage either either. I mean, somebody getting a mere $25 million a year. I think you're fine. You get $25 million a year, you're fine. You could go drag ahead. through the mud. Yeah. Drag right. through the mud. What does that even mean? You're rich, you know, you don't you don't touch mud. I mean, right. it's just, it's like, but then you look at Tara Reed sort of the elephant in the room that these feminists, you know, these kind of blue no matter who feminists don't want to talk about because Tara Reid really was not a privileged gal. I mean, she was, she had a hard time after, I mean, she was, she was, you know, a lowly intern or something working in Senator Biden's office when um, the alleged rape happened. Now, she's been vindicated uh, far more than say Christine Blasey Ford. I, I mean, Chris, I believe both of them. I believed- But her mother called into Larry King and reported yeah, that this. Was, that was dug out like a voice <clears throat> out of the grave. That was dug out, but right. also um, the, the Intercept uh, got a hold of the divorce papers and her husband in these papers year later was talking about a horrible incident that traumatized her when she was working you know, for Biden. And, you know, and it's been a, that was a part of the problem of their marriage. And she had a it, it, she was vindicated. The same team at The Intercept that looked at Chris, uh, that Chris looked at Christine Blady's Ford study uh, story, looked into Tara Reid's story with the same like, you know, most of these things do not happen in public with no direct witnesses. So it's always who did she tell at the time? It was the same, by the way, with Anita Hill. She, uh, Anita Hill had four witnesses, you know, when she was in front of Joe Biden's panel, ready to corroborate her story, and Joe Biden wouldn't call them up. She, he let her twist out there. Right. So uh, Joe Biden has always been this, and maybe he hasn't been as bombastic as uh, as old Trumpy. But you know, in recent years, John Stewart, Stewart did a whole segment on his show, which was kind of comedy, but a little bit not comedy, you know, showing Joe Biden in scene after scene after scene being very inappropriate, touching women, touching children. And by, uh, Stewart is going, hey, dude, you only had one job. 
you know, the vice president is just there to like, you know, be a public face and in case the president back up in case the president goes. And I think that was probably onset dementia. If a seasoned politician and Joe Biden, if if people, anybody who can present a Joe lunch pail persona while being an absolute servant of the banks, you know, president, senator from NBNA, they used to call him. I mean, has some retail political skills. And when you start to lose it, he was starting to lose it back then. You know, that's the kind of thing when onset dementia happens, you start losing sort of judgment about situations and you just don't see that, hey, what did I do wrong? So I think Biden has always been kind of predatory. He's always been, and look at the way he has treated even African-Americans when he was on uh, the phone call with, with a Zoom meeting with them and that was released. How insulting he was to them. How like, how dare you? Hey man, if you don't vote for me, or even earlier when he said, yeah. hey man, if you don't vote for me, you're not black. Right. And the I black arranged. people were sitting there going, wait a minute, we, we want to have some insurances before, I mean, your vote, we don't belong to you. You know, we're not on your plantation. I mean, we want something for our vote. And all Biden could do was insult them. So that's kind of the guy Biden is. I mean, he's the extent that he has this nice persona way better than Hillary's was just the extent that he was a skillful retail politician. You know, but I mean, so uh, unless we deal with you know, the Tara Reid story. And of course, remember um, that, who was it, the Time's Up people, you know, that the, the, they were, she went to them saying that, hey, you know, I have a problem with this powerful guy. I don't think he should be president. And they made some bull crap excuse about, oh, well, uh, he's running for like the presidency. We don't touch that. And, and what happens to these people? Yeah. What happened to and, these people with Andrew Cuomo? Oh, yeah, I know. I think the, the whole top echelon of uh, Time's Up had to resign, you know, because, because they were advising, they were reading his yeah, speeches and memos. They were, they were, were basically, damage control. they were being like his lawyers, like, OK, we've dealt a lot with this kind of stuff. Now we're on the other side to, you know, right. showing you how to beat the rap. Uh, right. One of the Me Too people was a spokesperson for the Biden campaign, you know, so they were compromised, you know, and. So it's like, and, and I get it, you know, I, I of course, I believed, uh, I believed in Anita, Anita Hill right off the bat. Uh, she was believable. And I had the same kind of thing happen to me. Um, what, but when it came time to, you know, dealing with Paula Jones and then later on, who is it? Kathleen Willis, Willie. Um, you know, I had to stop myself because I did not believe Paula Jones, but I had to stop myself and say, OK, am I not believing her because this is a Democratic president right now and I don't want this to be happening? But again, I mean, you have to be consistent. And what her friends, what she was telling her friends at the time was something very different that she ended up telling the Federalist Society later on in the story that she pulled. And the same thing with Kathleen Willey. However, there was Renita Broderick, and I have to admit, even at the time, that was a little problematic because she was believable. Now, do I think that Clinton really wanted to rape somebody? No, what I think it might have been just he was very forward with her and she was very shy. And everybody thinks they know how they're going to react in that situation. Well, I'll just punch him. No, you won't. I mean, especially if he's somebody you admire and you're a shy person, it, it's really hard, you know, and so she was kind of overwhelmed. But the Bill Clinton's people were very, very smart to handle her with kids' gloves. That was something that Hillary's people did not did do. Not. And uh, I think that kind of hurt her a little bit. But and, and I'm saying that you really, these are hard because you have to be consistent. And yeah, part of, I think, part of dealing with Tara Reid might be for some of these feminists to realize, oh, wait a minute, this is a patriarchal, very exploitative system. And Democrats and Republican politicians are behaving the same way. As a matter of fact, they're treating all of us pretty much the same way, that mm -hmm. we're disposable. They are making decisions for their corporate donors. And, you know, they have to, well, you know, like Trump has to appease the, you know, evangelical crazies and, and the Democrats have to like, 
put up a veneer of diversity and, you know, but it, it, basically the bottom line is if they're servicing the same people for the same ends, you're going to expect the same results. And, you know, dealing with something like the Tara Reid story, some people who don't want to be forced into that realization are going to, you know, are going to have to realize that, you know, this is, uh, this is a system, these, and you know my feeling of it, it's, Yes, they play very different roles, Democrats and Republicans, but they're the good cop, bad cop of the same political scam. And, you know, we can get out of the, up from under this with direct action like strikes. We could get out from this if, if states started doing ranked choice voting, which would, you know, sort of um, obviate the major fake concern of the Democratic Party, like, oh, well, we can't have like, you know, Green Party run because that'll just get a Republican. And if you had ranked choice voting, you would have, you wouldn't have to worry about that at all. But then you'd run the risk that people once in a while might actually have a party they want to vote for with no fear of it being a spoiler and you might get a surprise. So, you know, that's why Gavin Newsom uh, vetoed ranked choice voting. In, in California, but you know, so it's all about power. And uh, what are you yeah, looking Reed at? got some Russian money to do the media thing. Oh, you mean that she appeared on like, you know, Russian Today because she was shut out from all other major media and getting smeared nonstop by Democrats? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter. It's like, what is the evidence do you apply the same standards that you applied in the Anita Hill, you know, case or in the Paula Jones case, you know, um, and who is, and, and in, in Tara Reid, I mean, she's not only believable, but I mean, the, all the corroborating evidence is very strongly in her favor. And, you know, it's hard. It, it is, it is extremely hard to go up against somebody with power who you're, uh, you know, that you're outing and a whole bunch of people think, well, lesser of two evils. I mean, you know, who do you want, Trump? Well, you know, why were you willing to risk Trump to cheat Bernie Sanders out of a nomination? That's the question nobody wants to ask either. So, you know. Well, what are you looking at in Illinois tomorrow? Are there any important elections? Uh, no, I don't. There's there's no local ones. Um, what we're looking at, we're waiting for the finalization of the maps. They just voted on the maps. They have to be approved. Um, this is what's been happening. Uh, two things have happened. One is that, yeah, it looks like they've carved away uh, Marie Newman's district. So she's in a more Republican district. Dan hmm. Lipinski, the people, the person she defeated, of course, said a couple of weeks ago he'd run. However, she looked at the map and realized that most of her current district will be in the sixth Illinois district. So she has announced that she's going to run against Sean Caston, who is one of the new Dems. Who well, I don't know why Howie Klein doesn't go after new Dems either. They're just like the blue Dems. The other thing is um, the Junaid uh, Ahmad, who I will have on this show soon, uh, is running against in the what might or may not be the eighth, but uh, he, they, the Illinois Democratic Party has just announced that they're not even going to sell the, um, the voter databases to uh, challengers to incumbents. In other words, here's the voter database that everybody who has contributed to the Democratic Party helped form and challengers to incumbents won't even be able to buy it. So they're already this, the, the state party is putting uh, challengers at a disadvantage there. So right. that's the news, Not, none, nothing, nothing surprising. Um, I still don't know that that line goes between the street out here and the street a mile north of it. So I don't know if I'm going to be in the 14th, if I'm going to be in Lauren Underwood's district, if I'm still gonna be in Bill Foster's district, we don't know. We won't know for sure. We'll kind of know by next week, uh, but we won't know for sure because the judge has to has to okay it, and it gives them ten. Then there's ten more days for people to have formal disputes with it. So, 
it gets it gets approved the eighth, and I think there's a ten day period, you know, where people can challenge it, and it doesn't look like anybody's going to launch a serious challenge. So, when do That's you run? For real, when when do you run for re-election? <laughs> Three years from now, I guess, if there's still a park district, and still we still have a planet. Um, yeah. But I might, st- you know, if I, I mean, people have asked me to run. I can't run as a Democrat. I mean, this is like no way. The Demo- local Democratic Party, I've just pissed off too much. However, it's not all the question that I run as an independent in one of these races. Well, you know, you'll have our support. Just have to see what my financial situation is, you know, about a year or so from now. But um you will have our undying support. <laughs> yeah. With a few and somehow <laughs> Lane is going to vote in this election. Somehow Lane. Yeah, well, well, anything can get worked out. He should just come to Chicago for a couple weekends. <laughs> 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 Professor we got that out-of-the-box political thinking going on over there. <laughs> oh, but we're on a manual, really. Like, this is what really kills me. I'm sorry. Hi, is he going to be the ambassador uh, to Japan? Yeah, they're going to, they, but despite, you know, the, the squad's performative objections, they're going, they're probably going to go along with this. And it's like, as if nobody has anything else to do this week than like uh, hear Rahm Emanuel's uh, hearings for, for ambassadorship to begin. I mean, how really? Bad is it, how bad is it if uh, McCall, speaking of Rahm Emanuel, how bad will it be if McAuliffe loses? Am I wrong? for not really caring. I guess I'm wrong for not caring if McAuliffe. Hey, I, I well, I'm get... here to give you a little little silver lining. I think because the Democratic donors are so frustrated and they don't like this tires race, if they if McAuliffe loses, they said they're going to take their money elsewhere next year. I say but where? Oh, they're just going to give their money to other PACs and other people. You know, they, they're not really beholden to the Democratic Party itself. They're just beholden to individuals who will do their bidding. So, you know, uh, they'll just go to Mansion or Cinema maybe and say, hey, you know, you can go join part, skip parties and we'll support you. We'll support you, whatever. And, but, uh, and I'm saying that if, if McAuliffe loses and the donors take their money elsewhere, at least for a few months, that might work out for people like Junaid Ahmad because they won't be able to pour money. They won't be pouring millions of dollars to prop up, you know, conservative reactionary uh, incumbents right. or somebody like Chantel or, or just outright corrupt people like Chantel Brown you know, against Nina Turner. Professor, Good, take your Marianne, money elsewhere. Professor Marianne Cummings is a physics professor. She is a parks commissioner for Aurora, Illinois. And what is your Twitter handle? Razor Girl, right? Razor Girl. Very good. I'll see you Thursday, I hope. Mm-hmm. Good. Thank you. Let us go to Northern California. Did you get the invite or was it late? I'm just concerned. Uh, no, I checked in a little earlier and I noticed you were running behind the stated schedule. So. Oh. I watched on YouTube while you spoke with uh, Marianne Cummings. I see. And uh, kind of overcooked my spag bowl, but uh, otherwise, (laughs) things are fine here at at Shea Collins. Peter B. Collins joins us. He is, he's just been inducted into the Bay Area Radio Hall of Fame. Go to Peter B. Collins for his treasure trove of podcasts, radio shows, and interviews. You want to talk about Hunter Biden, so do I. I was reading the first chapter of Ben Schreckinger's book about the Biden family. He can't seem to get any traction. We should have him on the show, shouldn't we? You definitely should, and I'd be happy to uh, yeah. you know, co-host that with you. Yeah. I, yeah. I, as I often do, David, I did a little survey using the Google machine to see what kind of coverage Ben Schreckinger or Schreckinger has Zero. got Zero. for his book, The Bidens. And let's start with MSNBC, because <laughs> they're reliable. Uh, th- there is no record of any contact with him since uh, the book was even announced. Uh, and The Washington Post, zero coverage. The New York Times has relegated the book to brief references in two opinion columns one by Ross Douthat, 
and the other by Brett Stevens. Two conservatives. But, right. But they, they were very brief. And for example, uh, Stevens was mostly focusing on the latest uh, Hunter Biden scam, which is to create uh, Jackson Pollock ripoff type paintings and sell them anonym uh, to anonymous buyers for up to half a million dollars. Uh, so the, the central elements of the uh, book called The Bidens uh, are being uh, uh, basically blacked out by the corporate media. And yep. this, this is consistent with what I think is the most important unstated takeaway from uh, the Schreckinger book. And that is that the corporate media colluded with Facebook and Twitter to bury the October surprise that was sprung last year. And it clearly was a campaign stunt. Uh, Rudy Giuliani was out there saying, what about Hunter's laptops? And uh, it was treated as number one, a Russian intervention again, and dismissed uh, for that reason. And other than Glenn Greenwald and a few others in the uh, non-corporate media, uh, the story was just pissed on and left as some tabloid fantasy of the New York Post. Or the fever, from the fevered mind of Rudy Giuliani. Correct. And also th there was, I think, appropriate concern initially that this is a, a campaign surprise. They went digging in the dirt mines and found this. And, and so they used some of the same techniques that were used to divert attention in 2016 from Hillary's emails. And not just that they existed on a private server and all that stuff, but the actual content, the pay to play parts of the correspondence that was conducted in Hillary's private account. So uh, this, uh, and, and I'm happy to go into some of the salacious details, some of it is uh, a little bit amusing and some of it is sad. Uh, but I, I want to emphasize that this is what feeds Trump and Trumpers. When they talk about fake news, when they dismiss everything that is published by the New York, New York Times and the Washington Post, there is a, a shred of evidence to support their uh, extremism in that regard. Secondly, uh, Trump did try to make the linkage between Hunter's laptop and his effort, which was unsuccessful, to gin up business with interests in China. And the critical part of that is that Joe Biden lied, because what Schreckinger's book shows is that, that Joe Biden had at least some awareness of what Hunter was doing and what his brother Jim was up to. And they work- uh, The uncle, uh, Jimmy Biden, the brother of Joe Biden. Correct, and Hunter's uncle, that's right. And uh, they, they were doing what Jared, <laughs> uh, Jared, uh, what, uh, what, help me, what's his name? Kushner, <laughs> Kushner. Jared and Ivanka. Ivanka. I, I've tried to rinse him out of my, uh, uh, my hard drive. Anyway, um, you know, it, it, there's a difference in uh, the specifics, but in the major thrust, uh, the Biden family tried to cash in on Joe the way the Trump family and its hangers on tried to cash in on Donald. And this is a, a tragedy of modern American politics. But for me, the biggest issue is the attempt to cover for Hunter. Uh, and this will surprise some people, but he actually lost control of four laptops. Really? Yes. <laughs> Not just, they're, they're actually- He's a graduate of Yale Law School, I believe. Right, <laughs> Hunter Biden went to Yale Law School. It's not like he's some crack addict from the streets. Hunter Biden is a well-educated- Crack addict. Crack addict. <laughs> well, you should have gone to jail along with all the, as long as you're locking up crack addicts. Uh, well, that's, 
That is the deep irony of Joe Biden's use of Len Bias to ram through the disparate sentencing laws related to crack cocaine when he was head of the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, but do you mind if I do you mind if I just set the the table for this in terms of what what we understand? Because you've obviously read the book, you know more. No, about I, I have it. not read the whole book. I've read treatments of it, so I, okay. there may, may be things in there that I've yet to discover. The the as I understand it, the the nasty allegations about Hunter Biden are this was a troubled kid who was addicted to crack cocaine. The Trump administration got their hands on what might or might not have been Hunter Biden's laptop. And on it, they found some emails explaining, and according to the Democrats, these were fabricated. They were explaining how Hunter was negotiating with uh, Chinese and Ukrainian businessmen to make sure that Joe Biden got a cut. They had like some kind of, you know, Mr. J Mr. B or somebody that Hunter was negotiating on behalf of former Vice President Joe Biden and that Hunter was arranging payments to Joe Biden. We were told this isn't a real story. It's been fabricated by Giuliani. What 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 did we find? Well, just just a quick correction. Uh, Ukraine and Burisma are in the rearview mirror here. Uh, in the excerpts that I've read, uh, Schreckinger doesn't touch on uh, Ukraine and Burisma. Uh, again, that's why I need to read the rest of the book, but I, right. I just want to be clear that I haven't seen that. It was a Romanian businessman who, in 2015, hired Hunter to help fend off uh, corruption charges, and uh, he engaged the former FBI director, Louis Free, and then uh, when Hunter was uh, unsuccessful, Free brought on, you'll never guess this, Rudy Giuliani to work for the same oligarch as they pressured Romanian authorities to ease up on the man. So this shows that, you know, the kind of corruption in modern American politics is not limited uh, in time or scope, <laughs> and it's certainly not limited to one party. And so- uh, oh, Rudy knew what he was talking about. Uh, he had an ax to grind. Oh, well, in terms of the laptop. Yes, well, he, yes, yes, he did, because and, and the the story that uh, Matt Taibbi wrote up based on uh, the book and an interview with Shrekin Schreckinger uh, goes into uh, quite a bit of detail. But the first laptop was actually lost in Massachusetts. And this followed an incident where Hunter, who was dating uh, or uh, living with the widow of St. Bo Biden, uh, she uh, tossed a handgun of his out of his pickup truck into a trash bin uh, and Hunter sent her back to, to get the gun. And uh, this ended up involving the Delaware State Police. It, it was at a, a high-end supermarket near Wilmington. Uh, the FBI uh, showed up, the Secret Service, of course, which, you know, provides security for members of the Biden family. This is after he had left the vice presidency, but the security goes on. And even the uh, somebody from uh, the ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, entered the picture. So um, the, the girlfriend was sent back to pick up the gun that she had intemperately tossed into the garbage. And uh, it wasn't there because a, a guy who dove for uh, empty cans to pick up the deposit found the gun that he's described as an old man. But fortunately, uh, within a week, he had turned it in to local authorities and so this little episode went away. Um, 
Apparently it caused a breakup with uh, the former Mrs. Bo Biden. And uh, then Hunter took himself to Newburyport, Massachusetts to try to clean up. And he, was, he put himself in the care of the Fox News personality, Keith Ablo, who is recognizable by his clean shaven head I have here and once accused Joe Biden of being drunk during a VP debate with Paul Ryan. So uh, I don't know that Mr. Ablo has uh, rehab uh, skills, but apparently uh, he- I go, If you have a problem with crack cocaine, you don't go to a doctor with the word blow in his last name. I mean, that's, <laughs> right, that's the first. He's a psychiatrist, Keith Ablo, isn't he? I don't know I don't anything know. about it. He's a psychiatrist. It. Yeah. Go ahead. So then Hunter's doing yoga. He's getting uh, IV vitamin infusions and tries to clean himself up. But he falls off the wagon and uh, winds up uh, in a cheesy motel on I-95 doing crack with a, um, uh, a supplier who uh, is not described in great detail, um, but she has a, uh, a very unusual nickname. I'm, I'm trying to find it here in the story. Uh, at, at any rate. Uh, and he yeah, made he's... porn for Pornhub. He, he was busy. Did, did the Secret Service hold the camera? <laughs> Where is the Secret uh, Service in all this? Are they supposed to turn a blind eye to crimes that are being committed? Well, I don't know if they had a, uh, a person assigned to him or if he just kind of phoned in when he needed a little uh, extra help. Um, at, at any rate, um, he then took up with his crack dealer uh, in this cheesy motel and went on a binge and kind of went out of control. And that's when he left a laptop behind in Massachusetts. Uh, it was later, uh, he went to Wilmington and he actually took three laptops into that shop that, uh, where at least one of them was turned over to uh, forces aligned with Giuliani and wound up uh, as the subject of uh, stories in the New York Post. So, uh, you know, these are, are episodes that you can uh, feel sorry for the guy. Uh, I believe that addiction is an illness and uh, I prefer not to criminalize it. Uh, but Hunter Biden is a time bomb for his father. And he's what they, they used to call compromat. Yes, yes. And, you know, we've completely just dismissed the whole Ukraine story. But at minimum, uh, there was a clear conflict of interest that Daddy Biden was running the effort to clean up corruption in Ukraine while Hunter was clocking, you know, millions of dollars for a no-show job at Burisma. So there is this long running pattern. And the same is true with brother Jim, Joe's brother Jim. So they have been, uh, you know, keeping their hands out to all kinds of unsavory characters for years, saying, give me money and I might be able to get you to Joe Biden. Uh, it's mostly a shakedown because uh, we don't have solid evidence that Joe ever intervened uh, for clients of Hunter or his brother, Jim. But the critical part is in emails that were on one of the laptops left in Wilmington is a discussion of how to split the shares for this newly formed company that was purchased from uh, a guy who had married into the Moon family. So he's a South Korean who had married one of Moon's daughters, and there are a lot of those daughters, all right? Uh, at any rate, um, he had some of his own corruption problems. In a previous entity, Hunter had a partner who was the nephew of Whitey Bulger, uh, the Massachusetts uh, hitman, uh, who was also on the payroll of the FBI while he was conducting mob hits. Um, 
But the so, brother was legitimate, right? The brother was like president of Amherst or something. I don't, I don't know that. I think, go ahead. I don't know that his brother, the, you're talking Joe Biden's brother or Whitey Bulger? No, no, I'm Bulger. talking about Whitey Bulger. Oh. I think he had a brother who was a, an upstanding member of the community in Massachusetts. I think he was like president of a university. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, well, I, I don't know that, but it, it certainly could be true. So the, the model for the shakedown that Hunter and uh, uh, Jim Biden were operating, and apparently there's a a second brother, Frank Biden, who was partially involved. Um, but, uh, you know, they, there's a, a claim from, uh, of a quote from Jim Biden saying that there are 747s loaded with cash uh, of people who want to buy our influence peddling uh, in the name of the family. So it was modeled on what Paul Manafort had been doing with his partner, Roger Stone. And uh, there were two other guys in, in that firm. Uh, it's, it's not too different from what Jack Abramoff was doing because uh, they tried to fleece the Oglala Sioux tribe. And one of the partners was accused and I think acquitted by an Obama appointed judge of uh, scamming 60 million from the Sioux tribe. Uh, so this is a, a very sordid uh, set of anecdotes. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that at some point, the protection is going to end and Hunter Biden will be completely exposed. Even if this book doesn't do it, there's plenty of damaging ammo for Donald Trump to hurl uh, at, at Biden, whether or not O'Biden tries to run again. Did I call him O'Biden? I think I did. <laughs> I think Sarah Palin used to call him that. <laughs> uh, so uh, I am looking forward to reading this whole book. But the again, the central takeaway for me is that the media with help from Facebook and Twitter, which blocked uh, people who posted uh, New York Post stories or campaign posts coming from the Trump team uh, related to Hunter Biden and his laptop. And this will only fuel the sense of victimization. Now, Trump has tried to say that, you know, the election itself was stolen, but he does have reasonable claims, claims that the campaign itself was interfered with by America's corporate media, which then accepted without challenge claims that this was more Russian interference. Yeah. Uh, it's to me, it's two separate issues. Uh, Hunter Biden is a in. I would say in different times, this would be, it would be open season on Hunter Biden. But would you say that Trump was such a threat? Was he such a threat to our country that they had to circle the wagons and make sure he didn't get reelected? Is there, is it somewhat forgivable that the corporate media, I'm asking, well, I think that's a common thought among people uh, who may not be the biggest fans of Joe Biden, but who uh, really fear the impact of a second term for Trump, who would then be uh, unchecked. Uh, he would be a lame duck who uh, would abuse the office and its discretion even more than he did in his first term. So, you know, that's the existential threat argument. But I, I can't rationalize that, David. I believe that if we ever hope to return from the Trump nightmare and the kind of new dark ages that we're living through, that it's going to have to be based on facts. And it's going to have to be based on unbiased exposure of corruption. And, you know, to me, this is indication of how the Democrats uh, sucked it up and ran a deeply defective candidate. 
And I want to echo what uh, uh, Professor Cummings said in the previous segment about Tara Reid. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> her whole story, her personal story is riddled with uh, questionable uh, episodes. But her fundamental assertion that uh, Joe violated her, uh, I found quite credible. And it deserved to be fully investigated. And she got a 60 minutes appearance and Joe denied it. And it just went away. But she did get a 60 minutes appearance. Yeah. Let me let me let me push back just for the sake of doing a show. The uh, WikiLeaks dump that happened, what, a month before November of 2016? Right. We learned a lot about Debbie Wasserman Schultz. We learned a lot about, as you said, the pay for play and the how the Democrats were in the tank for Hillary, that they kind of manipulated things so Bernie would lose. Whether or not that's true, uh, the, the, that information was a hack, right? Yes, it was a, uh, a hack of John Podesta's cell phone. Right. So is he entitled? I'm just asking, mm -hmm. is he entitled to privacy? Well, uh, in a similar is vein. Hunter Biden, yeah. And is Hunter Biden entitled to privacy? Because everything that's been uncovered in the, uh, the on the laptops would not hold up in a court of law illegal search and seizure, you, right? You can't enter any of that into a court. Well, there is a, a strong argument to be made there, David. Um, and, you know, I can't, I can't say that the hack of John Podesta's cell phone uh, is something that we should have ignored the revelations of because of where it came from. And but we know, would we, in court of law, we'd have to. Well, we don't have much privacy left. <clears throat> and so much is now out in the open. Um, and, you know, Huma Abedin has a, a, her, her memoir out. Uh, she, of course, was married to Anthony Weiner. And his laptop led to James Comey reopening the investigation into Clinton emails. Uh, and you know, she said she used to feel that she was the one responsible for Hillary losing, but she now blames it on James Comey. Well, uh, you know, how far do we go to protect the interests of But there people? was a chain of custody to that laptop. She was sharing, They, I believe Comey found out that she had been sharing emails on Wiener's laptop, and I believe it was the FBI that got its hands on Anthony Wiener's laptop. That's correct. So but they the the violation there was that Huma Abedin forwarded emails to Anthony's laptop so he could print things out for Hillary, who didn't like to read off a screen, right. and Huma violated protocols. Now, does it rise to the level of the Fourth Amendment? Um, I, I'd like to hear that adjudicated, but at this point, we kind of have open season on things that get revealed, whether they come from uh, whistleblowers like the new Facebook so-called whistleblower, uh, Ed Snowden, uh, Julian Assange. Uh, and, right. you know, unfortunately, uh, we don't have any expectation of privacy anymore, and we have to live with the knowledge that anything that we write or put in an email or uh, communicate can be intercepted and used against us, um, including by the NSA. Uh, so it's, it's very hard to single out uh, a privacy right when Hunter, laptop, Hunter Biden left his laptops with this shop in Wilmington and didn't come back to get them didn't pay for the service, and therefore, uh, under state law, they fell into the possession, the actual ownership 
of the man who ran that shop. So his carelessness in covering his own uh, uh, wrongful and potentially criminal behavior um, is, is hard to wrap a privacy blanket around. Right. What is, can you launch an investigation into Hunter Biden if the, the, all the warrants are the, the fruit of an illegal search or an illegal leak? All well, but, but what I just explained about the laptop yeah. is I don't believe that was illegal. It was careless um, and negligent on his part to protect his own privacy. Okay. And he certainly knew that his daddy was running for president. And he was under greater scrutiny. He'd just been through the whole uh, attempt to impeach Trump over Ukraine, where he was a central character. And the idea that he didn't learn anything from that uh, in terms of fundamental self-protection, uh, it, it's very hard to uh, raise a, a Fourth Amendment argument to protect that. It's almost as though the Democrats and the Republicans go out of their way to nominate corrupt presidents and candidates so that we get tied up in the mac the legal machinations of are they guilty or are they not guilty and it's all contributing to one large distraction from what needs to be done because i'm thinking we got climate change to worry about people are being evicted homelessness safety net and this is going to consume all the oxygen moving forward but, but what about let's go brandon and let's go Brandon. What, what, now, what is the background? Is that from originally from football, college football? No, no, it's it's uh, I can't summon his last name because I don't follow NASCAR. But this originated at a NASCAR race where a young phenom named Brandon uh, won. He was being interviewed by a female TV reporter and the crowd was chanting, fuck Joe Biden, fuck Joe Biden. And the TV reporter uh uh, tried to explain to her viewers that they were actually saying, let's go, Brandon. <laughs> and so this has now become this code phrase that amuses the own the libs crowd. Uh, and they, of course, stand for nothing else. Uh, but they have uh, proliferated the usage of this. It's on uh, Trump supporters face masks in Congress. Uh, one of his loyalists from Florida. Uh, used it to close out a floor speech last week, and a Southwest Airlines pilot uh, used it after he briefed the passengers uh, to close his comments, uh, and it was not a mistake. You know, it wasn't, uh, whoops, I didn't know my mic was on. Uh, so I find it amusing, but the outrage from the left uh, over the use of this is only giving it more currency right. and serving to provide the distraction from what were those important issues you just mentioned? Uh, climate change. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Come on. <laughs> we should start saying, let's go, Brandon. The problem is, <laughs> I really mean it. <laughs> the problem is, I really, I have, I mean, I wish he deserved the antipathy, the hatred from the right. I mean, they could, if, if it were really about ideology, these people on the right should love Joe Biden. He's no threat to them, but as He's you ruining said, this country if Joe Manchin will just get out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> how do we get even with Joe Manchin legally? What, how do you, you lock up his daughter? I mean, or am I a fool to think it's Manchin's fault? I'm a fool to think Manchin is the one who's blocking all this stuff, right? Oh, I don't think so. I mean, he's the face of it, and he's the one uh, with the spear. Uh, and, you know, just today he came up with a whole new excuse, and the leader of the Progressive Caucus, Pramila Jayapal, has caved. They are delinking the so-called bipartisan infrastructure bill from the so-called Build Back Better 
uh, reconciliation package that's been whittled down to 1.75 trillion. And uh, you correctly predicted here a few weeks back that nevertheless, they're calling it transformational and uh, uh, they can't even get the damn thing passed even after they jettison the coal plant uh, uh, penalties, the uh, community college education package, the entire um, family leave piece. Uh, and so it, it just shows that <clears throat> the Democrats are beholden to the same corporate interests. And Don't you know, you know, the more I think about it, I can hear Joe Biden's conversation with Manchin. You, you know, I, I hear you, buddy. I hear you. I, I, they're killing me. These Pramila Jayapal and the progressives. I, I hear you. You, you got to do what you got to do. That they're, they're killing me here. They're, they're they're radical and and they don't care about inflation. They think this this money's coming. I don't know where they think this. You do what you have to do, Joe. I hear you, Joe Manchin. Right. You do. I could easily hear Joe Biden getting on the phone. Well, Tell lots of Joe people Manchin. have been digging up a quote from the uh, campaign in 2020 where Biden was speaking to Wall Street donors and he said nothing will fundamentally change. And that is proving out more than, uh, you know, most of the promises he made on the campaign trail. But, but I, I do uh, give Manchin um, a, a, a deeper uh, form of mendacity. Um, and, you know, he's not operating in the interests of his own electorate in West Virginia. He's not reading the polls that show how popular many of these issues are. Uh, we now have an Ipsos poll that's claiming that most Americans don't know what's in the package. Uh, I would submit they don't know what's in it anymore uh, because so much has been cut. Mm -hmm. But but people understood the broad outlines and uh, they overwhelmingly supported it. Uh, the Medicare package, uh, you know, the Medicare prescription drug negotiation issue, uh, those get 70 to 80 percent support in the polls. There's no question in my mind. Biden gets on the phone with Manchin and says, you do what you have to do. You don't know what I'm up against here. Joe, Joe Manchin, you have no idea what I got to listen to. There's no way Joe Manchin is doing this all by himself. He's getting he's getting signals from Biden. Keep it up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Peter B. Collins is a Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer. Go to peterbcollins.com for a treasure trove of podcasts, radio shows, and interviews with newsmakers dating back to... 2009. Thank you, sir. Good to see you, David. It's good to see you. Keep on. You too. My Thank pleasure. you. Let us now go to Denton, Texas where professor are you there professor mike steinell hello professor mike steinell here you are how are you i'm okay david i'm a little a little frazzled i'm glad you went 30 minutes behind <laughs> are we 30 minutes behind i think so that's okay I sent a new song, actually. How about that? Oh, how about that? Let me, I have to find it. I just sent it. <laughs> I finished why, it. Now, why are you frazzled? Uh, I, I, uh, I don't know. It's just a lot of stuff going on. Um, <clears throat> I did, I'm, I'm working, I'm getting, they finally sent the edit back for my book, Saving Charlie Parker, the publishers. So I've been sitting at the computer and doing the, you know, it's kind of scary because this is the last chance to catch anything. Gosh, I make a lot of mistakes. I'm a bad proofreader. My wife's pretty good. She, she grew up in a newspaper family, so she, 
used to do that a lot. But um, now, what do you mean she grew up in a newspaper family? Her dad was a reporter, an editor. Her family owned uh, the Marion County record for a hundred years, which was the uh, the local uh, Marion County record. It was it's the the county paper that all the all the uh, legal stuff had to be in and, and news and her dad did everything. Where is this in Ohio? No, Marion, Kansas. This is up there where the, where the oh. lake house is. Wow. And, uh, you know, her, 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 her great grandfather was a governor and wow. he, a, he was a, uh, he kind of was in the, um, he was a Republican and they ran him against the populist Democrat. That was a big thing at the turn of the century, populism, uh, farmers. But uh, he was one of the few Democrat, a few Republicans who kind of made it through there. And uh, but he was real progressive, man. He he fought to keep Standard Oil out of Kansas. They wanted to come in and take all the the uh, all the oil rights from property owners. You know, they were going to make it a big. Was a, it was a publisher as well. Yeah, they published the paper. And he was actually on the, uh, we talked about this once, he was on the uh, speaking circuit, the uh, Chautauqua circuit. Right. And went around and traveled by train. He, and then he would, he would send dispatches home. His brother, he had brothers who were involved with the paper too. It was kind of the family business. And then his son, his son um, became a uh, Kansas Supreme Court justice. His son was, uh, how was it? His son was a uh, representative, House of Representatives. He, he did two terms in the House of Representatives, then came home and was a, uh, you know, uh, Supreme Court justice. And then uh, his son, Beverly's dad, ran the paper for, you know, his whole life pretty much. Learned and what how was to the name of the paper? The Marion County Record. The Marion, and, and I would assume it's no longer around? No, Nadine, my mother-in-law, sold it in uh, 1997 to uh, the guy who would, who, Nadine was a widower in 1967 and ran the paper as the publisher. She became the publisher uh, and owner. Wow. For 30 years after her husband passed away. And then, uh, she's a very smart woman. Um, and... Then she passed it on to the guy who was, he had been the editor, Bill, um, oh gosh, I'm going to forget his name. I'm sorry. It'll come to me in a second. <laughs> They're wow. good friends too. But um, yeah, so um, anyway. Is still around? Because it's hard. Oh yeah, we, we still get it in the mail. It's a, it's a weekly. It's was a it weekly always paper. a weekly or was it once a daily? I don't know. That's a good question. It might have been twice a week. I think it was usually always a weekly, you know. And her dad would he 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 was at every sporting event, taking pictures. He did the pictures. He did the he wrote the stories. He did a um, great. Uh, he was a good uh, editor. You know, uh, notes from the editor. He did a lot of commentary. And uh, Bill Meyer became the uh, became the editor after. Wharton passed away, and he, he was a firebrand. He, he really got into it in local politics. And, uh, but, uh, and then his son now is, uh, is an owner of the paper and also the editor. So it kind of wow. stays in the family. The Myers are good wow. folks anyway. So wow. anyway, what, what, so I, oh, I, th I thought I had shingles. And it turned out to be, what's I the joke? Know. You thought you had shingles, but it was aluminum <laughs> siding, wasn't it? <laughs> That's pretty good. Did you just That's think of that? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's an old joke. Oh, really? I, you thought you had shingles. So I, I got freaked out because I started to get this little, I thought I had a bite. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden, another one appeared next to it. And then another one appeared. So I got like three little things, and I'm thinking, hey, this is shingles, dang it. I, took, I got the shot. Have you, did you get the shot? I've been told to get the shot. The you shingles need to get shot. the shot. I, 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 the shingle shot. Get a double shot. Double shingle shot. That's hard to say. Shingle <laughs> double shingle shot of my baby's love. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got, I, I got my flu shot. Good, good. I've got that. I got my booster too. Did you get your booster? I haven't got my booster yet, but I'm going to get one. Yeah, it's good to get the booster. 
I had no problems. A lot of my friends said, oh, it laid me out, blah, blah, blah. I don't, I don't know. I didn't notice anything. I'm just pretty much tired most of the time anyway. But I did yard work today, and then I went to the emergency care, and then I came home and wrote, wrote a new song, or I kind of revised well, what, what the song. What did they say at, at the, what did the doctor say? Well, he kind of pissed me off. He goes, that's not shingles. I was so wanting, shoot me up, give me this cure. Because if you catch it quickly, it's not a big deal. Right. He said, that's a, that's a bite. We've been, you know, did you get bit? No, I didn't get bit. You know, uh, well, it's uh, something else. <laughs> and he was rude to you. He was dismissive. Was he young? Yeah. No, he was old. He was old. He was older. But, uh, you know, urgent care. You know, I've been there a couple of times and they're, they're pretty good. You know, if you got to get in to see somebody and my friend, I called my friend who had had the shingles and he said, go to the doctor right away. Cause he had it for like 46 days all over his, you know, he was a drummer and I don't know how he, he kept playing during that too, but, uh, it's painful. Well, that would make me, fra that would make me frazzled. Yeah. I'm a little frazzled. And maybe if, if it is shingles, I'm a little, a little, uh, tired then i started working on this song i tell you, you know like i redid the theme song i tell you why first of all you play it a lot and there's a couple of flaws you know uh it's time right now for the david feldman show he's talking politics and comedy too he'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to i rhymed two with two. <laughs> oh. now one's t-o-o -O and one's t-o but yeah, it's like I really really weak like every that. time i hear it i go what well i, I changed I like it to, i revised that i changed it to he'll tell a dirty joke he knows quite a few oh okay <laughs> that's better yeah and then I just, I think, you know once you know you all right i'll do whatever you tell me well but... it's a separate version it's a different style and everything it's it's all you want to play a little bit then we can talk yeah about I, it? I and you know there's so many songs i should start the show with but uh I still like uh, the very first one I did for you, I think, was uh, Hot Time in the City. Yeah. I like that, I that, that groove. Uh, that, oh, yeah. that. Hey, I was thinking about some new songs. Like, um, Pig for Love? Any, any chance we're ever going to get Pig for Love finished? I don't know, David. I thought one like... Uh, Daddy Don't was good. Maybe I Killed Jeff Bezos. No, we can't. <laughs> How about, I dreamed I saw Jeff Bezos Alive as you or I I took a sharp pencil And I poked him in the eye That I like. Eh, we Possibilities? Can't even, eh, we can't. <laughs> We can't advocate what they do to us. It's just, it's, I, it's just not right. I heard the show. I didn't keep up with the show today because I was in urgent care, and I was still listening to Friday's show, which was quite good. I liked the climate guy you had on at the end. He was supposed well, to be here tonight. Oh, he was? Didn't make it? Didn't make it. Stood you up? Stood me up. Every show, somebody, we have a little pool. on. Somebody stiffs you? Uh, who's going to stiff me? Am I next? No. <laughs> I could do it if you want me to. No, 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 no. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, should we play the song, sir? Yeah, let's play the song, see what the heck's going on with it. Okay, so this is a new version of perfection, something that, <laughs> that, that already sounds perfect, but this should be I telling you. I sh I'm the one who should be saying, it's perfect. Need a new song. Let's, yeah, <laughs> give me. Perfect. Let's let me mess with it. Here we go. It's time right now for the David Feldman show. He's talking politics and comedy too. The Taylor dirty joke he knows quite a few. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a human man with an Emmy for right. Some days he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Yeah! 
here's all right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. That, it sounds like uh, Miles Davis and uh, Bob Dylan got together. Is that fair to say that? Yeah, that, that, I, I that's like good. It. I like it, too. I love it's, it. It's a little different. I kind of goosed up the vocal. It's time right now. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. You're Thank welcome. You. you can rotate that in there maybe Yeah. sometime. Your stuff sometime. is great. Yeah. Hey, I, may have, I might have people soon. I'm meeting with publicists. I'm taking oh, meetings. Oh, right. did, you, did you, when you were in L.A., take meetings? Oh, they would say... Take a take, meeting. Take a meeting? They would say, take a meeting. <laughs> was that code for get lost? <laughs> no, no, that was what they, they say. You, did you take that meeting? And uh, I, uh, instead of having a meeting. So are you taking meetings? Yeah, I got, I got I, I'm taking a meeting uh, later this week with, uh, I'm, I'm looking at two different agencies, one that might handle the book stuff and one that might handle the, uh, the CD you know, saving Charlie Parker. The the the, it's a, it's kind of there's a lot of things going on, and I'm not sure if one agency can do a good job. You know, it's 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 kind of like I'm trying to figure out. Well, so what are you going to do? And the, they describe it. It's it's sort of sounds like nailing Jello to the wall. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? <laughs> They're just well, like it's very nebulous as to take your money that's the first thing i'm gonna do and then i'm, yeah. gonna, I'm gonna take a check and i'm gonna deposit it that's the first thing and the first week or two you're gonna hear from me every day and then as the money you know as i feel i've worked for the money i'm gonna start blaming you for you being unhappy with me and then i'm gonna say out of nowhere i don't like the way you're talking to me I don't like your tone of voice. And you're going to say, what do you, what do you mean? Like that, what you just said. I, I just said, what do you mean? Uh, you know what? You're a monster. I can't work with you anymore. And that's how it works. After they run the money down. So you you have had publicists. That in, I've never in, had a I Look at me. Do I look like somebody who's had a publicist? Well, maybe you, maybe you should think about it. You know? Do you know? I've had agents. I've had managers. I've had lawyers. And I've had hitmen. And I find hitmen more noble. Yeah, I noble find a little, a little mobster action. Well, you know what you're getting, you know. You know, did you do the deal? You know, he either did or it's like I'm getting some fence work done. It either gets, you know, they tell me three posts and it costs this much and we'll put the concrete, boom, boom, boom. But um, the but publicist. The mafia. The mafia, the mafia is, is uh, the publicist. Better than a publicist. And an agent. You kind of know what you're getting, you know, yeah. I guess. If I had to do it all over again, I would uh, sign with the Mafia. <laughs> I think I would sign with the Gambino family, quite frankly. I think they were the ones who were getting top dollar for some people. Like, there was a time in the 70s where the Gambino family was getting some, I won't mention any names, but... Like unbelievable amounts of money, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to take people out. No, 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 to perform at the Sands. And these casinos were paying. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Enormous yeah. amount of money. Yeah. And then they would collect like you know thirty percent. You, you know, if you were a certain singer or comedian, you would pay a commission of thirty, forty percent. But you'd be paying like. 30 or 40 percent on like a quarter of a million dollars i know it was just insane that the kind of because they were moving it's all about laundering money professor steinel it's all about moving money dirty money into a clean bank account and having somebody front it for you yeah and you, I, you, a willing participant looking back maybe would, we should do an indie movie down here in denton and, and yeah. launder some money you got some money to launder that's hey, if you're listening, if you're a mobster, preferably the Gambino <laughs> family or, or somebody from the Medellin cartel. I'm sure they're the, listening. The, the Sonola gang, you need uh, 
to have some money cleansed, contact me at my website. I'll deposit the money into my checking account and I'll tell the government that I, all right. No, don't. No, 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 no. I'm worried. You know, now I'm worried. Uh, yeah, what if you get contact? What if you get some a check in the mail? Hey, did you ever do your tribute to Mort Saul? Did you do that today? Uh, no, I didn't. You know, um, did you, you remember a movie called Pork Chop Hill? Was he in that? He's in Pork Chop Hill. Hello, World War II. No, I think Pork Chop Hill is about Korea. Oh, well, there's, there's one movie where he, it's a, it's a war movie and he has like some landline phone and he picks it up and goes, hello, World War II. Pork Maybe Chop that's Hill, it. That, that, that that's might, not Clint Eastwood, is it? I don't know. But in, He's in uh, Clint Eastwood. He plays, he, you know, there's a scene in Pork Chop Hill. I remember my dad pointing it out and we're watching this movie. I love those war movies. Me Sands too. of Iwo Jima, you know, when I was growing up, man, those were the best. But yeah. Porkchop Hill, it's a pretty brutal movie, I think. Um, Korea, and <clears throat> there's a, like, they're sitting around a fire, and he's just kind of holding court, you know. And, and, and it's, I remember my dad said, you know, that's really realistic. He's that, that's Mort Saul. He's a comedy guy. But this is, this is the way funny guys are in real life with their buddies, you know. I remember it. my dad was always he had would say insightful things every now and then <laughs> like one of the things he said one time when I was playing the guitar downstairs he said he came down no one's going to give you a scholarship to play the guitar <laughs> <laughs> it was very insightful you right. know he was your music teacher right yeah he was he started me on the trumpet when I was six <clears throat> and uh, well, he gave me a trumpet when I was six, and then he showed me the scale. He said, you want to take some more lessons? I said, no, nah, I got it, Dad, no problem. <laughs> and? Yeah. and? But he was, at, when I started a band in fourth grade, I was, I had already played a lot of trumpet, you know, and I, and I took right to it. Didn't practice that hard until sixth grade, and then it kind of kicked in really yeah. hard. Any live performances coming up? I might play in Wichita on Friday. I got to go back up to Kansas and take care of some things. And I got to call Lisa Hiddle and see if she's playing at a club. It's a little too cold for the outdoor thing. I don't know. I'm still not crazy. Place, the Italian restaurant? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still a little, a little squeamish about playing, you know, uh, indoors, you know, and crowded. Boy, I watched those ball games on Sunday. I watched a lot of football yesterday. And man, those people are crammed in there and they're yelling. How can that not be a super spreader? I guess they're saying it's they're saying it's not. That's oh I mean, oh, mi oh were, but it's not. <laughs> you know that you big know that rally, rally supposed to, that there were supposed to be what uh, ten thousand cops who weren't gonna who were gonna walk off the job rather than be. Yeah. I saw a thing on Twitter. I'm not sure it's accurate, but the actual total of people who stayed home rather than going to work who took the non-paid leave was 34 could that be right 30, 30 34 34 cops in new york yeah that's it yeah you know so that, that whole that whole demonstration was more about um sticking it what's that solidarity the union just yeah yeah we off we, the steam. yeah i on, on friday i was talking about if you did a venn diagram <laughs> of all the different things that people you know uh hear gun enthusiasts that's that's one thing it's probably pretty big you know um listeners to msnbc that would be that would be right. a little bitty circle cnn people that are bigger you know right. fox you know uh anti-vaxxers you know they're in there somewhere they overlap all of that there might be an anti-vaxxer who listens to rachel maddow or you know but now um, but you're now you've got the the booster shot yeah you're feeling good, right? You're not as scared as you, right? No, no, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not worried about getting COVID, you know. But uh, I still don't know if if what the science is about um, whether you can you can have the be vaccinated and still carry the virus and not know it, and then you can give it to somebody else who isn't vaccinated. So the reason right. for the mask is not to protect me; it's to protect 
people I come in contact right. with. Nobody's wearing masks at in de, in Texas. It's you know, it's really kind of shocking. You know, you go to go to Home Depot and uh, nobody's wearing masks. When do you think this is over? I don't know, man. It's endemic, isn't it? Endemic. It's going to stick with us for a while. Yeah, and there's a word I think, endemicity, which I miss. Yeah. Where anyway, uh, smarter gotta, people than I don't even know. You know, I th people who study this they don't know. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank Is John you. Ross on today. John Ross was on that. Oh, feud I got to check that out. Two, yeah, the feud continues, man. He God, said, he's, "Man, he he's so nasty mean. things about you." Did he? Did he call me a little prick again? Yeah, he calls you a little prick. I don't yeah. mind the prick part. It's the little. <laughs> Come on, man. You know, we, my good friend Rosanna, we, we always have a joke about the use of the word little. You know, so it's so uh, uh, dismissive. You know, you say, oh, he's a good little drummer. Right. I like your little band here. Right. Dave, I like your little podcast. Little show. <laughs> I came up with a new slogan. We're a little what show for big minds. Oh, that's really good. A little show for big minds. We're a little show for big minds. How about a little show for littler minds? And a little show for littler minds. Big show for semi-regular sized minds. <laughs> and then there's the vente latte size mind. You know, if you give me some lyrics for love, pig for love, I might be able to do something. Pig for love. Yeah, I need a verse. I need at least. I, I'm not just asking for a song. I'm, I'm a first act of a musical. <laughs> I think we could sell this as a Broadway play, Pig for Love. Oink, oink. <laughs> I'm a pig for love, oink, oink. Somebody wrote, I don't know, where. somebody wrote to me, where's the song, where's Pig for Love? I will write you the lyrics for Pig for Love. Just one good verse to get me started, you know. I need to, I need some, some rhyming juice. I need rhyming juice. I'm a pig uh, for love. I can't get enough because I'm a pig for love. Okay. That's a good start. <laughs> uh, That's a great Ross, start, David. <laughs> I, I, I want to pork you because I'm a pig for love. I'm not going to write that. <laughs> oh, man. I love you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's good to see you, David. Good to see you. Oh, I didn't give you a proper introduction. Yeah, you didn't. Once again, oh, I didn't. I, I, I'm stiffed. No wonder I, people stiff you. <laughs> okay. Sir Mike Steinel. Go to MikeSteinel.com. That is the website, correct? Correct. And buy his books, Running the Changes. Is that out yet? It's coming out soon. Coming out soon. I... I, I Go tomorrow. How do, people, how do people listen to the audio book? They they can listen Lake to the House. Lake House Part One right now on YouTube. Um, I'm thinking I'm you know like <laughs> there's so many lake houses. I might just change the title to Three Lakeview Drive, which is the address of the house. Because if you then people put are going to show up. If you put it in there wrong, like if you put Lake House two words and part one o-n-e all i got to say is it's a gay romp david it's a gay right. romp <laughs> and this is kansas right it's young shirtless men yes no yeah 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 lakeview drive you don't so want i might change it what's that the clutter family you don't want people knowing <laughs> your address in kansas do you it's, it's not a real address it's not a, it's a made-up address all right all right man Thank Good you, Professor you. Mike Steinel. Take Go, care, man. Thank you. Go to YouTube and listen to The Lake House. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. And now let us go finally to Germany, where Henry Huckamaki is standing by. Hello, David. We've got a great interview coming up for you today on something that well, several topics that are of interest to you and several topics that are interest, uh, interesting to the listeners. I've got a journalist joining us today, Joshua Cho. Josh, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience since it's your first time on The David Feldman Show? 
Hey, what's up, guys? Um, my name is Joshua Cho, and I'm a freelance writer. Uh, I mainly tackle, tackle media criticism for fairness and accuracy in reporting. Um, I've actually written about many different subjects, but in the past few years, I've been writing about China more since that's just been in the news more recently. Um, so yeah, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, and I know that we have talked on the show, not you and I, but David, uh, as well as several guests on the show previously have talked about how important fair is in terms of watching the media and, and critiquing American media particularly and how they're portraying um, different topics in the United States as well as internationally. So Josh, let's get this conversation underway. We have a few things that we want to talk about and they're all really interesting topics. So why don't we start with, with your, your young, so a young career at this point, uh, you've already taken on some relatively big myths and myth misconceptions that have been portrayed in the media. Would you care to talk about some of the myths, myths and misconceptions that you've tried taking on and, and maybe discussing some of the ones that were fun to do, some of the ones that seemed kind of daunting? How, how have you viewed each of these myths that you've taken on? Well, uh, I've written a lot about many different subjects, but I guess to just to stick to recent topics, um, for me personally, I consider like the most daunting projects to be the most interesting, um, except that there's uh, not as much returns on how much effort I put in. <laughs> but um, um, I really enjoyed tackling the lab leak theory recently, just because um, I, I have like no science background at all. And like, um, I've just been following scientists and doing my best to do my own research before writing about a topic. So I contacted um, maybe at least six different scientists for my articles on the lab leak theory and complicated topics like gain of function research, which is, uh, in my opinion, heavily misunderstood by the general public. But um, I've been writing about that. But earlier throughout the pandemic, I was writing about um, another misconception is about China supposedly hiding the pandemic at first, because like, nowadays, I feel like it's kind of hard to deny that China genuinely did a good job containing the pandemic and taking care of its citizens. But um, now, like the fallback is, oh, like yeah, they, they're doing a good job now, but in the beginning, they did a horrible job and they hid information from everybody. And I'm not gonna say that China's, China's initial handling of the pandemic was perfect, but um, the idea that I was trying to deceive people or hide critical information doesn't, in the early stages, don't really seem to be true to me for when I investigated these claims by the Western media. Yeah, and I have to say that this is how I initially uh, got to know your work was working on the early origins of the pandemic, uh, looking at the criticisms of China's response to the pandemic. Um, and I've been following your work since then. And as you said, you don't have a background in science, but you have been writing uh, these articles talking about these different topics that um, have a lot of conspiratorial thinking surrounding them. And I have found that you've done a very good job in contacting people who are credible sources. They're actually experts in the field. Uh, you've done a good job of making sure that you understand the topic before you write about it. Uh, we talked about this before we hit record. Uh, and so I wanna, I, I wanna commend you on that. I mean, you're doing a very good job in terms of like making sure that you actually understand the topic before you start putting articles out about there that people are going to read and then start freaking out about, uh, which is something that we see a lot of in, in the news. Um, yeah. And that, that takes me to the next topic. And I guess that, you know, this is something that I guess we can dwell on a bit. So we've been talking about the pandemic already in this conversation. Um, You've been doing a lot of writing around the pandemic, but something that we've seen a lot of during the pandemic, it's like waves of conspiratorial thinking. We have one conspiracy theory that'll come out and that'll last for like a month where it's the big thing in the media. Uh, it's mm -hmm. the big thing, particularly on social media. And then it'll die off as we start to get information that shows, hey, this conspiracy theory has absolutely no credence to it. Uh, it was pretty crazy that people ever thought about it to begin with. And then everybody will immediately forget the fact that it turned out to be a complete conspiracy that wasn't rooted in reality. And they'll find a new conspiracy to latch onto. And this has just been going cyclically since the pandemic began. Conspiracy after conspiracy after conspiracy. So Josh, before we start talking about some of the conspiracies that you've looked at specifically, why do you think that we've had so many 
uh, conspiracies? Why do we have this extreme level of conspiratorial thinking around this pandemic specifically? I don't recall seeing so many consecutive uh, conspiracies coming out about a specific event, um, at least in, in recent memory. Well, um, Dr. David Gorski, I, I think you might be familiar with him uh, since you have a background in science. I think he's the manager of science-based medicine. He's the ma managing editor and he's, he debunks a lot of scientific misinformation out there. And uh, one, one observation he made is that like in every like health epidemic or pandemics type situation, there's always people who like attribute um, a virus, the virus breaking out into like some nefarious human activity. And um, I mean, since it's, it's a fairly banal phenomenon it happens, it seems to happen all the time or whenever something like this happens, there's always like a group of people like that. But in this situation, I think um, the US wants to politicize the pandemic and use it as a geopolitical uh, tool to uh, bash China with and harm its public image abroad because they want to form international alliances against China, like the Quad and with AUKUS recently. Um, so, and I think, and I do think that like, um, we're entering into a period where uh, yellow peril rhetoric is being heightened. Um, I remember researching previous yellow peril per um, propaganda in the 19th century and that was heightened as the Western colonial powers were trying to uh, dominate China during its century of humiliation. So the further China was subjugated, the more propaganda needed was needed to portray them as an existential threat to justify that domination. And I think we're seeing a similar situation with China today where America has over 800 military bases around the world, whereas China has like arguably at most three or most more accurately probably one. It's hard to get exact details on, on the subject, but um, in any case, uh, you see a lot of these conspir cons this conspir conspiratorial thinking has always been with us and in many health situations, health epidemic situations before, but it's being amplified now by state media apparatuses. Although like US corporate media outlets are not formally controlled by the US government, they are in fact, um, basically following their their line on anything you can't you don't really see any major dissent from corporate media outlets from the u.s government's line on anything um so yeah i do think that those are the major reasons why like this conspiratorial thinking has been happening more often and i would like to say that i do think that um from a certain perspective it kind of makes sense for people to believe the lab league theory if they also believe that china hid information like covering up the pandemic in the beginning with Dr. Li Wenliang, for example, that myth around surrounding him. Uh, the, can you, can you remind the listeners the briefly about this? This Because we haven't talked about this event specifically on the show for a very long time. Uh, so just for listeners that have perhaps forgotten this, this uh, kind of news story slash conspiracy, uh, can you briefly just mention that to remind them about it? Yeah, sure. So Dr. Li Wenliang was a... Uh, Chinese ophthalmologist in Wuhan, um, an ophthalmologist is an eye doctor. He is not someone who is trained in uh, infectious diseases and epidemiology or whatnot, um, or respiratory viruses like SARS-CoV-2. But um, he recently, uh, I think he posted some docu documents in a, in a private group chat um, about what he suspected was SARS-CoV-1, which is very different from SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and uh, when, and then someone in that group chat leaked it elsewhere, even though he decided he didn't, even though he told them not to share it with anyone else because it was co sharing confidential information. Um, it was portrayed as a whistle, he was portrayed as a whistleblower, even though he really wasn't. And it made it seem as if Beijing conspired to hide the pandemic from the rest of the world, even though that's not what happened. Um, and I don't want to disparage him. Like he was a, by all accounts, a good, a good man and a, Con conscientious doctor. And I, I don't think that he was a bad person or anything like that. It was just a really unfortunate situation for him and how he was, uh, his death was used by the media to bash China with. Yeah. Uh, I, and that's very interesting. Um, I, a lot, a lot of the listeners of this show might remember when that story was really in the media, you know, this silenced whistleblower, yeah. uh, was trying to warn the world about the, uh, coming pandemic, but that wasn't really what was happening um, with Wait, can this I, story. Yeah, go ahead. Can, go I interject ahead. Two, can I interject two quick points? Uh, I Absolutely. think these are very crucial details. So the first doctor to report 
uh, the coronavirus pandemic, the new coronavirus was actually not Dr. Lee Wen Yang. He shared it in the group chat on December 30th, and I think it was leaked on December 31. But the first doctor was actually Dr. Zhang Jishan, and her name has not been shared on Western media outlets even. And she shared, she reported uh, patients with who had symptoms of the disease to uh, health authority, Chinese official health authorities on December 27th, which is three days before Dr. Li Wen Leong shared it in his group chat. So she actually was the first and she was never punished. She was actually rewarded. And the second detail I'd like to stress is that Dr. Li Wen Leong shared what he thought was SARS-CoV-1. And SARS-CoV-1 is very different from SARS-CoV-2 in the sense that uh, SARS-CoV-2 has a two-week incubation period where symptoms may be infected but not show any symptoms, whereas SARS-CoV-1 wasn't infectious until you showed symptoms. And it would, it would have been very dangerous for people to believe it was SARS-CoV-1 because then they would not have been aware of the incubation period and the virus could have been spreading asymptomatically for a long time if people were under that impression. And I think um, it would not have been good even if Dr. Li Wenyang wasn't quote unquote silenced on that matter. So sorry to interject. No, no, that, that's why we brought you on the show is to make these sort of interjections. And I'll make an interjection of my own uh, for the listeners, which is just a um, kind of immunology related point, which you mentioned SARS-CoV-1, which is the SARS that there was an outbreak of in 2002, 2003 in Hong Kong, and then in Canada. Um, as you mentioned, this does not spread before pre-symptomatically, before symptoms mm -hmm. develop. SARS-CoV-1 is very similar to most diseases, which is to say most diseases do not spread pre-symptomatically. Almost all diseases that do have the potential to spread from person to person don't start transmission until you are symptomatic. SARS-CoV-2 is very rare in that, uh, in that way, in that we see that a fair amount of the transmission that takes place, possibly up to a third of the transmission, according to some studies, takes place from either pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic patients. So as you mentioned, uh, we would have had no way of knowing that this is what would have been happening if they thought it was SARS-CoV-1, because that's not what happens with SARS-CoV-1. SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. is very unusual in that respect. And you know, now a lot of people take it for granted because we've been around with this virus for one and three quarters years at this point. Uh, and we've gotten used to the fact that people can spread the virus when they're asymptomatic, people can spread the virus when they're pre-symptomatic. That is not the case for most viruses. And we wouldn't have thought that that would be the case for a new coronavirus based on previous coronaviruses, because that's not what we had seen with previous coronaviruses. Um, Moving on, though, uh, because I do want to make sure that we get to hit, you know, a, a diverse range of topics here. Um, you mentioned that you think that a lot of the conspiratorial thinking is because of U.S. geopolitical aims. And I'm going to give you kind of a two part question. I think that in from my view, it makes sense uh, for the conspiracy theories that are aimed against China. But we've also seen a proliferation of conspiracy theories in other regards. For example, we saw the kind of conspiratorial thinking trying to prop up hydroxychloroquine as a potential treatment for, oh uh, <laughs> for, for COVID. Yes, hydroxychloroquine. We've talked about it on the show a lot before. Listeners, if you don't remember hydroxychloroquine, that is, uh, yeah, the drug that they thought maybe, maybe might help people uh, recover from COVID faster. When they looked at all of the analyses, they found it didn't prevent COVID from happening compared to people that didn't take it. It didn't make people more likely to survive COVID if they had it and they were taking it versus if they didn't. And it didn't make people recover quicker. In fact, in some studies, they found even worse outcomes for people that were taking hydroxychloroquine. Plus, hydroxychloroquine is not that easy on the heart. There is a fairly high risk of side effects related to uh, heart problems from taking hydroxychloroquine. Uh, but this was being championed as a miracle drug for a while until these studies started to come out saying, hey, this miracle drug that we've been championing, there's no evidence in favor of it. And there's a lot of evidence against it. Um, more recently, and this, this next one is something that we've seen a lot more um, kind of gray on. It wasn't quite as black and white of a scenario as hydroxychloroquine, where it was very obviously not something that we should have ever been considering. Uh, ivermectin is now in the news all over the place. 
there was some scientific justification for believing that it might have uh, some beneficial effects, but we don't have any good studies out that show that ivermectin should be used therapeutically in humans. No good studies. Yeah, We have some studies that people like to bandy about, but the, the control groups in those studies are absolutely terrible. So there's no good studies to use uh, uh, in order to justify using um, ivermectin. And we've also seen some really crazy conspiracy theories about the vaccines, like the vaccines make people <laughs> sterile. You know, if I have the vaccine, I'm never going to be able to have kids because the spike protein and, you know, it's there in my in my <laughs> uterus. And there's all these conspiracy theories coming out. And these conspiracy theories don't really have anything to do with China. So they're a little bit harder to figure out where they're coming from and why they there's so many of them that keep coming out one after another. So that's kind of one part of it is why do you think that we have so many just kind of random conspiracies that aren't tailored towards US geopolitical aims? And then the second part of the question is, uh, if you can just go a little bit deeper into the weaponization of the pandemic itself, as, as I've called it, a political means to U.S. geostrategic ends? Um, so to be honest, I actually haven't written much about like the various non-China related conspiratorial um, thinking. You've you just highlighted about surrounding uh, ivermectin, the vaccines and hydroxychloroquine. Um, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but um, I do think that like um, so Dr. David Gorski's point earlier about like conspiratorial thinking like always surrounding every pandemic about and around like anti-vaxxers have been around since like um for for a long time from from what i can tell and i and i do think that like um one one very big misconception that people have is the idea that like natural is always better and uh i think dr david skorsky talked about that he said instead of saying natural immunity which which is what happens when some people get immunity to SARS-CoV-2, I believe, from getting previously infected um, is better than the vaccines. Like that's that's a talking point I've heard a lot that I've seen spread a lot. Um, it's kind of meaningless if you die from COVID, SARS-CoV-2 because you didn't get the vaccine because there's no point then. But um, Dr. Gate David Gorski said that it might be better to call it a post-infection immunity rather than natural immunity. Um, and I do think that like that misconception that natural is always better is uh, it's not that it's exactly new, but like with other conspiracy theories being ampli amplified on social media, um, that inevitably leads to other conspiracy conspiracy theories. Like um, I do know that a lot of lab leak people who endorse the lab leak theory for the COVID nineteen pandemic are also anti vaxxers, um, and I like it's hard to see like an inherent connection between the two, but I do know that there is a lot of that. And I think um, it's just always been with us and it's just being amplified on social media. Like now that now people are able to influence each other more. Not, not research these topics. But regarding your second question about how the weaponization of these has been led to uh, um, quote unquote contain China, I, I do think that contain is a very bad euphemism. I do think that like in almost every situation, the word contain can be better replaced or more accurately described as encirclement or sabotage. Um, so America is trying to encircle China. America isn't trying to sabotage China. Those are much more specific um, terms to describe what's going on then, and more accurate terms to describe what's going on than like a euphemism like contain. But in any case, um, I do think that America is trying to retain its uh, world hegemon status economically and militarily. And if you can make everyone think that this is China's fault, then they're less likely to uh, um, join China at the UN uh, when they vote on resolutions. Or um, I'm not sure if resolution is the right word, but I do know that like in, at the UN, there's there's a big there's a big fuss over like around 40 countries based mo based mostly on Western countries condemning China's alleged human rights violations in Xinjiang. But then what's not heard is that there's like over 60 countries, which is more not based in the West, Western countries who actually support China's handling uh, of anti-terrorism issues in Xinjiang. And, uh, but like the Western media don't really report that. So I think the point of this is to like sabotage um, relations China has with other countries to prevent them from 
uh, forming economic partnerships and military alliances, even though China does not really seem to be in the military alliance game either. It's just, it's just more to support America's military alliance strategy against China. You know, Josh, you brought up something that, that you know, has been interesting to me. I've had guests on the show before to talk about it, which is Xinjiang. And as you mentioned, this was used, uh, weaponized by many, many media outlets to try to turn uh, opinion against China in a very decided way. And in the United States, at least, it was very successful in doing so. Uh, all of a sudden, Americans seem to care about Muslims in the global stage, which, you know, uh, we, the United States really hasn't cared about before. Um, only when China is the one that supposedly is, is subjugating um, Muslims globally, do American citizens actually care about Muslims? Funny how that works, but uh, it was a fairly successful campaign. But now recently, recently, oh, and uh, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that when you mentioned that more countries were supportive of of how China was handling their anti-terror practices in the Western provinces like Xinjiang, uh, that was nearly every Muslim majority country yes. was supportive of China's actions. It was, as you mentioned, the Western European countries primarily that were supportive uh, of the United States' anti-China crusade in this regard. But all of the Muslim majority countries uh, sided with China on this, which was a very interesting thing. But recently, and this is the point that I'm that I'm driving at now. Recently, there was a piece that just came out, might have been in the New York Times. I think it was in the New York Times that said the barbed wire is almost gone. Oh, that's the Associated Press. Was it Associated Press? Yeah. Okay. So you know yes. exactly what piece I'm talking about. The barbed wire is almost gone. The camps are almost empty. Uh, looks like you know the Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang are actually doing okay. And we had some really, really uh, you know popular writers, reporters in the US that were looking at that and saying, did the US win? Did we did we actually like end the genocide against the Uyghurs that we thought that there was? Uh, Josh, what are your thoughts on this? Because it was very funny when when this article came out saying, you know, there really isn't any evidence of this right now. Uh, basically, all of the things that we were complaining about are, are gone. And there's no evidence left behind that there was anything really, you know, wrong, uh, at least to the extent that we were saying that there was something wrong. And yet there was still people saying like, ah, yeah, the US, good job, US. Um, I feel like one, I mean, to be clear, I should probably preface by saying that, like, I don't think everything China is doing in Xinjiang is justified or necessarily good. Um, so like, I that, do think that, that there are- That's okay. Yeah. That's the same line that we've taken on this show, at least yeah. with my previous guests is that, you know, mass detention is a problem just like it is in the United States, but the, it was the genocide claims that we were refuting. Yes, yes. Uh, I do think that that is a very serious claim and you cannot make that kind of charge without serious evidence because claims require extraordinary evidence. And uh, I do not think that bar has been met at all. And I think even U.S. officials have admitted that and at the U.N. And it's not like Xinjiang is some closed off province that like no one could ever enter. Like, there are some pandemic restrictions for entering China. But before that, like it's not like you had a problem entering Xinjiang as long as you complied with some security measures. Um, and like you can see video testimonies from before the pandemic of people who visited Xinjiang, not who who don't live in China. And like they're just reporting what they saw. And they said that um, you should not really trust what the American media is telling you of what's going on there. And there are even accounts before this latest AP report came out of like Chinese YouTubers, not, not, not necessarily Chinese. A lot of YouTubers in China are not Chinese, but um, they've also visited China and they also, they also visited Xinjiang. I mean, and they found that there's not, it's not what people think it is. Um, and like a lot of normal practices found throughout China are actually not unique to Xinjiang. For example, um, one YouTuber, I think he's from Singapore, but uh, he can pass for Han Chinese. He visited Xinjiang and he said that the Ch Xinjiang's, the China's promotion of the Mandarin language or Mandarin of Mandarinism actually not unique to China. Like, I think Singapore also require, not requires, not necessarily requires, but they also encourage everyone to learn one language. 
even the, regardless of ethnicity so that people have a better um, chance of getting jobs elsewhere throughout the country. Um, Cause most more economic opportunities are found on the Eastern, no, uh, on the coast of China um, near Beijing and Shanghai. And uh, if people know Mandarin more, they could, uh, they could ease, more easily move. And that practice is like also found in places like Singapore. And I think Jerry Gray, uh, I think he's an Australian citizen living in China. He also talked about how um, it's normal for students to actually dorm for school. Um, so it's not that like dorming is necessarily proof of like a concentration camp or anything. And uh, yeah, I do think that some cultural practices that are not necessarily found elsewhere in the world, but are actually quite normal in China are being misinterpreted or misrepresented as something uniquely nefarious or malicious when that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, and just to remind the listeners, you can go back and watch some of those uh, previous interviews that I have done with people like uh, Andre Domis or Asatar Bear on this show, uh, where we talked about uh, this exact topic. And, and everybody was in agreement that, you know, mass detention is a problem. And it does, does appear that the detention rate in Xinjiang was higher than the rest of China, which in itself is a problem. But similarly, if you look at the United States, and if you break it down by ethnicity, we have mass detention problems in the United States. And we have even more uh, acute mass detention issues in the United States when you look at certain ethnicities and certain races within the United States. And a lot of people in the United States, and this is where the criticism is, they don't have anything to say about mass incarceration of black people in the United States, but they care so much about the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. This is the issue. Now, and when the uh, claim is that there's genocide going on, as you mentioned, there needs to be pretty substantial evidence of some sort of genocide, either genocide in itself or cultural genocide, as some other people were claiming. Uh, there needs to be pretty substantial evidence to really support that claim in order to actually use it. And that evidence, it was very circumstantial. It was all produced by the same institutions that have vested interests in showing that China is a, you know, a big, bad uh, boogeyman in the global stage, and they need to be stopped and contained, and the US needs to maintain its hegemonic status. So yes, uh, as you mentioned, there were things that are going on wrong in Xinjiang, but there is no evidence to show that there was genocide. Josh, we have about two minutes left. So the last thing that I want to ask is something that popped into my head when we were talking about the pandemic. I think that most American-based publications have done a very bad job of reporting on the pandemic, at least on a consistent basis. There are some writers who have done a good job. There are some publications that do have some good pieces that go along with some bad pieces. But as you mentioned at the beginning, your main gig is, is writing media uh, critique. Um, is there any publications that you want to single out for any scorn for how they've been handling the pandemic? Because I can think of a few off the top of my head, but you know, I'm not a media watcher like you, uh, but I certainly can think of some publications that have really stood out for having consistently terrible takes and terrible articles with regards to the pandemic. Are there any that you want to talk about for the last minute or two? Sure. So um, I think the intercept has been doing a lot of uh, sleazy innuendo reporting. Um, on the lab leak theory in general. I'm not necessarily sure about other aspects of COVID, but they've been kind of implying that China is lying about um, not having a lab leak and lying about gain of function research and they're doing everything possible to portray China in the worst possible light. I actually critique them for hiding information that would change viewers' minds because uh, Dr. Angela Rasmus and one of their sources shared her shared emails with me about their correspondence and she revealed that how Mara Histendahl and Sharon Lerner were hiding information about uh, gain of functions relevance to different species like for example something that's a gain of function in mice but not for humans would be a very big thing to import to to stress but they did they deliberately hid that information to make it look like they were doing dangerous research for humans um another but i'd say corporate media in general like the new york times or the washington post they do have genuinely good coverage but uh, they also have a lot of bad coverage, but I would say that if you want the, the worst purveyor of misinformation, probably Fox News and on social media, like perhaps uh, some uh, some people who have YouTube channels who are associated with the left, uh, who may not be wise to name here, but they are not doing a very good job either. Um, but I do want to say that like in order to, instead of just critiquing bad 
publications, it's important to stress good publications. And uh, I would recommend people to follow actual science journalists um, at publications like Nature and Science. Um, two I'd, re I'd recommend in particular is Amy Maxman for Nature and John Cohen for Science. I would follow those two and follow actual virologists like Dr. Angela Rasmussen on Twitter, if you, if you are on Twitter. I think um, following actual scientists has been is probably the best advice I could give. I think for my articles, I've, I try to make myself more of a conduit for what they want to say rather than what I wanted to say. And I just let them, I just talked to them, asked them all the questions I could and just represented them as accurately as I possibly could. And um, that's what I did. So there's that. Excellent. Again, my guest was journalist Joshua Cho. Uh, Josh, can you tell the listeners briefly, because we're out of time, how they can follow you on Twitter and where they can find uh, your upcoming articles, because I do recommend that the listeners check them out. Um, I do actually, I'm actually starting to write for other publications, but I may, I predominantly write for fairness and accuracy and reporting at fair.org. It's a media watchdog organization. And you can follow me on my Twitter handle, Josh C0301, C as in cat. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Josh. Hopefully we can bring you back again in the future. And David, I'll turn things back over to you. Thank you, Henry Huckamacki. Thank you. Fair. Go to fair. They cover the news better than anybody else. Well, I'd like to thank all our guests for showing up today. This was a good one. The shows just keep getting better and better because the guests keep getting better and better. I'd like to thank everybody in the Zoom room, everybody who showed up to our virtual studio audience and participating in the show, asking great questions. If you would like to attend a live taping of our show via Zoom, go to my website, hit the attend a live taping menu. You'll get an invite and you can meet some of the people who show up on Monday nights and Thursday nights for a taping of this show. Friday night is office hours. And because it's the first Friday of the month, it's 24 hours of office hours, office hours and hours. It starts at 8 p.m. Eastern. I will host the first hour, the first 90 minutes. Then we turn it over to the professors, to the teachers, to the activists, to the musicians, the comedians, the teachers, the teachers, the teachers. Come to office hours and meet better people. Go to my website and sign up. Just hit office hours. Doesn't cost you anything and no passwords required. Join us. Meet better people. I'm not answering my emails. I apologize. I've not had time. They're piling up. I look at my emails from the show and I don't even know where to begin. It reminds me of having a really messy apartment that needs to be painted. And you think, where do I start? Why even bother making the bed or emptying the garbage? Let's just live surrounded by flies and cat shit. I've never gotten to that point. I never got Sid and Nancy-like, but uh, that's what my uh, email box over at the website looks like. I, I feel I'm at the Chelsea Hotel with Sid and Nancy shooting up and ordering room service and why even bother? So I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna try to get to my emails this weekend if I can carve out some time. It's really rude not to get back to people, especially people who are donating money. Uh, I, I, I haven't had a pledge episode because I haven't thanked the people who have been kind enough to donate money to this show. Um, uh, yeah, not enough hours in the day. Please friend me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, sign up for my newsletter. And if you don't want a thank you note, <laughs> donate some money. I'm going to get to the thank you notes. Uh, it's, uh, we're all overwhelmed, aren't we? 
There, there just doesn't seem to be enough time in the day. Thank you to Ethan Hershenfeld. Please go stream his comedy special, Thug Thug Jew, on YouTube. It's hysterical. John Ross, the brilliant comedy writer and gentleman farmer. Follow him on Twitter at Fun With Friction. I'd like to thank Dr. Carolyn Baker, author of Confronting Christofascism, Healing the Evangelical Wound, with a forward by Frank Schaefer. We will be having her back, I hope. Howie Klein, founder and treasurer of the Blue America Pack. Peter Kalmus did not make it tonight. We will find out what happened, but we were looking forward to having him back. Dr. Harriet Fraud, host of Capitalism Hits Home. Professor Adnan Hussein, download the Mudgeless podcast and Guerrilla History. They're celebrating their one year anniversary for Guerrilla History. He co-hosts that with Brett O'Shea and Henry Huckamacki. Go download Guerrilla History. And of course, Professor David Schmid, he uh, is co-editor of Globalization and the State in Contemporary Crime Fiction, Fiction, and he's author of Natural Born Celebrities, Serial Killers in American Culture. Professor Marianne Cummings, Follow her on Twitter at Razor Girl. Peter B. Collins, thank you. Professor Mike Steinell, jazz historian and Dylanologist. Go to MikeSteinell.com and purchase his music, song and dance, and buy his books. And Henry Huckamacki, follow him on Twitter at Huck1995. Listen to him over Guerrilla History and Joshua Cho from fairness and accuracy in reporting. That's it. I've covered everything. Thank you so much for listening. It means everything to me. Share this show with people you think would enjoy this. We are on all your podcasting platforms. Wherever you get this, wherever you get a podcast, you can get this show. So please subscribe smash, as they say, the like button, smash it, break it so nobody else can like it, and give us a good review. We have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's a great way to share things you like in this show. I'm David Feldman. Remember to stay strong and protect the weak. Hello, David. We've got a great interview coming up for you today. That wasn't my ending. That was not, we have to do that again. I'm David Feldman. Remember to stay strong and protect the weak. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. he tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. To get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming 
your way.